Allô, allô. Est-ce qu'on m'entend bien? Oh, un peu trop fort. Hello, hello, sound check. All good? Yeah. Okay. okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Summer in Montreal. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, all of you here in uh, big numbers like this. We're going to learn a lot this week. And uh, we wanted to start this week with uh, a special announcement that we have uh, for the Bull Bitcoin and Verify team. Uh, so I won't tell more. Uh, I will let Francis Pouliot, uh, the CEO of Bull Bitcoin, announce it, what really, uh, what really matters. He's not here in the country at the moment, so we're going to be connecting with him uh, across the world. So we're going to go on the live stream with him. Hello, Francis. Hey, guys. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. We have me? a full, full house here. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, so sh should I start? Is everybody's ready? Yeah, you're ready to go. You can go. All right. Hey, guys. Um, I think some of you guys may know me in the room and for the guys watching on the live stream, um, my name is Francis Pouliot. I'm the founder of Bull Bitcoin and CEO of Bull Bitcoin. Um, first of all, thank you so much guys for joining us today, um, especially the people in, um, at the workshop in Montreal. Uh, I started to meet up for Bitcoin in Montreal like eight years ago or something like this. And it's really great to see that the Montreal Bitcoin community still, you know, meeting in, in real life and exchanging ideas and not only staying at home. Uh, so thanks you guys for showing up in person. So without further ado, uh, great announcement. This is, this is probably one of the most important days in the history of bull Bitcoin. Um, I'm so happy and grateful to announce that uh, bull Bitcoin has acquired Verify. Uh, so the whole team at Verify is now going to be working at Bull Bitcoin, and Bull Bitcoin is going to be moving forward, doubling down on its non-custodial um, Bitcoin exchange and payment services. Um, and with the help, uh, with the help of the team at Verify, um, we are also going to launch an international self-custody um, support service for Bitcoiners. Um, we are going to become the world's Bitcoin IT department um, where people will be able to um, use us to gain advice, resources, content, hardware, and all sorts of products and services to ensure that they are holding their own keys um, and that they're running their own nodes. So um, we are adding at the same time an incredible team of experts. Um, six people are being added to the team of Bull Bitcoin from Verify. Um, I will name them, name them at the end uh, and you should follow them on Twitter. Uh, so just to give a little background on where this is coming from, I've known the Verify guys for quite a long time, uh, probably something like four or five years. And when I met them, I immediately, I found it so funny, like they, they, were, they were much younger than they are now, obviously four years ago. And they were like so Bitcoin maximalist. Um, they were like more, you know, it's like more Catholic than the Pope, kind of. Uh, I found that they, they had so much energy. Uh, they had so much enthusiasm for Bitcoin. And at that time, I was running the Bitcoin meetup. And I was also running Bull Bitcoin. And I was running bills. And I was super busy. And the Bitcoin meetup was kind of, I guess, on its way out, right? So um, I, I just didn't have the energy and motivation to do some of the stuff that I was doing when I was younger. And I was like, yes, I finally found the guys that are going to take over the Bitcoin meetup because we had developed a very strong brand at the Montreal Bitcoin Embassy and at the Bitcoin meetup um, of integrity, of high quality content, of no bullshit, 
of always telling the truth. And people trusted the Montreal Bitcoin meetup and they trusted the people at the Bitcoin embassy that were, that were running the meetup originally. And I thought, if we're not going to continue doing the meetup correctly, I'm not going to give up the meetup to just the first Bitcoiner that I meet. Like, this is too important. So we're either going to find some people um, that I trust fully uh, to run the meetup or we're just going to stop doing the Bitcoin meetup. And um, I found the, um, the Verify guys and they just fit perfectly. Um, so we became friends and, and we started to collaborate on a bunch of projects um, over the years. Uh, one of the first projects that we, we were collaborating on was uh, uh, they were working on Cypherode. They were working on an open source uh, Bitcoin full node hardware project. Um, and then uh, they were doing all sorts of consulting and, and at Bull Bitcoin, we already were faced with a lot of clients that wanted some more in-depth consulting on how to use Bitcoin. And uh, we launched at Bull Bitcoin a, a, a service called Bull Bitcoin Prime, uh, which is for large investors and um, institutional investors that are buying, you know, like more than $100,000 worth of Bitcoin. Um, and we were trying to develop like a white glove service for these investors that um, require some, some special help or, or any sort of, of business that needs some special integration with Bitcoin. And I was like, how are we going to be able to scale this? Like, we're too busy here. We need some help. We absolutely need help. So, so we initially started to partner with Verify, where when we had these clients that needed help, Instead of, you know, dedicating our own resources, uh, which were, you know, very busy building our software and financial infrastructure, we would just refer them out to to verify. And the response was absolutely amazing. Um, I think the moment where I truly realized that these guys were the real deal and that I absolutely wanted to to get them on board was when I was thinking about who am I going to trust with my parents? Uh, because I was really busy. I was like kind of like traveling all over the world and my parents needed some help with, with some Bitcoin stuff. And I was like, oh, guys, I don't have time. I'm not even in Montreal anymore. I was already out of the country. And I was like, who can I trust to help my mom and my dad like manage their Bitcoins, <laughs> manage their hardware wallets? I was like, the Verify guys. So if I trust them with my parents, um, you know, I can trust them with other people's parents, and that that was a um, that was a great that was a great great feeling. Um, so, Bull Bitcoin has been in operation since 2015. Um, we did our first acquisition, which was Bills in 2016. So, Verify is our second acquisition, um, which I find to be quite quite cool, um, especially given the fact that we are not funded by any venture capital investment at all. We don't have any financing from the banks. In fact, we don't have any financing um, outside of Bull Bitcoin's, you know, uh, shareholders uh, and founders and and um, and our you know, our profits that we generate, our revenue that we generate. So this acquisition is financed and oh. and was made possible by the fact that Bull Bitcoin made the decision to hold the entirety of its cash balance in Bitcoin in 2015 at inception. So um, we've been pretty much holding the Bitcoins that we generate this whole time. And this has allowed us to make this acquisition without having to compromise by dealing with VCs or by dealing with banks. Um, and I think this reflects kind of bull Bitcoin's identity as just always refusing to compromise on our values. Um, so the primary purpose of this acquisition, as I said in the beginning, <laughs> is uh, obviously um, Bull Bitcoin is a Bitcoin exchange and payment service that needs to scale. Um, we have witnessed an incredible growth since the beginning of the hysteria and the, you know, kind of like tyrannical sanitary regime that we're living in. Um, people have flocked to Bitcoin as a result of the increase in totalitarianism totalitarianism worldwide and Canada has not been an uh, has been no exception and it has always been extremely important to me to recruit members of staff for Bull Bitcoin staff that I know are ideologically aligned with our mission and that's not an easy feat um, and when I look around in you know Montreal Quebec I was like who can I hire 
um, that I know for a fact is ideologically aligned. I'm like, it's, there's not much, there's not that many people, right? Uh, it's, it's, there's not many Bitcoin experts that are on the same page as I am uh, regarding how to, how to do Bitcoin. And the Verify guys were the best, the obvious best choice. I was like, all right, I need to get these guys on my team. Um, there's nobody else that I can, that I can trust in, uh, other than these guys that I know. I mean, there are some, but not many, not a lot of many. Um, so as I said in the beginning, um, we are also going to launch an international self-custody support service. Uh, why are we doing this? Well, first of all, I mean, being a non-custodial Bitcoin exchange means that our users are required to have their own Bitcoin wallet um, before they start to use our service. Like for those of you who have usable Bitcoin, um, you know how that you know how it works. Uh, if you don't have a Bitcoin address for us to send you Bitcoin after the purchase is made, you can't even proceed with the purchase. Um, we have been non-custodial since the beginning, um, and the Bitcoin narrative has recently shifted towards self-custody. I mean, it's always been an important narrative, but now I think more than ever, um, with what we're seeing coming as regulation from the United States, we're seeing governments becoming more and more autocratic, the rule of law, you know, the rules of the game have changed and who knows what will happen if you leave your Bitcoin in exchange. I mean, I keep, after eight years, seven years in Bitcoin, I still hear horror stories of people that are leaving their Bitcoins on an exchange and that they just keep getting screwed over and over and over out of their money, out of their life savings. Um, and it's a really terrible position to be in when you're a Bitcoiner and the exchange has your coins and you're trying to get them out and they won't let you. They're asking you for more information. They're asking you to go through some hoops. You try to contact them via support. They're not answering. You don't know what's going to happen. You're completely like, you know, you're in a very vulnerable position. And that is not the feeling that I want ever a Bitcoiner to feel. Bitcoin is supposed to be empowering. Bitcoin is supposed to make you feel strong and independent and autonomous. It's not supposed to make you feel like someone else's bitch, someone else's slave. That's absolutely not why I got into Bitcoin. And it really frustrates me that, you know, most of the world's Bitcoin exchanges are custodial and they're putting their users through this position. Um, so we've been doing the non-custodial model since the beginning. And um, so we're ahead of the curve on that. And we've been developing also all sorts of, and it's not easy to run the non-custodial exchange, by the way, guys, it's extremely difficult. Um, it is far, far easier to run a custodial exchange and not custodial exchange for a variety of reasons. Um, and, you know, we've been developing all sorts of technologies and best practices and processes, um, such as, you know, integrating second layer technologies, liquid network, lightning network, coin join, transaction bat batching. Um, we have PGP signed invoices, timestamped Bitcoin invoices. We, so we've been like developing these tools and, and, and practices, these best practices around the non-custodial model. And we really feel like we're like the bleeding edge of the non-custodial um, Bitcoin industry. Uh, so being non-custodial puts us as a, at a considerable business disadvantage versus our shitcoining custodial competitors, because obviously the friction required to onboard a new user is much higher. Think about it. It's very obvious. If, if, you, if you're a new user and you're new to Bitcoin, you just learned about it and you just want to, you know, get some. Um, if you use a custodial exchange, you just sign up and click a button, you know, send them the money and click the button. If you use bull Bitcoin, you have to first use the wallet, secure the wallet, back up the wallet, learn how to use the wallet. And price is going up and you just want to get some right now. Uh, it adds a considerable amount of friction to the user experience, uh, which obviously makes us lose money and makes us lose clients. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. So when we look at, all right, as a company, where are we going to go from here? Where, well, we have two choices. Um, well, three. Either we don't do anything, we remain the way we are, just the non custodial service with, you know, excellent customer support, but nothing, you know, nothing more than that. And we're um, letting a part of the Bitcoin market go to custodial exchanges and 
we're letting people that could have been Bitcoiners, full sovereign Bitcoiners, go to other platforms when they're just going to be slaves of the exchange that they're using. Um, the other option is like we go custodial, <laughs> which is out of the question, obviously. Um, I would much rather close down bull Bitcoin than become a custodial exchange, uh, first of all, because I don't want to hold your Bitcoins, by the way. Um, it's, it's already stressful to hold my own Bitcoins. <laughs> I don't want to hold yours, that's for sure. I definitely value my sleep, so that's not going to happen. So obviously what we need to do is we need to make it easier for people to hold their Bitcoins. So we can't just expect them to learn how this stuff works and then sell them the Bitcoin. We have to actively create the market, actively be proactive in helping people become self-custodians um, just as a, you know, just as a business practice. Um, so that's, you know, that's where the Verify team comes in, right? So the Verify team, uh, for those of you who don't know, they have been offering these consulting services, um, workshops on how to run your nodes, uh, consulting sessions that you can purchase uh, at their company. And they are by far just the best team. If you look at their blog, like verify.io, um, their blog is just, the, the quality of the content is just so absolutely amazing. Um, you look at the meetups that they've been putting up, like wor world-class, like literally like world level content um, that they've been giving out, you know, to Bitcoin users worldwide and Bitcoin users from Montreal as well. Um, so getting these guys on board, getting their expertise in dealing with noobs and getting their energy and, and, and getting all of their experience um, we're going to combine um, combine this with our infrastructure that we already have and our support system that we already have, and um, and we're gonna we're gonna you know make sure that nobody is left behind. So that's one of our key philosophies: is that if you have the desire to be a sovereign Bitcoiner that is holding your own keys and running your own nodes, we will take care of you. We're not going to let you behind, and. It doesn't matter if you're like a grandmother, it doesn't matter if you're a geek, it doesn't matter if you just learned about Bitcoin. That's our promise is that we will make you a sovereign Bitcoin. We're not just going to try. We're going to keep trying until you get it and you'll get it. You know, you'll be able to get your own wallet. You'll be able to feel secure. You'll be able to, you know, lose your phone and not freak out or your house can, you know, burn down and you're going to have a backup somewhere. Um, we're going to make sure that all of that is, is taken care of taken care of um bull bitcoin's brand bull bitcoin is a canadian only bitcoin exchange and bill payment service um but it is an international brand we've accumulated an international recognition um through some of the work that we've been doing uh i think our work in coinjoin and liquid and cypher node open source project development a lot of online advocacy, my personal Twitter, obviously, has given Bull Bitcoin an international brand of, you know, it's a very respected brand. People know that we're serious. People know that not, we're not, you know, we're not fly by night. Like we've been here for, you know, Bills has existed for eight years now, right? So, I mean, Bills is literally the oldest Bitcoin company in Canada still in existence, I think. Um, so we're not fly by night, but it's kind of a shame because it's only Canadians that are able to use us. And everybody always asks me like, I want to use bull Bitcoin. I want to use bull Bitcoin. Um, and they can't. Right. Uh, so with our international offering for self custody support that we're going to do, um, perhaps people will not be able to buy Bitcoin from us in the United States. Um, but from the United States, they will be able to use, our team, our self-custody consulting services, our products um, to help them hold their own keys and their own coins that they buy somewhere else. So uh, I believe that in the future, um, a lot of people are going to be buying Bitcoins anywhere, right? On Bitcoin ATMs, they're going to be buying them from their friends. They're going to be buying them online all over the world. Uh, but when they need advice and help on how to manage them, they're not going to be going to seek help at the exchange that they bought Bitcoins at because those exchanges are custodial shit corners. So why would you ask them for advice? They're not, they're not in this for you. Um, because if they were in this for you, they wouldn't be custodial shit corners, obviously. 
And how can you trust them if they're custodial shake owners? So they're going to be coming to us, right? So we're going to be providing our knowledge that we've accumulated in Canada to everybody worldwide. And so my message to the Bitcoin community is this. You can absolutely trust us to take care of your friends and your relatives when it comes to onboarding, uh, onboarding them to Bitcoin. I want Bull Bitcoin to be the place where you can drop off your mom. We will guarantee we will turn anyone, even your grandma, into a sovereign Bitcoiner. You will have the peace of mind that they followed all the best practices. And you will know by dropping off your friends and families at Bull Bitcoin that they have trustworthy experts that are going to guide them every step of the way um, with phone support and the best, highest quality standards of excellence. Um, that's it. So uh, this is obviously incredibly exciting. And uh, the Verify and Bull Bitcoin team are now one. We've been collaborating and partnering for years, um, but now it's official. And I think this is going to make, you know, this is definitely like the most <laughs> exciting news I think Bull Bitcoin has ever shared. Um, so thank you very much again for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, just, you know, ask them on Twitter and ask them to the, the guys that Verify that are in the room. And right, so uh, I'm just going to name quickly um, the Verify team that's joining us. So we have Gustavo Flores, Eshaz, uh, Matjek Sepnik, uh, Tristan Borges, uh, Nathaniel Kitsky, René Verger, and Carlos Chida, uh, which are joining us as of today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for instance, you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I'm still here. Yep. So obviously, uh, this has been uh, really exciting news for us, and uh, we're really happy to join. And um, I think it's just the beginning, and we're really happy we had fun uh, until now. So I think we, ha we will have <laughs> a lot of fun uh, building up the future, and we believe in Bitcoin. I, we believe it's good for the people, for us. So we will continue the battle. I'm just the big mouth of the team, so I would just like to invite Gustavo for like five minutes to talk. He's the brain, uh, so he's going to talk just a little bit about, about that and what we'll be doing. And after this, we'll jump into my presentation. And of course, Francis will be coming back for a Bitcoin rant later after dinner. So uh, we will see him uh, there. Thank you, Matic. I think it's, uh, it's good. Something, eh? I have to turn it on, it's good? Okay. Well, thank you, Maciek. Thank you, Francis, for uh, the great speech, the great announcement. So we're really proud to, to announce this. Uh, you know, it's such been such a long road uh, since we started Verify in January 2019. Uh, it was initially just me, Maciek, and Tristan, but René and Nathan joined pretty quickly. Uh, and we've been building this ever since. Some of you know us from back in the days when we were quite young, uh, or even before that, we had another startup. Uh, but yeah, it's been a long way. Uh, the Montreal community has been so great supporting us since uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure some here were even there at the first meetup we organized like two years, two and a half years ago. Uh, so thank you all for the support. Uh, thank you, Francis, for, uh, for the support as well. And uh, we're on a big mission here and, and we're unstoppable at this point. Uh, we're going to get everyone uh, on the self-custody adoption uh, and to become a real Bitcoiner. And now we have the resources, we have the big team. Uh, we have uh, everyone on our side, and I think uh, it's, it's clearer now than more than ever uh, that the world is starting to see things our way as well uh, with everything that's happening. So uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, also, uh, we launched a new website uh, during the night. So if you go on verify.io, you'll see a new brand. Uh, the focus is really on the self-custody services that Verify has. So go check it out. Uh, ha and everyone that's here in the, in the room with me right now, uh, thank you for joining us. Have a great week. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, lunch is, uh, uh, is, is going to be good every day. We're going to have evening events. Saturday, a big barbecue party. Uh, and everyone that's watching us online, if you're in Montreal or in Quebec or in Canada, get here this weekend. It's going to be insane. Uh, we got people flying from California, from uh, Vancouver, uh, from Ontario. So I think even someone from Florida. So. It's, it's pretty big, uh, and it's funny because we, we had this idea like two weeks and a half ago, no, like a month and a half ago, 
sorry. Uh, we were just hanging out like uh, in a park. We were like, hey, this we we could make like a just a Bitcoin week. <laughs> yeah, my check had a revolution. Bitcoin summer, you know. <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin summer, and it's like <laughs> that idea stuck with us. We initially wanted to do it longer. One week is uh, with 21 events is is, is perfect. Uh, so thank you all, and uh, for everyone watching online, uh, this is just the start. This is just starting, so uh, stay tuned. Thank you, and thank you, friends. Okay, so thank you, Francis. We'll see you later, right? Yes? Thank you. Oh, Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'll be jumping on my presentation. And, uh, obviously, this is like the first presentation of uh, the week, so we're going to start it slowly. I think it's uh, a little bit like uh, every Bitcoiner's journey. You have to start somewhere, start using Bitcoin, and then after, uh, during the week, we'll be gradually uh, like scaling up the level of uh, the presentation technically and, and uh, also showing more what Bitcoin can do more, like through second layers, to th third layers even on Bitcoin. So today, I know that some of you are really pretty advanced. I, I just want to get a feel of, uh, of the room. How many of you consider yourself like really beginner? and it's your first time hearing about a Bitcoin or you have no idea what a wallet is. Like, don't be shy, okay? Don't be shy, okay. So we try to, yeah, really, really great of you coming. So this is uh, really brave of you. You're gonna learn a lot, but I think also inter intermediate, intermediate, who will consider it intermediate? Well, I think you're more than intermediate. <laughs> expert, expert of, yeah? Okay, great, great. Okay, so we have a kind of uh, a mix of uh, every kind of people. So like those who are more uh, considered themselves as beginners or intermediate, like people are always uh, happy to respond to any of your questions. I think we're going to learn a lot. And it's through really interaction that uh, you can do this. So I'm going to talk about uh, Blue Wallet. With, with, I, ch I think, well, the, the title of the presentation was getting started with Blue Wallet, right? But I think we're, it's more than that. I think I want to present Blue Wallet for you as a tool to onboard new users, new Bitcoiners into, uh, um, into the, the, the field, into the, the world of Bitcoin. And I think it's the perfect tool. So it's less about showing you how uh, uh, Blue Wallet works, but more why I, I think it's the best uh, mobile wallet out there, at least to, con to, you know, to convert uh, people. So brief history of uh, Bitcoin wallets. In the beginning, it wasn't easy as today. It's really uh, over time that people have been thinking, overthinking and working so much on it uh, so that we have what we have today, like hardware wallets, mobile wallets, desktop wallets. But all of those didn't really exist in the past and it was so much, so much uh, difficult and so much uh, dangerous to handle uh, uh, Bitcoin wallets or anything. So um, for example, some of you, if you're really uh, into Bitcoin in a long time, you may remember uh, paper wallets, which were basically printable, uh, uh, unique uh, set of key, which had a private key and a public key. So imagine how dangerous that can be if somebody uh, loses its paper or uh, they store a lot of amount and they also didn't have any addresses. They just had a one address. So that was not really a good idea, but it was, a, it was the, the way people started using it, right? So it's kind of a good thing too. And you also had like legendary Cas Cascus coin uh, that still are, um, uh, which were hiding the private key between, uh, sorry, behind a holographic uh, sticker. And th those are starting to get like, uh, getting like, a, a, how do you say, a collection or a value because they, they've been like in the really popular in the beginning. And some of, uh, some of the people like to keep them like a physical Bitcoin, you know, because normally, uh, it's, it's hard for the human uh, psyche to imagine that Bitcoin can, it's solely digital, so maybe this format has a, some kind of way uh, to, to make the bridge between uh, old way of thinking about money, which were coins and gold and this kind of stuff, and the new kind of money, which is Bitcoin today. So, of course, it's still difficult. That's the thing. It's still difficult to use Bitcoin today. And, 
And uh, the tools, the way the tools are developed so fast right now, lo lots of open source projects, lots of companies working. We're gonna, you're gonna see through the weeks, especially through the whole day, uh, how advanced the security with Bitcoin can go. But uh, you know, we start somewhere. So for those who are really beginner, uh, I'm gonna make some analogies here and they are not really correct uh, in terms of uh, technicality but they are great to just make people understand easily what, uh, how Bitcoin works more or less. So really pe people say like, like imagine yourself in the beginning, like you knew nothing about Bitcoin. They, they don't even know you can have a wallet uh, by yourself in your, uh, in your own custody, that you're your own private bank. Like all, the, all these new concepts are, once you, once you understand them, they're like pretty easy and you like assume like everybody can understand, but uh, it, it might just come back to yourself like a few years ago and it was kind of difficult, right? So let's go get back to the source. What is a Bitcoin address? Well, a Bitcoin address is the thing that you share to the other people uh, in order to receive some Bitcoin. So it's gonna be like a string of letters and numbers and uh, that's gonna be like the way people are gonna be able to know where to send the Bitcoins, right? So I don't like to make that analogy, but it's kind of uh, uh, good to, to make people understand. It's kind of like if you share your email address, so you know that's the public thing that you share to everybody to receive that email. But in order to access your emails, you need your password, right? So that's a little bit similar in some kind of way in Bitcoin, not technically, but the same essence. So in order to access the Bitcoin that are locked in a public, uh, in an in a address, you need the corresponding private key. So how is a, what is a private key? Well, private key is basically the thing that, the secret that lets you access all the Bitcoin in a, in a certain wallet. And what is good about uh, private keys uh, is the fact that once you generate a private key, uh, you can be sure mathematically it wasn't, it didn't exist before because the, the numbers of variation of the, those private key are just practically infinite. So uh, it's really, it's just impossible. Uh, somebody else has also your private keys. So once you generate your private keys, uh, it doesn't matter if you use a mobile wallet, if you use a hardware wallet, if you use a desktop wallet, because you can all use the same private keys to interact uh, with Bitcoin with different formats. And the problem with private keys in the beginning was basically you had the whole, your whole Bitcoin stash, your whole Bitcoin secret stored in something like this, which is uh, you know, kind of not practical because if you note it down and you just get one number or one letter wrong, well, you're screwed, right? You, it, it can be really hard for after that to, to try to uh, uh, regain your, your access to Bitcoin. So that's why uh, the years after, uh, developers have been developing ways in order to make it more easy. And uh, today, most, in most of the cases, people will conserve their private key in a, another form, uh, which is called a seed. So instead of having a string like this, uh, you will have a, a, a list of either 12 or 24 words, uh, which are really human readable, and they have been chosen uh, from a set of words in order to be uh, the first, fir first characters of each word uh, is different. So you don't, it's really hard to even mistake, uh, even if you do like a mistake in the word itself, like a, one character wrong, you'll probably find really easily the, the word in the list of the pro uh, that are part of, the, of that standard. So uh, today, and we got, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you on the on the demo uh, the, the the words and everything how it works. So for now, stay with me. One thing uh, I always tell people because I've seen this. We have been working with people so much uh, uh, that had problems, and the problem with Bitcoin is once there's a problem, it's really hard to find it back because that's the way it's done. You have to take your own responsibility of your own coins, be your own bank. So that. So if you do a mistake, there's no uh, 1888 Bitcoin to call. Well, maybe now they will be with us, but it's always about prevention and not uh, trying to solve the problem after all, because after uh, it's gonna be really hard. And I've seen people, for example, using 
trying to create their own master plan of like trying to distribute their keys, dividing their seed in two, uh, switching some letters, switching some words. And that's the worst thing you can do because uh, don't rely on your mind. Uh, people always forget. Uh, I, like I have like close relatives that have been saying to them like, like keep it simple, you know? Uh, there is a way to make it more secure, to add more redundancy to your system, but if you try to play on your own with it and it's, it's not gonna work, you're not that smart and you have bad memory. And I know it by myself, so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's keep that in mind. So obviously, Blue Wallet is uh, our favorite wallet to recommend to people that want to get started. It's also the favorite uh, wallet of uh, Jack, the CEO of uh, Twitter. Uh, maybe maybe not the favorite, but one of uh, one of the favorite. Uh, so I think it's a great source. Uh, it's uh, it's really TV new. They have been working really hard, and for me, it's uh, the best wallet out there to really start people get started. So the the really the great thing about Blue Wallet is, is that it lets you gradually evolve into the Bitcoin ecosystem while you're growing your knowledge and. Uh, your, your tools and your set of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, concepts you know about Bitcoin. So for example, in the beginning, you're just gonna install a regular Bitcoin on-chain wallet, which we're gonna do also on the demo. But then after you have few options, so for the beginners, you are, you're not gonna know what it means, but you can have uh, some kind of wallet where you only look at your Bitcoins, which is a called a watch only wallet, but you cannot interact with it, you cannot send it. So. That's a form of a wallet that can be used in Blue Wallet. You have multisig, which is one of the way that I said earlier to make your system more robust, which, uh, which instead of having only one seed, you have a few, and uh, you need few of uh, signatures of those seeds in order to make a transaction valid. But that's a more advanced feature, and it's not gonna be necessarily shown in Blue, Blue Wallet right away in order to not confuse the, uh, the user, uh, but it's an option that you can use and experiment with and play. And you also have a Lightning Wallet. We have a full day dedicated to Lightning on uh, uh, Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday. Uh, it's gonna be really great. So we're gonna talk more about Lightning another uh, uh, Wednesday, but it also has a Lightning Wallet inside, which is great because you can send smaller amounts for smaller fees. For those who don't know what is a Lightning Wallet yet, don't worry. In uh, Wednesday, you're gonna learn a lot about this. Other other features that I really like that, that are great and that can be used basically for even even people have a tendency to believe that oh it's a mobile wallet I don't really feel safe uh, I don't I'm not gonna keep uh, a lot of uh, bitcoins on it and obviously you shouldn't keep your whole stash that you intend to hold for many many years on a mobile wallet but. Uh, for me, when I'm traveling, uh, if I have all these options inside a really uh, usable wallet, I'm really happy, and uh, it also uh, it also it's it's really customizable as I will you show as I will show. Sorry. <coughs> so uh, it has coin control, which means you can see uh, the UTXOs individually, not just having a sum sum up round up uh, Bitcoin amount of all your wallets. Uh, you have the ability once you send a transaction but the fee is too low and the mempool is full you can replace uh, use the rbf function which uh, which can which means that you can add uh, more fees and make that's also an improvement that has been brought into bitcoin over the years you have a function such as fake password so if anybody if somebody sorry <coughs> if somebody comes to you he knows you have bitcoins because you have been bragging in the bar too much and he takes you in the alley and uh, he saw you playing with your blue wallet, well, uh, you can have a fake password, uh, which leads to like a fake wallet, maybe have a little bit of Bitcoin on there to, uh, to uh, skew the, the, the crooks away. So a lot of feature like this, you can connect to your own node. Uh, your own node, again, that's a, a feature that's gonna be discussed Tuesday. Uh, it's about having your own Bitcoin uh, server, uh, which makes you completely uh, independent and completely sovereign when using Bitcoin. Uh, so, you know, it's completely open source, which is, I think, one of the most important um, aspect behind a, a wallet because you, you need to make sure there's nothing wrong with the code uh, that could make uh, 
like some like if the, the the team behind the wallet will be uh like not good or anything they, they could steal your coins or whatever or generate some uh seeds that were pre a uh, pre uh pre-hash or whatever and it's really nice you can have it on multiple platforms so it's really nice i'm gonna show you a lot so let's play i don't know what time is it okay we still have a, a little bit of time so if you want to, if you don't have Blue Wallet yet and you want to install it now, take two, three minutes. Uh, we, you can play with us and especially those for, uh, uh, who, who don't have a Blue Wallet yet or anything like this, uh, we can start playing and uh, we'll switch over uh, to the camera here so I can show you well what is happening. So I'll let you two, three, like two minutes. Yep. Oh yeah, one trick I have when trying to convert people, which I have done a lot during a these five, uh, five past years, maybe hundreds, it's really to do a transaction, you know? If you say like, okay, just stop, stop asking question, let me just install Blue Wallet, I'm gonna send you some Bitcoins. And when they see the magic of a Bitcoin transaction happening, like literally money appearing in their hands without any banks, any intermediate, any, any financial institution, any government overseeing the transaction, while well, they, they kind of, it's really more easy to grasp the power of Bitcoin, just not, not just because of scarcity and the fact that it can go up in value, but the fact that you can use it completely freely and it's, uh, uh, it's freedom money, basically, right? So, uh, are, is everybody good? Just a small question. Yeah. Who's the owner of Blue Wallet? Is it uh, it, Bitcoin? No, no, it's a, it's a company on its own uh, for now. They have, uh, for example, they can make money because they have uh, exchange that is directly linked to them. But I think their mission right now is really to grow and have the biggest user base of uh, uh, Bitcoin wallets. And then after that, you can add on services. But obviously all the, the cryptography, all the, the, the things that make the private keys and everything, that's not related to the servers of Blue Wallet or anything. Uh, but of course, there is some connection, for example, for the price. When it shows you the price, I will show you. It's connected to CoinDesk, for example. So, you know, they, they want to attract users in order to develop some services on top one day. Okay. So I think everybody sees. Is everybody good with uh, the blue wallet? You need a minute? No? All good? Okay. Perfect. So really easy, right? So uh, you have uh, all these options here. So you can create multiple wallets. And uh, when you start, it's going to show you uh, an empty wallet. I basically already created a wallet. So you should see like add now, right? Um, so that's what you're going to do. So here you have the option of naming your Bitcoin blue wallet. So you can just say test. And I don't advise of necessarily using the wallet you're going to create right now. Uh, because maybe there's uh, people that are really bad in the room and they're filming your seed. But probably not because everybody's really nice. But I, I advise to just delete the app afterwards and uh, create a new wallet when you're at home and you can do it on your own. So as I said before, there are different types. So you have Bitcoin, which is, uh, which is the thing we're, we're going to do. And Lightning, we're going to uh, explore that Wednesday, so not today. And Vault, uh, also a more advanced um, security feature, but you also have the option of importing a wallet, right? So as I said before, uh, you, when you have a seed, which we're going to create in a second, when you have a seed, you can use that seed in different wallets. In the past, uh, it has been more difficult because the wallets were using different uh, kind of uh, addresses format and different uh, pri uh, private key formats. So some of the wallets are not compatible with uh, each other. So sometimes you, you need some kind of gymnastic to, to, like, uh, to send your Bitcoins to, to some wallet to another. Uh, but now the, the Bitcoin wallets kind of converge to the same standard. So if you create a, a seed 
in uh, most of the, the wallets today, I, I think you should be good of uh, you know, importing it blue wallet. But if you have a problem, of course you can contact us. So let's create a Bitcoin wallet, is it like this? So obviously these words, uh, don't try to sweep them. I'm not gonna send any Bitcoins there. So it's only to show you how it works. So uh, one thing, basic thing for, for those who are uh, uh, more than big, just like more than beginners, you should never uh, note these on an electrical form. So don't type them on a computer. Don't take a screenshot, don't take a picture. Uh, because that's the easiest way uh, to hack you. Well, it, as soon as you create hackable content on where your private keys are, uh, you're exposing yourself to, to that risk. So it's just better to not do this so it doesn't happen. And obviously, uh, people will, for example, note it on a piece of paper or for more redundancy. Um, uh, you can also, for example, engrave it in metal. Uh, we're gonna bring some metal plates during the week so you can play with it. So for example, because these are really the most important because even if you lose your mobile wallets or it gets stolen, if you have your words, you can always recuperate your Bitcoins and uh, have access to them. So really focus on this. And when you're explaining to this to other people, make sure they understand how important it is. And you could basically travel with your own wealth if you remember these words uh, all across the world, uh, it's called like a brain wallet. But again, don't trust yourself, so you shouldn't do this. But this is all you need to have your Bitcoins, right? Okay, I wrote it down. So uh, what you want to do with your Bitcoin wallet? Well, you can do pretty uh, awesome stuff, but the most important is receiving Bitcoin and sending Bitcoin, right? So with Blue, Bit uh, with Blue Wallet, it's really easy. You simply click on this. Right now, I have zero Bitcoin. And you can either buy Bitcoin here, which uh, is the local, uh, the, their, their partner, or you can create, generate an address here. And then again, most of the wallets today will ask you specifically if you have backed up your seed. And some of them will even um, ask you right after they have shown it to you to re uh, rewrite it down to make sure, but that's sometimes for people like us that wanna try like 20 wallets, it's really annoying of just like noting everything. So I like the experience of Blue Wallet of like not forcing you, but they still remind you and you still have the option of after going back to settings and, um, and uh, seeing them. So I have not, but yes, I have. And you have the option of either receiving a notification when there's incoming payment. Uh, you know, I like it to see when I receive Bitcoin, so I said, okay. But, you know, if you don't want to be connected to their servers that push notifications, uh, I will say no, so I will say no. So that's how a Bitcoin address looks, right? It's beautiful. Um, you can share it. You can share it to your friends, uh, to, to whoever uh, owes you money or uh, wants you to send Bitcoins, or if you're buying Bitcoin, obviously you're gonna need an address just like this uh, to receive it. So here, when you click on it, it's really nice because it copies it automatically. And when you share that address to somebody, you, you, you need to make sure all the characters have been shared uh, properly. So never type this, never write it down manually on your computer. And remember, this is the public address you can share to anybody. This is not the, the uh, private key. So never uh, make sure to, like all the characters are, are good. So your Bitcoin are not sent to, I don't know where, you know? Okay, so pretty easy, right? So far, uh, you can also send, obviously. Uh, I have no Bitcoins on there, uh, but you can, uh, so, on the, on the other side, if you want to send Bitcoins, somebody will need to share one address that looked like the one I showed you here, and you will basically uh, copy paste it here, or you can always scan, right? There was a QR code, so if some, if some of you want to do some transaction between you or whatever, you can scan the QR code of the other person so you don't have to copy paste the address and everything. You can leave a note to yourself. Uh, for example, I have sent this in a bar 
at 3 a.m. So I'm just to remember why there's less and less bitcoins in your wallet. And uh, yeah, next, and that's it. Um, so see, it's really basic. But if you go, for example, in the option, and you click on advanced mode. So I said to you, like, Blue Wallet is great because it starts easy, just the base, receiving and sending Bitcoins. But then you want to go further, you have uh, options to go further. So for example, advanced mode, uh, you can enable it. And when you're going to create uh, a wallet, it's going to ask you a few more specifications uh, and uh, what you want to do exactly with that wallet. Um, so let's try that. Okay. General, sorry. And advanced mode. <coughs> Obviously, uh, there's a lot of uh, features of in the blue wallet, and it's it's a growing set of features. So I'll be not showing them uh, them all, uh, all all of them today, but um, but on their website, it's really clear. Everything is, whoa, everything is explained really well. Uh, sorry. Okay, advanced mode. So yeah, so once you click on advanced mode and you come back, for example, to create another wallet, Bitcoin again, then it's gonna ask you what kind of address, type of address you want. And this is also maybe a topic that's gonna be more or less uh, discussed during the week, but it's uh, kind of complicated. Bitcoin is basically always evolving and it's always growing so, so for, for example some people have the false um, misconception that bitcoin is old, old technology it's not evolving uh, and it's completely false there's dozens or uh, hundreds of bitcoin developers working on bitcoin all the time and uh, really complex stuff that i couldn't explain um, but this is the kind of stuff like address format that people don't really care and uh, most of people don't really care, but for those who want to go further, they will care. So uh, here you can choose a type of address. I, I will not explain the type of address today, but uh, you can do it. But also, for example, if you don't trust Blue Wallet, you can, you can provide your own source of randomness into the creation of the seed. So one thing I didn't mention, when a wallet creates a seed, it's, it does it completely randomly with an algorithm. And you have to make sure that algorithm is really completely uh, random. If not, somebody could uh, infer information or uh, like guess what could be your private key. Or even, even further, somebody could like make it a completely fake way of making private keys and it looks like it's been generated for you randomly but it has been pre-calculated in advance. So if you don't trust Blue Wallet and you wanna go a little bit further, you have a different ways to add entropy, which is like the way you, uh, the denomination to say randomness, and, and you can roll dices until you reach the amount of, uh, the number of bits of entropy you need in order to generate a private key. But that's an advanced feature. I, I'm trusting Blue Wallet's code since it's open source, it has been checked. So, but if you're a geek and you want to go further, this is uh, some of the options you, you have here. Um, what else, what else? Uh, what else can I show you? Um, oh yeah, in the advanced feature, uh, you can also, for example, when you have a Lightning wallet, connect to your own uh, uh, LNB hub. Uh, so you have more uh, and you can also connect to your own Electrum server, so your, your own node. Uh, so it looks like nothing, but it's a really great sovereign tool. And obviously, if you do transaction, they will, they will all be here. There will be a history and everything, but I didn't want to show you my history. Um, yeah, so there's uh, different tools like this, like is this my address? So in a in a Bitcoin wallet, there's millions and millions of addresses. So that's a thing that you can remember as a beginner, even as an intermediate, some people don't know. When you're sharing an address, a Bitcoin address to somebody in order to get paid, you should not share that same address twice. It's not the end of the world, you're not gonna die, but 
Uh, it's better for privacy and security reason to not share the same address twice. So inside a Bitcoin wallet, uh, there's millions of them from one private key. Uh, so as I said before, in the past, there has been different standards from a wallet to another. And uh, because of this, uh, some people had some addresses that they couldn't find in the wallet itself because the wallet is so vast and so big and uh, like there's so millions of addresses. So the, the wallet itself cannot find the address, your own address in the, its own wallet. So um, Blue Wallet is including tools like this for people that have, for example, old seeds or old uh, addresses, whatever, and they create tools like this. Uh, so yeah, I invite everybody to try it and I think you will love it. I don't know if you have a other suggestion of mobile wallets, but that has been our choice number one. And I wanted to present to you really as a tool uh, to onboard people. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because in, uh, there are very, uh, many interesting features in this wallet, and what I noted was uh, coin control. Yeah. As I think is so that that means that you control uh, your UTXO that you want to send off or not. Exactly. Off. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. Um, so, well, I cannot show it because I don't have. Uh, don't bit, have I don't have funds. Yeah. Uh, so basically. Uh, let me explain for the audience that don't understand when you the way Bitcoin works is literally as if you you will have like pieces of gold uh, like being transferred over over the internet but how they manifest is basically through UTXOs which is an acronym for unspent transaction outputs so if you have one Bitcoin um, it's literally a piece of one Bitcoin. And when you want to, for example, send 0.5 Bitcoin to somebody, so basically half of your Bitcoin, what, what, what is happening inside the transaction, it's as if the, the Bitcoin gets melted in two separate pieces. So one of the piece, 0.5, goes to the recipient of uh, how, how it was written on the transaction, and the 0.5 comes back to uh, to your own wallet. So that's why, for example, in a, uh, uh, yeah, let me show you just, uh, uh, yeah, it's, some, some sort of way? yeah, it's like a getting a change your, yeah. Uh, I really see it as, as you will melt gold. For, because for example, you can have 10 pieces of 0 0.1 Bitcoin inside your wallet and your wallet will show you that you have one. Some of them will abstract the fact that we, you have different pieces of Bitcoin inside your wallet. So imagine that uh, you have 10 separate pieces of 0 0.1 uh, and, you wanna, and you wanna send 0.5 Bitcoins to somebody well, you only need directly to send five of them and not a whole Bitcoin in order to melt it. So, uh, and that's also another advanced thing to do as a Bitcoiner is to aggregate all your UTXOs into one because when you're doing a Bitcoin transaction, the fee that is applied on the Bitcoin transaction is not dependent on uh, the amount of Bitcoin you're sending. It's dependent on the, the, the size uh, of the transaction. So if you have more UTXOs, it means your transaction will be more heavy in terms of size it takes in a block. So since the fee that is applied on uh, a Bitcoin transaction depends on the, the, uh, the size of the transaction, if you have less UTXOs, you're gonna pay less. So I can show you a mempool. Uh, can we show this? The, the That's a great tool. <coughs> And uh, strangely, well, strangely, we don't know exactly why, but well, that's the thing. Over the years, exchanges, users have been learning to use Bitcoin uh, uh, more efficiently because, for example, in 2017, the, the, the fees were, went up really high and uh, people don't necessarily knew how to use Bitcoin perfectly in order to 
um, uh, to, to pay less fees as possible. So I think that over the years people have learned and so it's kind of a, uh, and it's still evolving, you know. So for example, Taproot, which has been like a, a, a one of the latest improvement in terms of uh, addresses format and everything that has been implemented, also reduces the, the, the size of the transaction. And uh, there's, for example, ways to aggregate uh, it's called batching. You b batch a bunch of uh, 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 transactions together. So per transaction, it takes less uh, size. Uh, there's SegWit uh, that have been uh, also beneficial uh, to make uh, to to use the, the thing efficiently. So okay, so I'm going to explain you what what it means. So th this here is basically the Bitcoin blockchain working flawlessly uh, since uh, almost 12 years, more than 12 years. So this, so we are at block six hundred ninety-six thousand zero and seventy-eight, and it's still going and going and going. And you can see the number of transaction, and you can see what has been paid in average, in terms of satoshi per V byte. So that's advanced because you, you know that's Bitcoin. You, you ask a question and so much things afterwards. So uh, if you want to pay less fees when you're sending transaction. Uh, and you have a lot of UTXOs inside your wallet, what you can do is when it's really low like this, uh, it's even like once, that's the minimum, right? That means like almost nobody is using, well, a lot of people are using Bitcoin, but almost nobody is really uh, prone to pay a lot in order to make it uh, happen faster. There's often when there's a uh, big price actions or anything, obviously there will be, uh, the transaction will be higher because everybody wants to buy or or withdraw from exchanges or send, you know, uh, people trading and everything. But right now, I think the the price action is pretty calm, so that's maybe that, that's why it's uh, that's why it's like this. So, when you have a lot of UTXOs, for example, if you're you're if you're a user that buys regularly fifty dollars fifty dollars worth of Bitcoin per week or every two weeks, so you have every week a new transaction coming in, so a new UTXO, a new piece of Bitcoin coming into your wallet. And at some point, if you want, I don't know, uh, buy a house or, uh, or anything uh, with your Bitcoins because it, uh, it has been uh, going up in value, if you sell all, that, all these different pieces of Bitcoin together uh, and, it's, uh, and, it's, uh, uh, and at that time there's a lot of price action and the price is going up, well, the transaction may cost you a lot. So that's why when, it, when the activity of the blockchain is like this, you should do a transaction, taking all your UTXOs and sending it to one address. So you have, instead of having multiple, you have one, one UTXO. Uh, question, uh, yeah. if, you, if you click receive and you take that, pub, that public address and you send like four times to that same public address, that's four UTXOs? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Would you say, uh, as far as onboarding people, would you say uh, it's easier to leave out the part about the mempool? And, and Definitely. And what would you say? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what would you say about you know um, having applications and wallets deciding for the fees for you? Because at the moment we're having great fees because well the mempool is relatively empty or mm -hmm. not so active. But as far as onboarding a new New person, new user. What what do you recommend for fee management? So I think the fee management. Uh, well, you have to kind of explain to the person if if they are not uh, if they're just like a passive investor and they want to receive Bitcoin or uh, to their wallets and they don't really care when they receive it. Well, obviously you should tell them. Well, you know. It's going to arrive at some point to your wallet, but you shouldn't spend fees for nothing. So just as a, as default, use always the, the lowest uh, the fee possible. But you know, it, it has been happening uh, during the last year, for example, that uh, for weeks, uh, like the, the fees were, for example, a few dozens of Satoshis, right? So depend, you know, it, it's never nice to see your Bitcoin transaction unconfirmed. Like the feeling of it is like, you know it's coming, but at some point you just want it in your wallet. But I like Blue Wallet because it still offers you the option of uh, slow, uh, slow, medium, and fast. Uh, and fast. 
but you can still choose your own custom uh, fee. So I wouldn't, you know, depend depend on the people, like uh, how technical they are. But I wouldn't necessarily mention the mempool. Like yeah, this yeah. kind of looks scary. Uh, <laughs> so that's like a more advanced tool, I would say. And for people that you know, I, they don't want to pay one Sotoshi more, they should they should not, yeah. you know. But the worst is are really the exchanges because the exchanges. Uh, it's funny because uh, uh, actually a cl a uh, somebody that wanted to come to the conference, he wanted to pay us in Litecoin and we're like, no. And uh, he was like, oh, oh yeah, but the Bitcoin uh, transaction is like $30. And I'm like, eh? And I look at the mempool, it was like this. I'm like, it's impossible, it's $30. It's because you're using an exchange and they apply a basic fee uh, in terms of Bitcoin. So obviously if Bitcoin is going up in price, the fee is gonna become ridiculous, and they lo they don't let you choose the the cost the the custom uh, custom fee when you you're using uh, 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 an exchange, right? And that's dangerous because if uh, a lot of people, it's like a run on the bank, right? If a lot of people uh, go to a bank at a certain amount of time and there's not enough liquidity, uh, well, sometimes the bank can close, and it's the same thing with exchanges. They have been blocking withdrawals. Uh, when there was like a high activity because they don't want to get screwed with fees, right? And it's normal because they're a business. They would get like, they could like wipe out a lot of profits in just like few days of trading because the price is like really going up or whatever. So that's the thing. Be when the price is going up, you should have your Bitcoins, well, always your Bitcoins out of your, uh, the, the, uh, your exchanges. If you, well, that depends if you're a trader or use, for example, bull Bitcoin, you don't, ever need to care about that problem because we pay the transaction fees um, that are related to uh, uh, to the sending the bitcoins to you so whenever they're high they're the, the um, um, they're high or they're low you, d you don't pay them well they're like kind of included in the price but and that's because we're an exchange so we have the a lot of transaction happening at the same time so we can batch them you know so so there's different things like this. So obviously don't use an exchange. They can screw you over and not let you withdraw your coins. Yeah. Maybe last question. Just a slight technical one uh, regarding terminology. What's the uh, relationship between a public key and a Bitcoin address? Is that the same thing? No, absolutely uh, no. So there's different der derivation uh, from the private key up until the address, uh, so I had the I had the little graph here. So obviously that's a advanced cryptography, uh, but no, in every wallet there is a private key. Then from the private key, uh, there's a master private key, and then there's the master public key, and there's the public keys, and then there's addresses. So I couldn't tell you exactly mathematically uh, what is happening there, but uh, there's like few derivation uh, before. Okay, so the, the address is derived. The key. Exactly. Okay, sure. Not directly from the private key. Yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to mention something uh, like yeah. quick here. Uh, I, if you want to uh, talk about the mempool uh, yeah. to uh, like onboard people, there's a nifty little website called uh, TX Screen, uh, which shows uh, the mempool, but in, like in uh, cartoon characters. Like oh. TX3? This? It's hilarious. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, street. 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 Yeah. yeah, transaction street. Well, there's no three. Oh, yeah. okay, sorry. Uh, oh. This, uh, shit going. So, it <laughs> shows your blockchain, but every transaction is like a little South Park character getting onto the bus. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a that's a great way to put it. Nice. See, Bitcoin is uh, lower than Ethereum. Huh? <laughs> lower fee. So yeah, that's a great way to put it. Mempool is a big, basically a big waiting room where all the transactions are waiting before being included in a, in a block. Uh, by a miner when they solve a valid block, right? So uh, thank you for, that's a great tool and a really funny, funny way to show it.
Um, yeah? It's totally the hacking stuff. Uh, just I want to get this straight because in Blue Wallet, there's a feature, I'm not sure how it works, this offline photo. And can you, can you go over that real quick? Or is it, is it better for another day, maybe? Uh, well, offline mode is just that you have the ability of uh, just not being connected to the internet. So yeah, 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 yeah exactly. I get it. I get it. Um, yeah. I think it's uh, dinner time. So um, just uh, so we have dinner ready. Oh yeah. What's the difference between the that's also um, uh, a little bit more technical uh, than uh, than the the, uh, the purpose of that presentation. But uh, basically, SegWit redefined the way uh, space was defined as in a Bitcoin transaction, and there was a different uh, ratio applied uh, to a certain part of the transaction and. Uh, and it, before it was Satoshi per bytes, and now it's Satoshi per V bytes. So it just redefines the way a transaction um, is, uh, is accounted. And, uh, and it also solved the problem with malleability. So once a transaction is uh, being uh, shared, to, uh, shared uh, in the mempool, before there was a way to change some information and that was dangerous for uh, Lightning Network, so it's a, it's a lot of technical stuff, but uh, uh, the best response to this will be, uh, I think, Etienne or even uh, 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 Gustavo, like if you want, really want to go in details uh, into that. No, I'm, I'm not so interested in the technical details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it uh, makes the transaction less uh, heavy, so you pay less fee. So you should always choose uh, SegWit. Uh, yeah, it's cheaper. exactly. It's cheaper. So in terms of, um, functionality, uh, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same, and uh, it's just that sometimes some um, some exchanges have been really slow to adopt SegWit because in the past they have been like kind of against SegWit because they were pushing the big blocks. Uh, um, way of evolving Bitcoin, so SegWit was like their enemy. So, so even uh, like even not a long time ago, some of the biggest exchanges still had, were on the legacy system. Uh, but the only reason why I will use a legacy wallet will be to really maybe take out Bitcoins from something as far as a website that only supports a legacy address to then convert them back to a SegWit, uh, SegWit Bitcoins. You know. They're not so good Bitcoins, but yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, when you consolidate UTXO, does it change anything about the security in terms of like a third party knowing the amount of Bitcoin that you have? Um, if, if a third party already knows that you're the owner of certain of those uh, UTXOs, but not necessarily the others, uh, he could infer that you're probably the owner of these other UTXOs you're also batching together. So it depends on the situation of the individual UTXOs you have in your wallet and what has been their history in the past. So uh, that's actually the topic uh, we're gonna talk more just right after dinner. It's uh, Wasabi, CoinJoin, and tools to uh, break the history of your UTXOs so they can be like really fresh and uh, nobody can infer any type of information about yourself. So, you know, obviously uh, Bitcoin addresses and are pseudonymous, so there's no name attached to them. But if, uh, if somebody is like um, smart enough or they have great, great tools, you know, like government agencies or a crook that want to steal from you, he could, if you batch, you could be in trouble if he already know, knows that, uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, dinner is served, and uh, just uh, one uh, detail: uh, we will have a uh, cassette right after the conference on the terrace here. So it's all included uh, in the, the conference ticket, obviously. And uh, so you're also welcome to stay after. But we'll have two more presentations 
and uh, dinner. And yeah, thank uh, you very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. So please be back here at like one. And uh, yeah, thank you. Parfait. Fait que next, c'est ça que ça va. Ok. Et ça a bien été? oui. <rire> Merci. Je vais mettre ton micro sur la charge pendant qu'on dit. Ouais, ouais.
smell I just want you to be here Yeah And I play my mind From not having time I forgot what you deserve Yeah Ooh, na, 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 na. You know that I miss you so smell I just want you to be here yeah and I play my mind from not having time I forgot what you deserve yeah Ooh, na, 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 na. you know that I miss you so All right, so we're back. So thank you everyone. Uh, we just came back from lunch and I'm gonna start now this segment by introducing Wasabi. And uh, we're also gonna see uh, from, from the slides I have here. And then we're gonna have Max Hillebrand. He's gonna join us from Europe uh, virtually. He's gonna talk about Wabi Zabi, which is basically Wasabi 2.0. A lot of changes that are gonna happen in Wasabi. Um, okay, so uh, introduction to Wasabi. Uh, can I have the slides uh, shown here? Mm -hmm. 
Perfect, thank you. So, just to start, uh, and here's a quote from Eric Hughes, who, who's a, like a known cypherpunk uh, from the 80s. It was very influential to, throughout the, and for the Bitcoin creation, actually. Like, the, these people were working on ideas like Bitcoin back in the 80s and 90s, uh, trying to think, like, what could we, what are we going to do in the future when uh, privacy becomes a real concern? Uh, because they could envision the web and, and just everything unfolding. So here's a quote. Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Privacy is not secrecy. A private matter is something one doesn't want the whole world to know. But a secret matter is something one doesn't want anybody to know. Privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. So let's talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin has imperfect privacy. Like, yes, an address is not linked to your identity. So, like, it, it looks good on, on paper, right? But the transaction data structure makes it that coins can be followed. So, for example, if I sell you Bitcoin, um, and I know your identity due to KYC laws or just because I know you, um, and you send me an address, well, I can follow then the coins you move. So, for example, uh, here I have an example of just a Blockstream Explorer. Uh, we see that, let's say, this is just a very random transaction, by the way. So this, we see that uh, I get, let's say, this address that's highlighted on the output side, so on the, on the right side, that starts with 3D. Let's say I get that address from someone here, and uh, I sell them Bitcoin, and I send them Bitcoin in this transaction. Uh, now I know that this is yours, and you got Bitcoin. Uh, so what I can do then is I can just follow the transactions and see that oh, uh, a couple uh, days later, you sent it uh, to two addresses. And we can see them on the right side, and we see that the first address has a round number, 0 0.03, so it's very easy for me to know that you, you, you probably send that to somebody else. It's not changed, it's just too perfect to be changed. Uh, and the rest is changed, it's usually listed like that. So I know that this, this is all like uh, under like probabilistic, uh, uh, heuristic approach, so like maybe I could be wrong, but I'm probably right if I'm analyzing this. So this, could, this is changed, and this is going back to you. And also, it has the same address type. So you're probably using the same wallet. So I can follow this, and I know these are your coins. Uh, and I can see that the same thing happens just a couple of days later. It's a very similar uh, uh, behavior, you see. It goes to an address that starts with one, a legacy address. You send a very round number. You send back coins to you. So I know this is yours again, and I can follow your coins like that. Uh, so basically, this is how people operate uh, well, when they follow coins. So what if I could break the link of my coins, or at least confuse by a probabilistic approach, the watcher? Uh, and this is basically what people have been asking themselves since the beginning of Bitcoin. So in comes CoinJoin. And CoinJoin basically is multiple parties collaborating. Each, wants, each has the same goal. Each wants privacy for their coins, uh, and they enter all their coins into the same transaction. So here you see uh, on the image, on the graphic right here, you see on the left side, the inputs, basically what everyone is getting into the transaction with, and on the right side you see the output, so what everyone is coming out with. So you see three participants come in with 5.1, 4.3, 2.2, and, and there's a lot of one bitcoins that just get out, sent to new addresses, in equal amounts, um, so where did it go? If I was following the 5.1, which of the one bitcoins is it? Is it the first five, the last five? I don't know. There's a, I could guess, I could uh, then analyze, and there's not a lot of data here, so maybe I could figure it out because there's only three parties, like 10 outputs. Uh, it's pretty simple, right? But there's, you, you still see that there's uh, more parties, more anonymity, and you, you see that mm. getting out of a transaction in equal outputs to new fresh addresses uh, and change makes it just that uh, it increases, it, it breaks the blockchain heuristic uh, of analysis. But it doesn't stop there. It's not only about coins that get fault. It's also about network privacy. And this is sometimes underestimated by uh, just people that are trying to look for privacy solutions. Uh, so every time you use a light wallet, and that would be, let's say you download Blue Wallet, Machek was talking about this morning, uh, or you use Samurai, any, any mobile wallet, any wallet by default 
is a light wallet. That means it's connecting to a server uh, in the company's uh, custody usually is, is just a server to get uh, the list of addresses, to access the blockchain. How do I know I got a transaction on this address? I'm pinging the Blue Wallet server and Blue Wallet is answering back and saying, hey, you got a transaction. And I'm sending my IP address, the list of addresses I have, and other sensitive data. And that data can then be used against you. So for example, we all, very recently, there's some new laws that are passing in the United States talking about uh, the, the uh, uh, making it larger, the definition of a broker, uh, and having some tax implications on multiple parties. That could mean developers of light wallets. Uh, and they have data about you. They know your addresses, they know your IP address, maybe they even know the precise MAC address or of your devices you're using, uh, so it can be very easy to track you down. And, and people say, like, I want to know I'm safe, right? And the answer is, like, do you use Tor, else you're not, because when you propagate a transaction on the network with a node, you're going to reveal your IP address as well. If you're using a VPN or Tor, you're safe, but if you're not, uh, then just uh, people analyzing the network can find out your IP address, they can link it to the transaction you just broadcasted, uh, and then just deduce uh, by probabilities um, what is your IP address, what is your identity, and what are your transactions. So then comes in solutions like Neutrino SPV. So Neutrino simple, Simplified Payment Verification is a light wallet protocol that allows you to, allows light wallets to be private. Basically, the, the way it works, instead of sending addresses to the server and asking for if, if it got transactions, it's requesting a lot of blocks of the blockchain. It's requesting like many gigabytes of data. So let's say thousands of blocks. So the server is just basically sending thousands of blocks, not the whole blockchain, just let's say 1%, 2% of it, uh, and the light wallet, which uses Neutrino, can then uh, find a transaction within those thousand blocks. Uh, and if you use it combined with Tor, then you don't even reveal your IP address to the server that's feeding you the Neutrino SPV uh, blocks. So those two solutions together fix network privacy. And in comes Wasabi. Wasabi is a combination of basically everything that I've discussed, taking it to, to, to the further extent uh, it, it's been so far technically possible to do. So Wasabi is an open source, non-custodial and privacy focused Bitcoin wallet for desktop. It has Neutrino SPV and Tor. It comes with Tor on the app, so you don't even need to have it installed on your computer. Just download Wasabi from wasabiwallet.io. You get Wasabi, it comes with Tor, it comes with Neutrino. You get the, the transactions you, you need in a fully private way. You never disclose your IP address to anybody. Uh, and then, if you want a coin join, uh, if you remember the example I had shown earlier, it shows uh, like three participants. But on Wasabi, there can be between 50 to 100 participants. So the probability of uh, someone finding out who, wh where did you exit to, and uh, just link the entrance and the exit of the transaction is very hard to do because if let's say it's equal amounts and equal probabilities and there's 100 participants, then it's one out of 100. So they would, have, they would be wrong 99 times um, out of 100 if they were trying to guess on average. So Wasabi is also written in C Sharp and uses the .NET framework technologies developed by Microsoft, uh, which are all open source. And it uses the zero link protocol for its coin join implementation. And this is very important because some people don't have a lot of questions whether what's what, which is best, Wasabi, Samurai, Join Market. Uh, and the implementation of Wasabi of, of coin join uses blind signatures to communicate with the server. And this is a little bit more complex than, than what can I just easily uh, explain. But basically, these are just communications that are done between the Wasabi coordinator, which coordinates the 100 participants, and each participant every time there's an update. So uh, we're going to start a transaction, uh, sign the input, sign the output, uh, and things like that. Just to, for all the communication is done through blind signatures. So 
no data is ever revealed between the, the, the server and the client. On top of that, every time you, there's a change on a coin join transaction, so when you get in and you get out, you get a new different Tor at identity. So even uh, if, the, if the server is seeing your Tor identity, your Tor address, it has no link to your uh, identity whatsoever, it changes during the process of coin join. So they don't even know you were the one uh, that started. They, they cannot even de-anonymize the process themselves. They cannot even link the people entering and the addresses exiting the transaction, uh, which is very different from other protocols, which are incomplete. Uh, and also, just the fact that Wasabi uses Neutrino SPV makes it very different from Samurai, which uses an API wallet service. So basically, Samurai pings the server and asks, what are the transactions related to these addresses, uh, which is very different from Wasabi. So the server cannot steal, it cannot de-anonymize, uh, and that's very important. So if you want some advanced reads on that, uh, I advise you to go on any of these links. Uh, I really like the Wasabi Wallet documentation, docs.wasabiwallet.io. Uh, or you can just, if you want to expand further your privacy, uh, you can go on privacytools.io, websites like that have a lot of like VPN information, uh, just websites, alternatives to uh, browsers, alternatives to emails uh, that are privacy uh, preserving. Uh, or what I really like is also the blog post by Jameson Lopp, uh, which is a modest privacy protection proposal. And it has uh, a lot of information. And this goes even deeper because it talks about uh, how to hide your identity when you own corporations, when you own a house, how to just completely mask your identity everywhere from voter registration uh, to, to really anything. Uh, it's, it's based in, on, on a United States model, but it can be applicated uh, across different jurisdictions. So basically this is uh, the introduction to Wasabi and we have a couple minutes before Max jumps in. Uh, so I can take any questions uh, if anybody wants to, has one. Um, also, I. If, let us know if, uh, if when you ask the question, we can zoom in the camera. If, if that's okay with you, just make a sign with, uh, with the head and, and we'll do that. Okay, so go ahead. I think he had his hand uh, raised first. I'm sorry, if you're okay with the camera. Uh, can you pass on that? Yeah, for sure. No, no problem. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I've played with this a little bit. Uh, when you need to upgrade it, you have to delete and then re-download, correct? There's nowhere to go in there when, you need, when there's a new version? No, there's, there's a way. There's a way. It depends, first of all, on the architecture of the operating system you're using. So Wasabi differs if it's on Windows, Mac, Linux. Uh, so Linux, usually, you would have to reinstall it. Uh, but on Windows, it's much easier. You can click on it and, and just reinstall it there. Uh, but to be honest, the safest way to install software is always to just delete it, get a new version, verify the signatures, maybe even build it from source, so grab the code, and that's a bit too technical. But at least verifying the signatures uh, is a good practice to make sure that you're using the right software. Because it has happened in the past, not with Wasabi, but with Electrum that you're going to see a message that says, new version, download here. And when you're going to click on it, it's actually going to connect to another server. And it's going to download a, a faulty version, a hacky version. Uh, but that is specific to Electrum. But just to say, like, you, you, it's important when dealing with these things, where privacy is very carefully important, or security, uh, to, to take the, the, the most precautions possible, and that would be installing it, verifying the signatures, uh, and doing it all over again. Of course, don't forget your seed phrase, that which has your recovery uh, information for your Bitcoin wallet. And also keep in mind that when using Wasabi, you don't only need your seed phrase, you need a password, which is actually a passphrase. Um, so you need both pieces of information to recover funds if you lose access to your device. Okay, and also, um if I'm not seeing a coin join tab, I've done something wrong, obviously, right? Uh, the tabs on Wasabi, you, they don't appear by default. 
you can add them like uh, sometimes they don't appear. So like you have to go on like view, add tab, uh, okay. coin join, things like that. So, okay. Um, so if you have your Bitcoin on an exchange and you want to transfer it to a Wasabi wallet, um, wouldn't it be able to be tracked because you're transferring a Bitcoin from a known uh, address to a Wasabi wallet address? So couldn't that be tracked? You kind of, you know, link. You, you can still link to the to the to the to the person. That's a very good question. So for that, I'm gonna go on Wasabi wallet uh, and show where does the link stop? Because it's true that if you send it from an exchange. Uh, and you send it to a Wasabi wallet address, um, the, the, the exchange is going to know you, you probably sent it to a Wasabi wallet address or at least a Wasabi coin join. Uh, and some exchanges don't like that. Huh? Like uh, it's been reported that Bitbuy doesn't like that. Uh, and my advice is just stop using those exchanges. They, they, they just have bad practices. But when you enter Wasabi, you enter a, when you enter a coin join, um, the link breaks. So, for example, you're sending coins to a Wasabi address. It's being used as an input on a coin join transaction. So it, it gets with, into a transaction. And it's listed here. Let's say your, your input would be listed here. The money you send from the exchange would be on this side. Uh, and up, up until now, everybody can follow it. You're, you're right. But the moment it gets out, you see there's just tens of inputs outputs, excuse me, on the right side that are equal amounts going to BC1 addresses. So at that, that's when the break happens. That's when people cannot follow it anymore. Or like I said, they could guess, but good luck. There's a hundred outputs that are exactly the same, uh, going to exactly more than a hundred, uh, as you see. So that's when the link happens. So yes, people can follow up at, until then then it becomes much harder. Another question? Yep, hi, okay. Um, it, it was, before you uh, spoke about Wasabi specifically, you said that uh, you had a, uh, a slide there that said that uh, the company server from the wallet that you're dealing with can track your data in some, some sort of way. So uh, I see like wallets using Electrum servers and, and I just wanna know, I want you to clarify what's your take on wallets using Electrum servers and, and what can they track with that, like before using Wasabi or whatnot? That's a very good question. So the question is really about what's the, about the different light wallet implementations. So there's uh, just regular API communication, application programming interface, which is basically what uh, wallets like Samurai use uh, or like most popular wallets are gonna use, let's say Bread or uh, m most of the popular wallets. How API works is really, hey, I, uh, the, the, the client, the application on the phone asks the server, hey, I have this address or I have this master public key with all these addresses, can you send me a message when I receive a transaction to any of these addresses? So it's has very little privacy, but it only involves the server. So if you trust Samurai uh, wallet or uh, Bread wallet server, you, you only have a relationship with them. Then they can take that data and, and, and share it, send it to someone. But that relation is between you and them, but it's, it, it, but it's very controlling. They, they have a lot of information. And also keep in mind that Samurai, you can opt that out. You can run your own backend of, of, of Samurai, but that requires hardware and configuration. But, but the default is like this. So that's API. SPV, which is what Electrum uses. Well, Electrum uses a, like a different version of SPV, but like, uh, it's, it's, it's different because you can choose the Electrum server you use. You can, you don't, you're not, there's no Electrum Inc. There's Electrum servers, there's a list of 20 servers. So you can grab any server and like public services uh, run uh, Electrum servers that are publicly listed. The problem with that is, um, first of all, you're not disclosing so much information or it was initially thought, uh, but initially it was thought that Electrum was very, was a little bit more private than API because it doesn't 
asks, do I have transactions? It asks for blocks, like Neutrino. But it only asks for like two blocks. So it's very clear that you, you, what your transactions are when you're asking just for a few blocks. So anyways, we now know that electron communication is not that as private as we initially thought, but you're connecting to public servers. And anybody, the CIA, Coinbase Inc., anybody can run a public server. So now you're not only just trusting Samurai Inc. Uh, or just like Brett Inc. Now you're randomly trusting a public Electrum server, which can be better if it's just uh, a fellow Bitcoiner that's doing a, a service, but it can be bad because it can be a government agency or a big corporation. So that's basically the trade-offs between using Electrum and an API wallet. But the difference also is that you can use your own Electrum server. That's your private Electrum server. You can connect it to your private Electrum wallet. That's the best. But by default, a lot of people don't use that. So they might be using bad Electrum servers. I think we have time for one last question. Yeah, there's a, there's a question, there's a question from uh, the stream uh, from uh, Johnny Capot. Um, so yeah, he's saying, hey, great stream. So what is the best practice to combine smaller UTXOs and Wasabi to get up to 0 0.1 Bitcoin for a coin join? Uh, question mark, send to oneself, question mark. Thanks. OK, so that's a tricky question. It's about uh, mixing change or like what some people call post-mix optimization. Uh, and that's the very tricky part. So the rule I follow is this. When you go on Wasabi, you're going to see the coins with different, the, the UTXOs, the, like the specific Bitcoins you have, uh, because Bitcoins are like pieces that are separated. You can have like a $5 piece, a $10 piece, like bills. You can have different Bitcoin pieces. So each Bitcoin piece, which is also called a UTXO, it has a color attached to it. You should never mix coins that have different colors attached to them. So let's say, what do the colors mean? The green color means that it's been through a coin join round, so it's, it's very private, private. But uh, red color means that it's, it hasn't been through a coin join round, it has no privacy. Uh, so you should never mix the red and the green. And actually, when you have green coins, you should leave them alone. You should never mix them with anything else because else it just creates more data to analyze and uh, probabilities just diminish. Uh, so, so basically, take all the UTXOs that are red, mix them all together, try to get to point one, try to get to a coin join round, and then they become green and they're good. Yeah, okay, That's, this is going to be the last question. No, sorry, I'm, I'm cheating. No, no worries, no worries. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, is the blue wallet and the Wasabi wallet interoperable in the sense that can you recover the information or data in one wallet on the other in the case of a counterparty attack against either of these two infrastructures? This is a very good question. So for that, you would, for all those questions about recovering wallets, go on walletsrecovery.org and you're going to see all the uh, interoperability between each wallet that's uh, publicly known, walletsrecovery.org. Uh, so for blue, and we can do it together. Uh, for blue wallet and Wasabi, I'm pretty sure uh, they can be recovered together. Uh, but we're going to see. So basically you go on this website, and you search for blue wallets. Here we have it. Uh, here we see the type it has. So I know it's just numbers, but basically you have to match this with the Wasabi one. So here we see M44, M49, and 84. Uh, so that's basically 44, 49, 84. If Wasabi says the same thing, it means it's OK. So Wasabi's down there, M84. So yes, it, it is compatible because they have the same uh, derivation path. And uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it. All right, so now we're going to switch. Max should be on the Zoom. He's just going to join us with audio. Uh, but Max is very interesting to hear. 
So uh, let's see if he's, uh, he's joining us in, in, wa in the waiting room so we can give uh, him the, the microphone. No, he's still not. Uh, hi, Max, are you there? Good. Hear me? Am I coming through? Yeah, you're coming through. It just was a little buggy, but now, now it hello, seems like. Hello, hello, bull Bitcoin crowd. Are you there? Okay, my. It's a little buggy. Okay, okay. I'm sorry about. I'm gonna come back in a second. Okay, no worries. All right. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's his. We'll, we'll see. Let us know when you're there, Max. So we'll just wait a minute or two for Max to be here. How about now, guys? Is it getting better? It's much better. Thanks. Perfect. Zoom is just a horrible piece of software, and it does not work on Cube's operating system at all. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, here we are. Are you guys ready to rumble? Yes, we're ready. Awesome. So, Piers, unfortunately, uh, you won't have the pleasure of seeing my not-so-beautiful face today, as I have no webcam at my disposal. Uh, but in any case, uh, speech is powerful enough, and I hope to pr convey you an interesting story uh, today with my words. Uh, and it's the story about, well, fixing the only thing that is not yet optimally designed in Bitcoin, and that is privacy. And it's a very big problem, and it wasn't a problem before, so to say. You know, back in 1983, we had the very first digital currency, Chomian eCash, and it, it used very basic blinded cryptography, super simple math formula, and it provided incredibly fast, incredibly cheap, and incredibly private, nearly perfectly anonymous transactions. There was one big, big, big problem to that system, and that was that you, the end user, could not verify anything, and you could not enforce anything. So you couldn't even verify if your trusted third party was cheating. And if you would think that they were cheating, there is nothing that you could do other than, well, stopping to use the service. And that was really bad. Uh, and it really shows that a, a verification of property rights might be even more important than having private property rights per se. Uh, and Ultimately, it took computer scientists well over 30 years to work on a solution to this very big problem of how do we create a money in cyberspace that cannot be stolen on, on any shape or form. And well, Satoshi figured it out. And the only way that you can protect yourself against the dilution of your coin that some idiot will just print a bunch of coins out of nothing and debase your currency. The only thing that you can do is that you as a merchant, as someone selling very scarce goods and services in exchange for money, verify the entire history of that money. That's the very inefficient solution to an incredibly difficult problem. That you, the merchant, need to verify everything. And it works. That's kind of the, the, the utmost crazy thing, that Bitcoin actually works. And that we have found a money that cannot be debased. 
precisely because everyone knows about every transaction and everyone gets to verify every transaction. That comes, of course, with a, a massive privacy downside. Um, there, only the central mint needed to verify a little bit in Xiaomi Cash, right? But the end users didn't care. And that made it super fast, super cheap, and also super private, right? Because almost nobody knows about the transactions in the first place. And that person whom you tell, that trusted third party eCash mint, well, everything against that party is well encrypted. Um, in Bitcoin, again, that's very different, right? And because we rely on sharing all of these financial transactions with every merchant in the network, this is a requirement to protect against the debasement of coin, but it's also a big hindrance in terms of privacy. However, Bitcoin provides individual users complete freedom, to, to a great extent at least. As long as you stay within the standardness level of what a Bitcoin transaction ought to look like, you have a lot of room to play with inside that data structure. And nobody can stop you due to the permissionlessness of Bitcoin mining and the transaction fee that you pay, um, you can protect yourself from censorship. Even if you have a transaction that is optimized for privacy, for your own privacy, uh, because you as the end user are the one that creates this transaction and that signs it. Uh, there is a lot of freedom and a lot of room for improvements to privacy. And you know, it was it was obvious back in the day that this privacy trade-off that Satoshi chose is a very dangerous one. Most of the replies to his mail of the Cypherpunk mailing list were on terms of scalability and privacy. And the two go hand in hand, right? Because the if everyone needs to verify everything, then that means that everyone needs to know about every transaction. And that's for one, of course, the obvious privacy break. But on the other hand, how are you going to think about all of the financial transactions in the economy? Right? That's the scalability issue. You just cannot do that. The computer power would be too immense. And these are two big problems. Right? The system is only secure if you're very transparent and therefore not private. And that means that everyone needs to run this very complex verification computation of your full notes and do that at the point of sale, right? that this is a very tricky thing. So Bitcoin privacy is broken, um, somewhat fundamentally, I would argue. It's a flaw in the system. But we can do our very best to within that constrained confine of the system to optimize for privacy. And this is a privacy optimization, again, not by protocol developers or by protocol implementers. But ultimately, it's a choice and a trade-off made by the users of Bitcoin. And here again, this is a very, it's a very dangerous place to be, right? Because especially for the end user, defaults matter. And especially in the early days of Bitcoin, we did a really bad job of having good defaults. And some of these bad practices were already brought up in, in the talk before, right? Like, for example, it's just super easy to not run your own full node as a merchant uh, and to not verify for yourself right? because oh, that's complex. So you just trust someone else to define and verify your monetary rules. But the sad thing is, it's not just that you need to trust that person to keep the monetary integrity of the medium of exchange that you use, but ultimately you even need to compromise your entire privacy. Again, if it is implemented naively, and it's just much easier to send your extended public key to a trusted third-party server and hope that he's not going to steal from you or spy on you. And, you know, in, in many cases, that will work. It will work for a long time without a hiccup. And it will be much easier to implement and to use. Uh, also because it's easier to, to design a user interface for this, right, than the user experience. But, <laughs> well... The easy path is always the boring path and usually the one that is not as fulfilling. You know, we, we could have stopped researching after 1983 and just stuck with Xiaomi and eCash. That would have been the easy solution. Just build a good trusted third party, right? That's, that shall do the work. Well, 
Cypherpunks are not happy with trusted third parties, and we will not stop on improving the technologies and the weapons that we build until these trusted third parties are all slain. And that takes time, and that takes work, and that takes effort. And we at Wasabi were never the first to try to solve that problem. Um, in, in, in fact, you know, arguably that the um, that that even Satoshi in the white paper was was bringing forward numerous potential solutions, right? So this, the the strive to get Bitcoin more privacy optimized has been there since the very beginning, and that's because Satoshi was very conscious about that trade-off between perfect privacy and perfect audibility, and he understood that for a base money system, perfect audibility and verification of merchants is is more important than the privacy of the merchants. Um, and and that was that was well established, but still, um, there there was this one mention in the white paper that if that you that you as a single user can create a transaction with many coins, and you can spend all of your coins in the same transaction, right? And this is great because. Well, you don't need to make a new transaction to spend each UTXO that you have, right? You can make one big transactions with potentially all of the coins that you have. And there's nothing to prevent that, you know, on a, on a user level, at least not if you, if you very much uh, sacrifice scalability again. Uh, and, and he understood that point. But what he did not articulate per se in the Bitcoin white paper, but an idea that emerged rather quickly on the Cypherpunk mailing list, was this articulation that, yes, one user can consolidate all of his coins in one single transaction. And if you see a Bitcoin transaction out in the wild that has multiple inputs, then there's a, a decently high chance that this is actually one person indeed. And right? so that this is one owner, a common owner to all of these inputs in this transaction. And this is yet another downside in the privacy. Right? Bitcoin is inherently pseudonymous, that there is no real world identity, so to speak, but the blockchain only knows public keys and addresses. And you as an individual, and that's again something Satoshi said, for optimal privacy, should always use a fresh public key or a fresh address as a fresh identity for every time that you as a merchant receive Bitcoin. Uh, because there's simply no requirement that you build up a reputation of ownership on a sim single public key. Right? As, as soon as you have one coin there, that's good enough. And you can spend it the same as if you would have received 100 transactions onto that one public key. So what we though very quickly discovered is that the beauty of Bitcoin and its, its simplistic data structure especially on the transaction side. There is no inherent requirement that when multiple coins are being spent together, that this is really from one party. Or in other words, we can collaborate to make a Bitcoin transaction together so that you're not forever alone in your transaction where all the inputs belong to you, right? but that we collaboratively talk to each other and to build a new transaction where you have a coin and I have a coin. And that's the gist of a coin join, you know, to to be social and uh, to rigorously and violently break the social distancing rule of Corona, and and to bring your coins very close together to someone else, uh, so close that they are in the same transaction. And the cool thing is that once we do that, the assumption that all the coins that we spend together uh, is is no longer valid, right? because here obviously two people spent their coins together. And as soon as we create this, this mesh network of reputational linkages between these public keys, the more complex it is going to be to detangle that. Right? So imagine you always spend coins with, with only yourself in the input. And all of a sudden, it's very easy you know, to follow. Whenever you consolidate multiple coins, they all belong to you. That's super easy to find out. But as soon as you come together with hundreds of users and create a new transaction, that 
and, and then when you spend that coin, again, there are a hundred different coins from other people in that same transaction. It will be more and more and more complex to actually find out who is paying whom and who has common, in, common ownership of these inputs and outputs. And again, we're not the first to come up with this, right? This is early Bitcoin talk forums, cypherpunk mailing lists or Bitcoin mailing lists that we can build these collaborative transactions together. And there, there is, again, a question of trade-offs in, in security and in speed and in privacy. Because, well, when we all talk to each other about making that Bitcoin transaction together, we can do that communication either in a centralized way or in a non-centralized way. Right? There can be one party, the coordinator, so to say, that has more rights, more responsibilities, and more privileges rather than, than other people. Right? There's a distinct differentiation between a client and many, many clients and one server. That is the centrally coordinated model. That's the quick and easy path. Right? And we've had these centrally coordinated coin join for years, implemented numerous times, um, all the way back to probably 2012 or 13. And then there is the really difficult path. Right, to make it decentralized so that every user in the communication process of this collaborative Bitcoin transaction is equal and that there is no trusted third party, that there is no master and no slave, no client and no server, but everyone is equal. Well, it turns out that these things are in theory possible and people like Tim Ruffing have done unspeakable heroic work and research to come up with this craziness. But what we also realized when looking into these things is that they are just so complicated and that the quick and easy path is too tempting. And therefore we've focused now for a while on building centrally coordinated coin joins, right? That one party kind of provides us a platform, a room where we all meet and talk and, and build this collaborative coin join transaction together. But of course, as soon as you have this trusted third party, again, you need to do the same trick, basically, as with Chomi and eCash. Right? If you have a trusted third party that gives you speed, that gives you efficiency, that gives you scalability, right? well, at least make sure that you do not leak any information to that trusted third party. Make sure that it is a zero-knowledge protocol that this trusted third party has zero information that an outside observer does not have, right? The, the, the coordinator should be as stupid or as naive and as blind as to what's actually going on, then, well, yeah. And the very first articulation of this idea to go the quick and easy path, but to do it as good as possible, right? To have a centrally coordinated model, but with some decent privacy guarantees against the coordinator. That is what Gregory Maxwell coined with, with Jomian blind coin joins. I believe the Bitcoin talk thread is from 2013, very well articulated. And Nopara found this old tweet thread somewhere in 2016 or so. And he was like, hey, that's a, that's a cool idea. Centrally coordinated coin joins are not as crazy complex as decentralized organized coin joins. But hey, at least here we have some protections against this coordinator. And he set out to implement this in a research project called Hidden Wallet, or actually as a fact, a fun fact, before it was called the Magical Bitcoin Wallet uh, and ultimately got rebranded to Hidden Wallet. And Nopara implemented this Chomian blinded protocol of coordinating coin join transactions among users. And he realized it was difficult, right? Uh, not just, of course, the cryptography and, and stuff, because that was well-researched uh, and already probably libraries implemented in all of this. But what he realized is that, again, there is a quick and easy path to do it, and there's a proper way to do it. And if you go down the quick and easy path, like, for example, not running your own full node and instead sending your XPUB 
uh, to that trusted third party that is coordinating your coin joins. Or in other words, even if you don't trust the coordinator because you have implemented nice cryptography uh, to protect the communications in some level of that system, but if you do trust the coordinator in some other part of the system, like, for example, to verify your consensus rules as a merchant, well, then ultimately, who are you kidding? Right? You protect yourself on one level, but then you compromise yourself on the other level. So what we really need is an entire fungibility framework that builds a Bitcoin wallet infrastructure that leaks zero knowledge to the trusted third parties that are being used. And that is what's ultimately was current coined, the zero link fungibility framework, where Chomy and coin joins were one critical part in making it work. But one of the things that he realized was that, for example, you cannot leak your XPUB. If you leak your XPUB and that one trusted third party has then a cryptographic proof for your input and output ownership, well, why are you doing the coin join in the first place? That trusted third party has more information than an outside observer. He's not a zero knowledge entity. That's just a joke, right? Uh, and it's security theater. It's not good enough. We must do better. And this is where then Wasabi Wallet was born. A, a wallet that was privacy preserving, not just on the transaction level with coin joins, Xiaomi and blind coin joins to be specific, but to also have a full level Tor integration, right? So that you never leak your IP address and that you can create multiple new identities and even talk to the same person while wearing different hats so that that central coordinator cannot find out that you're actually the same person. Um, things like Tor or these BIP158 block filters, right? To, to query the Bitcoin consensus if you're not running your own full node, but in a way that the trusted third node that you're using cannot find out which addresses or transactions you're interested in. Right? There are a lot of these nuances that are well explained elsewhere that need to be taken care of. And I would say we did a, we did a pretty good job in implementing that zero link mindset of having a great protection on more than just the transaction level. And we've done further great improvements over these last years to make Wasabi even more difficult to de-anonymize outside of the transaction level on the blockchain level. And so with the release of Wasabi Wallet 1.0, we're confident that we have a good enough coin join protocol, the strong and coin join, and we have a good enough network level privacy. And this justifies making, making it a, a first version. You know, it, it works, at least to some extent. But very quickly, we encountered many, like really many nuances and problems that were very awkward to use. And that's, that's really difficult to realize, right? Because when you're designing these protocols and implementing these protocols and testing these the software protocols, you know what you're doing, right? And you know how to use the, the software and you know what's going on under the hood and the nuances that you need to pay attention to. But if it's not the default, then the average user will not use it and they will make mistakes. And that's a problem, right? We need to have a system that just works privately by default because defaults matter because the average user is not an expert in the software. He has no clue what's happening under the hood and he doesn't know what he should be doing and what he shouldn't be doing. And these crazy nuanced decisions should not have to be made by the end user. He's not the expert to do that. So we were thinking, or well, we were using Wasabi ourselves a lot. And trust me, we are, we were very, very, very frustrated with many aspects. 
um, you know, for example, this this coordinator wallet, it makes a lot of transaction, right? It's it's a merchant wallet that gets paid quite a lot, you know, roughly every hour the merchant gets uh, the coordinator gets paid. So this wallet ends up with you know thousands and thousands of transactions. And all of a sudden, you know, when you want to rescan your your wallet and find out how much money you have, and the computer is literally loading for like thirty days. You know, and, until you see the number of Bitcoin that you actually own, well, that's a bad thing, right? Then you know the software is not really doing what you want it to do when it, when you as a power user of the creator of the software need to wait a month, right? And until it's synchronized, that's just ridiculous. And, and, you know, that led us to make many, many improvements. We I think with one release, we sped up the, the synchronization time of Wasabi by something like 70x just because we got too frustrated with waiting days until our wallet loaded. <laughs> so when you use your software, you get to feel a lot of the pain. And when you talk to a lot of users of your software, you get to feel the pain even more. And I'm not sure how many hundreds or thousands of people that I've onboarded by now to Wasabi Wallet. And I don't think that there was a single occasion where I installed, where I could tell someone, install the wallet, everything will be all right. You will understand it. You will perfectly be able to use it. You won't have any questions. You won't make mistakes. You know, I, I don't have to worry. You just use it. You will be all right. That didn't happen. You really need to understand a lot in order to use Wasabi as with the potential that it can be used. Right? Wasabi is an incredibly powerful tool. And you can use it for a great protection of privacy if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, there's a good chance that you will still be all right. But there's also a really big chance that you will shoot yourself in the foot and that you will make decisions where you don't even know the, gra the, the gravity of, of the trade-offs that you're making here. Right? And as, as you know, someone asked in the Q&A session before, like, what happens with all these small the small red coins, you know, they have a red shield, they have a tiny amount of Bitcoin. That's annoying. Like, I'm just going to select all of them and send them to the to the address that I want to pay to. Right? It's an annoying problem. And you think of an easy solution, you know, just select all the coins and get rid of them. But things like this that seem to be the easy solution turn actually out to be a really big problem. And when going with the natural incentives of the of the software you will make mistakes and that's you know that's 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 not easy to say in hindsight because we've thought really 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 long and hard of what these early mistakes were and what what the design decisions of our implementation would do um, because as as yet another example Wasabi currently has a 0 0.1 Bitcoin minimum denomination, right? And now for some users, like 10 million sats is just an, an unachievable amount of wealth. You know, they, they will never have that many sats. So all of these millions of users are forever priced out of the current Wasabi just because it's too small, right? uh, sorry, too big. Yet then we have on the other hand, you know, massive whales thousands of Bitcoin at their disposal, and they're actually coin joining thousands of Bitcoin in Wasabi. Well, they're going to end up with tens of thousands of small coins worth 0 0.1. And that's horrible, right? because if you want to make a large value payment transaction, now again, you need to spend all of these coins in a single transaction. And that clusters all of these coins to belong to a single person. And it's also very expensive to create that many addresses and to spend out of them again, right? So not just do you actually not get that great of a, of a privacy or anonymity set, you also pay a whole bunch, right? So our software is designed, it, so it's, it's, it's too big, like the, the amount needed is too big for many users, but still the design decisions favor small value users. Wasabi is much better to use if you have 0.1 or 0.2 Bitcoin than it is when you have 10 or 20 Bitcoin. And that's a problem, right? Then, because, well, 
rich people deserve privacy too. And guess what? Poor people as well. And we want to build tools that are easier and cheaper to use for those that have a whole bunch of money and for those that have very little. So after about four years of building this Wasabi 1.0 beast, we've learned a lot. And funnily enough, we started researching for a better alternative, or I think we started the, we realized how much we needed to improve the situation in, when was that, 2018 or something, or 19, at the Understanding Bitcoin Conference, where Napara and I sat together with the hero of Francis Pouliot, the great CEO of this amazing company that's organizing this event. And he is a privacy freak, you know, and he he wants to protect his customers first and foremost. I have so much respect for that guy. It's insane. You, you bull Bitcoin customers are in great hands. I can tell you that much. But he he was so so persistent and and so intensive on using best practices as a company to protect the privacy of his customers. But as a company, you know, you manage quite a lot of money. And for example, the 0.1 minimum denominations, you know, you just, it splinters up your wallet. And all of a sudden, you as a company with already pretty small margins need to spend a whole bunch of money for on-chain costs, you know, and, and for coordination costs as well. Um, and then most of your users, you know, want to have less than 0.1 Bitcoin. So again, you end up with a bunch of change and a lot of weird things that just don't work out. And still, we managed to come up with a workable solution of how he can use Wasabi 1.0 with these Chromium blind signatures and coin joins to, I think without a doubt, provide the best level of privacy to his customers out of any exchange on the market. And that was a that was a major win, <laughs> and it's really kind of one of these unsung hero stories. But yeah, he, but still, even back then, we realized there's so much missing. We we really need to improve the situation even further. And I I actually now in hindsight consider that day where we sat down in Malta to be the start of a research that has now spent close to four years, a whole happening. And we were very close to publishing what we've worked on. And this is the next epoch in Wasabi. And it's called Wasabi 2.0. It is as big of a change as it was from magical Bitcoin wallet to hidden wallet or from hidden wallet to Wasabi 1.0. It is almost a complete rewrite not just of the architecture and of the cryptography and of the coin join protocol and of the user interface. It's, it's also a change in, in ethos or no, I, maybe I shouldn't say that. It's not a change in the ethos. The vision of the company working on Wasabi, it's called CK Snacks. It's to provide zero knowledge snacks to its customers, little software projects, right? And we thought that we had deserved that name with Wasabi 1.0. Yet still, it is not entirely a zero knowledge snack. You know, this, this company still gains some pieces of information. Like, for example, if you consolidate many coins in a Wasabi coin join right now, the coordinator will find out that one person owns all of these coins. You know, the, the coordinator can find out that common input ownership even inside a coin join. That's bad. The coordinator can also find a ch uh, the link to your change output, right? these tiny, small, toxic coins. The coordinator knows who, who, which input uh, created them. That's why they have a big red shield. Right? That's also not great. So we were maybe a bit too ambitious and, and uh, maybe not yet... We had the vision of providing a CK snack, but we didn't fulfill it. And I think now we've started to deserve that name. 
so let's quickly go through the the improvements that we've made and what that actually means, not just for power users like Bull Bitcoin that are do heroic work to protect their clients, but also for you, you know, as, as you yourself being a merchant um, or a big hodler, of course. So the idea is to still have that centrally coordinated model. Centralized coordinated coin joins are still many orders of magnitude easier than decentralized ones. We will still use that trusted third party to coordinate, but we will reduce the amount of knowledge that that trusted third party will get to an absolute minimum. How do we do that? First of all, we use new cryptography and a cryptography that is much more advanced. You know, the Chaumian signatures that we use, again, 1983, ancient technology, super simple, well peer reviewed, but very limited in what it can do. And what we now use, it's called keyed verified anonymous credentials. Crazy term. It's actually from the Signal chat application. It's used there in the group chats for some things. But we use this new awesome cryptography together with Patterson commitments, you know, some great research from Blockstream and that's implemented in, in Monero or Liquid now um, to uh, well, provide a collaborative coin joint transaction that is truly a zero knowledge thing. So if you as a user want to put many coins in the input of a coin join, you want to consolidate, let's say three coins, then not even the coordinator will find out that these three belong to the same person. So we have eliminated all input to input ownership links inside the coin join. That means that you can finally consolidate coins privately for the very first time in Bitcoin. And that's so big, you know, that's, that alone is, is, is huge. But we've also figured out the same for the output side, right? So now you can create multiple addresses in the output of, or in multiple outputs of, of the transaction. And still, neither the coordinator nor any outside observer will find out that all of these addresses were created by the same person. That's another huge win. And of course, that classical input to output linkage is also completely obliterated. And previously with zero link or, or Jomian coin joins, we had no input to output link to the equal amount standard denomination output. But with Wabi Sabi, this new coin join algorithm, there is no input to output link between any coin. And this effectively means two things. There are no minimum denominations in Wasabi 2.0. There will no longer be a situation where someone is priced out of on-chain privacy because he does not have the multi-generational wealth that is 10 million sats. If you have 100K sats, you can coin join. That's huge. But we've also switched the thing around that now, if you are a whale and you have a hundred Bitcoin sitting around that you want to coin join. Instead of ending up with a thousand UTXOs, which are super expensive to create and even more expensive to spend, you will end up with a handful, three, four, five coins. And that's not just for a whale, it's for everyone. The number of coins that, we, that you will have ending up in your wallet will be much lower than before with Wasabi 1.0. And that is such a huge thing for a high transaction throughput maker like again bull bitcoin because that means lower cost you're no, no longer going to have to spend that much to the bitcoin miners and to the coordinators and that just means a cheaper service for everyone including the clients of bull bitcoin and ultimately there is there is the way to because we've no longer we no longer have this minimum denomination set. And because we can comfortably, or because there are no change addresses anymore that are unlinked on a cryptographic level or unblinded on a cryptographic level, we can fi finally make payments inside a coin join directly. 
And that is yet again another major transaction fee improvement uh, and, and usability improvement. So to sum this up, you can now consolidate any amount of coins in your input of the coin join without telling anyone that you are the one that controls all of them. There is no longer a minimum denomination. There are no longer enforced standard denominations. Uh, and there is now a higher priority for, for high liquidity users. So what this will ultimately, ultimately mean for everyone, cheaper coin joins, more private coin joins, and more useful coin joins. And that's kind of a holy trinity. We've, we've figured out how to bring Bitcoin on-chain privacy cheaper, faster, and better. And that's kind of crazy, to be honest. That's, that's a really, really big win. And now that we have established this, this new baseline, we can build on top of that even more crazy things. You know, you, you can now, in theory at least, open lightning channels inside a coin join, make atomic swaps inside a coin join, make a pay join inside a coin join, pay into multi-sig addresses, spend out of multi-sig addresses, you know, create these crazy financial constructs, discrete law contracts, RGB, or to sum it up, any Bitcoin transaction can now easily be a coin join transaction. Maybe not every, because there's a lot of advanced protocols that would be too complex to coordinate, but a lot of the useful things that people do on the Bitcoin blockchain today can in the future be done inside a Wabi Sabi coin join. And it will be the default for many wallets. It will not just be implemented in Wasabi wallet. It will be implemented by many wallets. And they can all coordinate and communicate now with each other to build these incredibly large, incredibly resilient and, and complex to de-anonymize transactions of hundreds, maybe even thousands of users. Cheaper, faster, and more stronger than before. And just looking back now in hindsight to four years ago where we where we had that conversation with Francis, I'm it's really amazing what we've what we've built. And just knowing how, how crazy Francis and the crew is in in implementing cutting edge stuff and improving on it, you know, making it even better than we even thought it were possible. I just am so excited to what we can build with this new technology together, especially with amazing power users like Bull Bitcoin. So what are the next steps? We're not yet done, unfortunately. Um, we wanted to be done years ago, but well, the quick and easy path is not what we like to do. So we want to do it right. Yet still, a lot of things are done. And if you're feeling up for it, go to github.com slash ckSnacks slash wallet wasabi, download the source code and build the master branch. And you at least can see the new graphical user interface, which is actually pretty slick. And you can help make it even better before we go into the release process. But hopefully within a month or so, maybe two, at least in two weeks, very soon, we will release a, a release candidate. And we will have, again, as is the custom, a financial bounty for anyone to help us review and test and improve this release candidate. So stay tuned if you want to earn some more sats and if you want to be an active participant in making Wasabi and therefore Bitcoin privacy as good as it can possibly be, then help us out, especially with testing and especially with, with telling us how we can help you in making this new coin join experience an integral part to the Bitcoin service that you provide to your customers. There's a lot of opportunity and I'm really excited to move forward with this. But I think as of now, this was a lot of blabbering from my side, and I, I would be thrilled to hear from you. Maybe the problems that you had with Wasabi 1.0, and let's see if, if we fixed them already in 2.0. And if not, well, put it on the list for to-dos until release. 
So Piers, thank you very much for, for coming here to the event. Thank you very much for, for supporting Bull Bitcoin as much as they are supporting you. And keep buying Bitcoin and let's end this financial tyranny of the fiat empire yesterday. Thank you, Max. So, Max, uh, do you have time for some questions? Of course, always. All right, my check. Maybe you want to, maybe someone has a question for Max. All right, we have one here. Hi, Max, you got me? Absolutely. All right, well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I thought it was great. Um, I, I, I've noticed something here that you mentioned for Wapi Sabi. Uh, it, it's uh, how the whales, uh, I, I suppose we can uh, qualify them as users with multiple Bitcoins. How, how is it gonna work? Can you elaborate on how is it gonna work that uh, they're gonna coin join and that it's gonna remain private? Are they gonna be coordinated together? Yeah, great question. And yes, they will be coordinated together in the same in the same transaction. Um, the way that we do it right now. So let's say you have one Bitcoin and you want to coin join that. Right? We have multiple standard denominations, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and so on. And the way that we decompose the one Bitcoin input into many outputs is to go from the bottom upwards. Right. So at first, everyone gets 0 0.1. Whoever has money left gets a 0 0.2. Whoever has money left gets a 0 0.4, right? So for example, then if you have 0.8 Bitcoin, you're gonna get a 0.1, a 0.2 and a 0.4 and a 0 0.0999 change roughly, right? So we decompose from the bottom up and you can only receive one output or one coin for each of the denominations. So it's not possible that one client will receive two times 0 0.1 in the standard denomination. And those are the things why we have massive fracturing and splintering. And well, we've done a whole, a whole bunch of research on amount decomposition and we're still not done with it and it's still not implemented. That's why I'm a bit hesitant to say how it exactly is gonna work out but the gist of it is we now decompose from the top down. So if you have a, um, a one Bitcoin input, you will get, for example, a 0 0.8 Bitcoin output. Okay. And you can also get multiple outputs of the same denomination. Right? So if you have 1.6 Bitcoin, you're gonna get twice 0 0.8. And that means that you can now the client has much more power to choose which denominations to be part in. And the cool thing is, is that this kind of gives us some, you know, some translucent anonymity set in between the denomination pools. You know, if, if someone has a 0 0.8 input, he can either have a one 0 0.8 output or two times 0 0.4 outputs. Both is possible, and an outside observer does not know which coins the clients actually received. So that's yet another privacy improvement for why we can now make these large whale transactions in Bitcoin better. Right, another question in the crowd. Anyone else wants to try it out? Okay, I have a question then. Uh, so, so Max, uh, what is the coordinator fee structure of uh, Wasabi 2.0? Can you tell us about that? We've done a shit ton of research on, but where we have not yet finalized and implemented anything. It's kind of the, of the, of the open research things that we're not yet sure. <laughs> um, the cool thing is, because of the crazy cryptography we, we use, we we can give some anonymous fee credentials that can be used in cool ways. So you will still have to pay a coordinator fee. That's first and foremost. And that's because the coordinator fee is the thing that provides denial of service protection. 
right? So it's, it's just, that's just something that, that you need uh, in order to provide a secure and civil resistant coin join. Um, but we will also, we, we will want to try to incentivize a high quality behavior from users. And that would, for example, mean that if you are a user with a low time preference and you've already coin joined in Wasabi in the past and you have the standard denomination input and that, you know, maybe five days after you coin joined the last time, you're the only one from that previous round of coin join that will provide his input in this new round of coin join, then you will actually get at least a very steep discount in the coordinator fee and maybe even the mining fee. Um, and this can be used for kind of opportunistic coin joins when it's useful for your privacy for very, very cheaply. So even though there will be, of course, a fee when you coin join at the time that you please, if there is a lot of UTX O days destroyed, we no longer really need that denial of service protection because it is already inbuilt in this kind of fidelity bond denial of service protection. And therefore we can remove it, right? So we hope that it will be overall cheaper, especially for these low time preference users that are willing to wait until a great time to do a coin join comes up. But again, unfortunately, I'm not yet 100% sure of how it will be implemented and we will see how it plays out. All right. And sorry, sorry one question ahead. that actually was in the previous talk uh, was why does Wasabi not show up the, the coin join tab sometimes? And as, as Gustavo said, yes, that might be because you've closed the tab accidentally or it didn't open. But the other thing is maybe you're looking at a hardware wallet. And so far, Wasabi 1.0 cannot do coin joins with your hardware wallet. That's why the coin join tab is disabled. However, with Wasabi 2.0, you will be able to coin join your Bitcoin that are in the private keys that you have on your hardware wallet. And that's amazing. Because again, now you can just connect your cold stash wallet into your, into your laptop. You still, your private keys never leave your cold card hardware wallet. And you just pre press OK with coin join whenever it is cheap and whenever it benefits me, right? And make sure that no money gets stolen. The hardware wallet makes sure of that. And that basically means that you can crunch through your low time pre or through your large coin joint, uh, through your large stash of cold storage, still without putting your keys onto a hot machine. And because of the fee incentives at a very, very private and, and cheap option, so that's one of the additional kind of crowning features. Finally, coin join directly on your hardware wallet. Wow, that's insane. So that's going to come out when uh, Wasabi 2.0 comes out, cold card's going to work with it, or is that com going to come later? Oh, yeah, always, always tough to, to promise stuff that's not yet built. <laughs> um, the, the, we have built the protocol capability to have hardware wallet support. And that's done. I, I do believe that each of these hardwares would need to upgrade their firmware in order for it to be supported. Um, and I'm not yet sure when the other teams will work on that or if at all, you know, but I do believe that this is a, a big enough thing to justify work on it quickly. And I hope, I really hope that we can ship it in 2.0 already, but maybe this will be something for the follow-up release in 2.1 or something, or 2.0.1 at least. <laughs> that makes sense. All right, does anybody have a last question for Max? All right, so it doesn't seem like we do. Is there any uh, question from the audience online, Machek, uh, from the chat? No. No, there's none. All right, well, thanks a lot, Max. This was very thoughtful and a lot of information. So we appreciate it. Maybe a ra last round of applause for Max. Thank you.
for Bull Bitcoin and Verify for organizing this awesome thing. Congrats on Verify being acquired by Bull Bitcoin. That was a genius move on all sides. Very well done. And guys, enjoy the, the tribe gathering in Meetspace. Uh, and please get the fuck out of Canada really quickly <laughs> because it's a shit show. <laughs> oh, yeah, but hey, oh no, you know, th that's actually the, the first and only time that I'm regretting to not being a Canadian citizen is because I cannot use bull Bitcoin. So I'm not sure if, if we all get you out of that communist nightmare, uh, you will all lose the benefit of using bull Bitcoin, the best exchange in the business. So I don't know, you know, trade offs. Maybe it's actually worth to stay in the shithole if you can continue using bull Bitcoin. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Well, well let's see. <laughs> but in any case, guys, enjoy it. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. All right. Well, that was Max Brand. Very interesting conversation. So basically, we're going to go into a, unless someone has another question, anything, comment, we're going to go on a break, come back in like 20 minutes. Does anybody have something else? No? All right. So we're going to break, coming back in 20 minutes. Uh, thank you.
Dreams keep haunting me. I get no sleep.
Okay, everybody. Okay, we're back live. So uh, thank you for uh, still being here. And uh, so uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the, the conference so far. It's only the beginning, so there's uh, the whole week coming up. Uh, the rest of the days will be more technical and we're going to delve into uh, Bitcoin aspects and concept more deeply. So I hope you will be there uh, all the other days of the week as well. So, uh, of, uh, so, oh, not connected yet. So uh, Francis Polio will be next on uh, the giving a Bitcoin rent, what he does best basically in life. And uh, he's going to talk about different uh, FUD uh, types that is circulating uh, on the media and uh, he's going to debunk them uh, one by one. So we're just going to wait until he connects and, uh, and uh, you know, talk with him and let him speak. Also, I thought that if from the audience you had uh, anything in mind specifically that you wanted to ask about Bitcoin this week and uh, something you want to be more discussed, uh, just come up to me or Gustavo or Tristan, any, any team uh, members of Bull Bitcoin too. Uh, just talk about whatever is uh, interesting to you and we can figure out if we can plug in what a, you know, something uh, to a presentation or, uh, yeah. So uh, I hope... Uh, I think Gustavo is on a mission to make friends connect. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's saying he's on standby. No. No. download the link.
Ну да. Или? Да. Mais il nous entend dessus. Il n'a pas allumé sa caméra. Ouais, salut. Euh, je ne sais pas si tu m'entends, Francis, euh, mais tu n'as pas ta caméra. Est-ce que tu m'entends, Francis? On ne voit pas ta caméra. Je ne pas. Je pense qu'il est dans le mauvais link. That's what happens when you live in the jungle. Si tu m'entends, Francis, sors du Zoom puis reconnecte-toi. Ah, Francis, là, on le voit. On le voit. All right. Francis? What? Yes. What's yes. up, Rachek? Perfect. Okay, I'm so here. Perfect. Sorry for the little technical trouble. So uh, mm -hmm. I will let you uh, do what you're doing best, uh, Francis, talking about Bitcoin and closing up this first day. And thank you again for uh, giving this presentation. All right. Thanks, Matt Jack. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, the presentation that the guys chose for me was Bitcoin rant, I guess, because I have a tendency to rant about Bitcoin often uh, um, to rant about. And I'm going to try to go through them like quickly. Uh, I'm going to improvise because I've been working all day. Um, so I didn't like prepare a prepared speech, but you guys know me, so... Uh, I like to improvise. Um, well, the first thing I want to rant about is Bitcoin and climate change. Um, the climate change argument about against Bitcoin, I saw that coming. I think the first time I saw that coming and I was like, this is really going to take off as 
one of the major arguments again against Bitcoin was I think it was like 2018. Janet Yellen, the uh, uh, former chairwoman w- of the Federal Reserve, um, was doing a speech in Montreal, and then she just kind of like she was talking about innovation, and then she started to talk about Bitcoin, and it was super weird. I was like, why is she talking about Bitcoin? She started to trash Bitcoin pub- publicly, and then she was going on and on and on about how Bitcoin was bad for the environment and i was like whoa the mainstream narrative used to be well bitcoin is for drug dealers and then it was bitcoin is for money launderers and uh that was like the first time that i really heard like one of the people in the establishment say oh bitcoin is bad for the environment and i was like that's such a weird argument like and specifically coming from a central bank i mean this isn't coming like from greenpeace or anything like that and it's the most total bullshit argument Honestly, against Bitcoin, like out of all the arguments against Bitcoin, like this is like one of the most bullshit ones. First of all, the idea of that argument is that Bitcoin consumes too much energy. Well, I'm sorry to say, but energy consumption is a good thing. Consuming energy is good. Like throughout energy has been consumed, standards of living have have risen. as a result, right? So, uh, just the, the just the and then and then the craziest thing is also the fact that people seem to think that there's like a limited amount of energy and that like Bitcoin consumes too much, as if there's like a fixed amount and if Bitcoin consumes more, then other things will not be able to consume energy, like the world is some kind of fixed high. There is an infinite amount of energy in the universe. There literally is an infinite amount of energy. Like we will never ever run out of energy. Um, I don't know if people have realized, but there is a nuclear reactor in the sky, um, which provides energy in all sorts of ways, uh, and we can't just can't run out. So the idea that Bitcoin consumes too much energy is just stupid. Um, another point about energy is that Bitcoin produces CO2, uh, which contributes to climate change. Well, first of all, you have to believe, first of all, that humans are causing climate change with CO2, uh, which I do not, and which a lot of people are starting to realize is a complete bullshit argument, because if the climate has been changing throughout history, and we only started as humans to exploit hydrocarbons and energy, making fires. It's a few thousand years ago, maximum with coal and realistically just a few hundred years ago with oil and gas. What was causing the climate to change before? Well, volcanoes, asteroids, and maybe the nuclear reactor in the sky, which literally heats our planet, had something to do with that. So you have to accept the premise that, well, if you're going to use the argument or consider the argument seriously that Bitcoin causes climate change, you have to accept the premise first that humans cause climate change. Um, But let's say that we accept this premise. Um, What are you going to do about it? So what's the point of your argument? You can't do anything to stop this, right? So there's no mechanism by which you can convince Bitcoiners to act against their own interests and to somehow modify Bitcoin to not have proof of work. That's just not a feasibility. It's just not a possible thing. Like you're, you're not going to change Bitcoin so that it doesn't use proof of work. This is just not going to happen. So what are you going to do? Ban Bitcoin? How are you going to ban Bitcoin? You're going to go door to door to every single person on earth that has a laptop and they're going to go open their computer and see if there's a Bitcoin node running in there. Because that's the only way to ban Bitcoin. What, you're going to ban Bitcoin mining? You're thinking they're not going to move to some other country? What are you going to do, ban Bitcoin exchanges? You think people aren't going to trade Bitcoin for cash like they've always been doing? So what's the point of arguing against someone that says that Bitcoin causes climate change when they literally can't do anything about it? Okay, great. You want to win the argument? This isn't like, it doesn't matter who wins the argument. The reality is that Bitcoin cannot stop. You cannot stop Bitcoin. So what is the biggest waste? It's talking about it. Talking about Bitcoin's 
impact on climate change is a bigger waste of energy and a bigger waste of CO2 <laughs> than uh, Bitcoin. Because you can't stop talking about Bitcoin's imp impact on climate change, but you can't stop uh, Bitcoin. So that's one thing that really pisses me off is people, um, and, and it's very obvious why they're using the Bitcoin contributes to climate change argument. It's because that's how you're going to convince the younger generation not to get into Bitcoin. I mean, the younger generation, and by that, that I mean people that are, you know, from 10 to 30 years old today, right? People that are intelligent enough to, to they've been sold into, into slavery and you have a debt to your government. Um, it takes about half pay them back and work. So you are a financial slave to the government. The moment you are born, you're on the hook for debt, right? And then the people that have put you into slavery, if you're a young person, they absolutely don't want you to stop being a slave, of course, because how else are they going to pay for their pensions? How, they're, how else are they going to finance their retirement? They haven't accumulated any capital with their own work. And... They need the Ponzi to continue because they're the recipients and beneficiaries of this Ponzi. So they are very desperate because that would mean the collapse of their Ponzi scheme because they're at the top and the younger people are at the bottom. And younger people are very sensitive to the climate change issue. Obviously, I'm not, but I recognize that a lot of people are. And that's totally fine. They, they, they're entitled to have their opinion. A lot of people have internalize the climate change struggle as part of their core identity, it's very easy to manipulate them on this issue. It's where they're the most vulnerable emotionally and intellectually. Um, and that even hides the fact that not only can you not do anything about Bitcoin's impact on the climate, which I believe to be nil, um, and not only is it a clear attempt at getting people to not use Bitcoin, like manipulation, like emotional manipulation, because people feel guilty for contributing to climate change, so they're emotionally vulnerable. Actually, there's a very good case to be made that Bitcoin is good for the environment. I, I don't usually like making that case because I don't like talking about Bitcoin's impact on the climate because I think it's completely irrelevant. Um, but there is a very strong case to be made that Bitcoin is actually good for the environment because it incentivizes the efficient allocation of energetic resources and going to take illiquid trapped sources of energy and monetizing them. Um, for example, here in Quebec, very good example. Um, we have trapped energy and that's a huge cost in Quebec society. Quebec has energy surpluses um, from hydroelectric dams because it rains and the dams fill up, right? And if you don't consume the energy, the water goes through the dam and activates the turbines. And if you don't consume that energy, well, you have to open the valves of the dams and let the water just escape, which is effectively energy that's being wasted. And we're selling this energy to the United States over super long transmission lines or we're just letting the energy flow out, right? And this increases the cost of renew renewable energy. When you're planning the budget for um, the demand so you know you're going to have some waste so as a planner that is a cost to you right so if you if there was zero electricity surplus with re renewable energy it would be far far more profitable so if you're deciding between a gas plant or coal plant or renewable energy 
And if you can remove electric electricity surpluses from the on the renewable energy side of things, then obviously the decision to choose renewables over gas and coal makes a lot more sense. Um, so it's a totally dis disingenuous, disingenuous argument and it's emotional manipulation and it's actually detrimental for the environment. Um, last thing on that is, okay, and who, like, who are these people telling us this? It's the fiaters that are literally printing money with the stated goal of stimulating consumption in the economy, right? So, so, so the, the, the same people that are criticizing Bitcoin for its energy uses are the people that say that we should print more money. And they print money because that stimulates consumption because people don't want to save the money anymore because they know that in the future it's going to be worth less. So they start to spend it. And this creates a culture of consumerism. Because if you think that in the future your money is going to be worth less now, instead of saving it for the future, we're going to spend it anyway, and you're going to be able to spend on less stuff in the future. It makes no sense. So the act of creating money uh, creates what's called a high time preference culture, a culture of consumerism, a culture of waste. There's a reason why there's so much pollution and so much disregard for the environment and so much disregard for our communities because people have a short-term mindset instead of a long-term mindset. And that is a direct consequence, a cultural consequence of the printing of money. So I think that's all I have to say about Bitcoin and the climate. Uh, something that really pisses me off is inflation and specifically the claim that inflation doesn't matter because your wages are rising over time. Oh, great. So you have to keep being a worker slave forever to catch up just to keep your, the same standard of living. A lot of people, we, you know, we read stories that take place in the 17th century, 18th century, 19th century. And something that I was thinking about is you often have these characters, which are people that have like gold, silver plates, and that they did, the people used to like work really hard in their, in like their early twenties, do business, become adventurers. Some people uh, in the 17th century, you would go to Canada from France and you would get some furs and you would bring the furs back to Europe and it would take you 10 years. It would take you 10 years basically to go out in the woods, hunt the beavers, bring the beavers back to Europe and then sell them in Europe. And then you would be set for life with that one thing. You wouldn't have to keep working your entire life, right? Um, because your savings would remain an increase in purchasing power over time because people would sell the beavers skins and keep the results as gold and silver. So the argument that, oh, well, it doesn't matter that prices are going up because wages are going up. It means that everything that you all the work that you've done before, that's losing value. So you should always need to continue working. Like if so, if you stop working, you will have your assets devalued over time. So you have to continue working forever, essentially. So, I mean, who wants to do that? Um, but that is the economic rationale that they've been using. It's like, it doesn't matter because your wages are going to go up. Inflation is also, um, the sneakiest of all taxes. And by the way, why the fuck are we paying taxes if they can just print money? I mean, this is something that it's so crazy that not a single journalist has asked that to one of our policymakers, our ancestral bankers. If this whole time you could just like look, look at, for example, uh, I don't know how much money we printed in Canada during the um, the last hysteria over the last like two years, I mean, maybe like a trillion dollars or something. I don't know. Uh, who's really keeping count anyway? But Let's say that they've printed like a trillion dollars to finance all of these programs. Or let's just say like, let's use like a more manageable number for most people, like a hundred. And then they're saying, oh, well, no, there's no consequence of us printing the money actually. Uh, um, we, we, we did that and it, it's only assuming that's true, which is not, but assuming that's true. Why weren't you doing this the whole time? Why was I paying half of my wages in Texas? Why 
you just bring the money. Um, if you ask, for example, that's like a crazy thing, right? So if you ask a high school teacher, like in class in economics, right? In economics 101, miss, miss, why doesn't the government print money to finance everything? Well, obviously the teacher is going to say, well, if you Francis. Francis. We don't hear you. Francis. Est-ce qu'il nous entend? Francis. <laughs> the rent was too fast for uh, the, the internet. We don't hear you. We don't. Wow. Attends, je vais me placer devant la caméra. Allô? Allô? Francis, euh, on t'entend pas pour les deux dernières minutes, genre. La, la dernière chose, c'était quand tu parlais, euh, quand tu demandes à ton professeur d'économie. Pourquoi on ne fait pas juste imprimer de l'argent? Mais je on ne t'entend toujours pas. Ah. <rire> 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 Il va monter sur la seule antenne du village. <rire> Allô? Allô? Oh, you're back in. I'm, I'm back in. That's the problem when I rent is that I don't even know if I'm on. How long have I been out? Uh, like just two minutes when you were talking about what happens when, uh, you know, scholars ask their teachers why can governments can just print money to pay for everything. So that oh, was the... Right. Okay, it's not, it's not that bad. Uh, I wasn't out for too long. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, obviously, uh, if a student asks his teacher, miss, miss, like, why don't we just print the money? Well, the obvious answer is because if you print money, the price of everything is going to go up, and then it's going to be a zero-sum game. Um, but simple truths like this, sometimes it feels like they're like too simple for people to understand them. Um, and I don't know, because I've been renting off, so I don't know exactly what I was saying um, about inflation. I'm sure I had some, some great insights that uh, hit me on the spot there. Uh, but it really is the most insinuous uh, of all forms of rent seeking by the government. Because the thing with inflation is that it's so indirect, it's so diffuse, you don't really notice Right. I mean, people do notice inflation over time, right? So you notice that things become more expensive, but it's not like on your paycheck. When you look at your paycheck, you see like, oh well, you know, the tax pay you van amount tax paid to the government, or when you at the restaurant, like you can see the tax on the bill. These are things that you see very obviously and that you take into your economic calculation. Um, whereas the printing of money and the inflation, which is a, a tax, it, it is absolutely a tax on savings, right? Um, we have a tax on capital gains. We have a tax on sales. We have a tax on work. And with inflation, we have a tax on savings. But it's not, It's there's no agreement here going on, right? And also it's not even the politicians that are, this, that are deciding this, right? So when's the last time 
that you had a debate in Parliament about how much money should be printed. Never. That's never debated. It's always treated as if you have this committee of experts that just decided to print more money, right? Because, you know, it's very complicated. Very, very complicated. We have, we have algorithms and we have science that demonstrates that um, we should be printing this amount of money this year and it's very, very technical. This is not something that's ever debated. So it's absolutely an illegitimate form of taxation. Not to say that other forms of taxation are more legitimate, but at least they're democratic and at least they're known, right? At least we know that we're being screwed. Whereas with inflation, it's just something that we kind of feel. Um, and as I said, uh, the consequences of inflation uh, is basically the destruction of wealth, destruction of uh, um, progress. Um, and that's what obviously Bitcoin is supposed to, or no, that's what Bitcoin stops. Um, okay, another thing to rant about, miners control Bitcoin. The miners are controlling Bitcoin. Um, fortunately, this is not something that, it's not a narrative that's very popular these days. Uh, in control of Bitcoin, um, they move on to other arguments like the climate change argument. But I find that to be so crazy because if that because like we've actually already beaten that argument in 2017 uh, with SegWit, right? So um, about four or five years ago, the miners were pushing a narrative, or like five six years ago, they were pushing a narrative that Bitcoin is a democracy and that every hashing power, every, every hash cycle was like a vote. And that in fact, the miners are voting for the rules of Bitcoin every time they're hashing. And if you wanna be part of the Bitcoin democracy, all you have to do is buy a miner and plug it in. This is what the mining manufacturers were telling us. This was a huge argument um, because people were saying, well, you know, uh, Bitcoin miners are in China. Uh, so if miners control Bitcoin, and the Chinese control the miners, then the Chinese control Bitcoin, uh, which is a totally stupid argument because if the Chinese were controlling Bitcoin, um, they would have killed Bitcoin because Bitcoin allows people to circumvent the state authority. And uh, clearly the Chinese <laughs> are a gigantic state authority, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, also another topic on that, uh, we saw recently that uh, the Chinese have stopped, banned Bitcoin mining in China, simply. Um, and that's something that's true. Uh, I've had reports on the ground confirm that, in fact, yes, uh, mining has been banned in China. And something that kind of pisses me off is that a lot of people seem to be extremely happy about this. Like, ah, oh, it's just great news for Bitcoin. There's going to be more miners in the U.S say this is really good for bitcoin i'm like really because um all this time china didn't do anything to bitcoin right this whole time that the miners were in china i mean bitcoin was working perfectly smoothly they never censored any transaction there was never any like action taken against bitcoin by the chinese communists so why are you happy that the miners have left china it's almost as if chinese you know like what's wrong with What's wrong with mining in China? Um, and in fact, I am much more worried about having a lot of mining um, in the United States because it puts those miners and puts a huge part of the network at risk because um, the US government seems to be a lot more inclined to crack down on something like Bitcoin than the Chinese. Uh, all right, more stuff to rant about. Uh, Governments will ban Bitcoin. I think I've already, <laughs> already covered this. Uh, um, that's, a, that's an argument that we hear all the time. Well, if governments could ban Bitcoin, they already would have done it. And a lot of arguments against Bitcoin are like this, right? Um, something bad will happen to Bitcoin. If Bitcoin can be hacked there, the NSA is just waiting for the right moment to hack Bitcoin. It's like, guys, if Bitcoin could be hacked, they would already have hacked Bitcoin and taking the money. 
right? There was like this uh, this argument about how the FBI or whatever some government enforcement agency had somehow found a backdoor into wallets. Like this argument was circulating, I think, a few months ago. And guys, if the FBI could steal people's bitcoins, why aren't they stealing yours? Right? Um, makes no sense at all. So another thing to rant about is the fucking shit corners. The shit coins. Right? So there's a lot of things to rant about when it comes to the shit coins. Um, but I think the one thing that really pisses me off the most is that one of the reasons why Bitcoin is so important is that it has the potential to become the one global dominating currency and eliminate all other currencies. Like that's why I got into Bitcoin. And why is that important? It's because in the economy, most transactions or transactions, economic transactions are win-win, right? There's always a winner on both sides. If I buy a chair, I obviously value the chair, right? So I get a chair, I'm super happy. And the guy that sells the chair values the money more than the chair. So he gets the money, he's happy. It's a win-win transaction. And that's assuming of course that there's no fraud and there's no misinformation going on, which does happen. But if there's no fraud and no one's lying about, there's no misinformation between two parties, it's always a win-win transaction. What's a win-lose transaction? Well, I'll give you an example first of a win-lose transaction, uh, a poker game, right? In a poker game, if you win money, it's directly because someone else lost. That's a win-lose transaction and the house taking a cut, right? So this is not something that's a good thing. It's a destruction of wealth. A win-lose transaction is a destruction of wealth. Every currency exchange, when you sell one money for another, every currency exchange transaction is inherently a win-lose transaction. You always have someone who wins. You always have someone who loses. Think about it like this. If I sell Canadian dollars for US dollars and the US dollar goes up, whoever sold me the US dollars lost. It's as simple as that. And I won at his expense. Um, so inherently it's a destructive act to exchange one currency for another because someone will always lose. And the idea that there's going to be competing currencies and each are going to find their use. And it's ridiculous, right? It's like saying, okay, um, every time that you create a new software, you need to create a new hardware. Every time you have a new use case, case uh you need a new uh any type type of computer i mean that's not how how it works you need one general purpose operating system and all the use cases are going to fit in there uh and all of these shit coins are always marketing themselves as being like as being better than bitcoin like there's absolutely no nothing they can say to market their stuff that's not like in relation to it but they're always like comparing themselves to bitcoin trying to steal money, steal momentum away from, from Bitcoin. And all they're doing is, so, you know, there's two things about like Bitcoin. I'm talking about like Bitcoin maximalism. There's two things about it. It's on the first hand, people say that Bitcoin is economically inevitable. So Bitcoin maximalism, the idea that there's only going to be one currency in the future is a description of what's going to happen. It's a prediction. It's not not a recommendation it's just a description right it's not prescriptive it's descriptive so uh you're just describing oh well inevitably all of the value is going to flow towards one it's and that's because money is the strongest network effect like if you are buying into a shit coin you're taking the risk that that shit coin might not be accepted in the future um and that you're going to lose your purchasing power because it's not going to be accepted as money so you have a very strong incentive to stay, I mean, an extremely strong incentive to invest your time and your energy into the monetary network that has the highest likelihood of preserving your wealth and your value over time. But also, it's a good thing that there's, it's, it's not just inevitable that there's one money that's going to arise, like an economic fact, but it's a good thing. 
right? We should want only one money um, to exist because if there's only one money to exist, we're not losing value on these uh, currency exchange transactions. Um, right. Another thing to to talk about is the scalability of Bitcoin. Like people say that Bitcoin can't scale um, because there's only seven transactions per second. Well, obviously, um, the first Bitcoin network layer is optimized for security and for censorship resistance. Like these are the core value and trust minimization. Like these are the core values, value propositions of the Bitcoin main network. And it's such a silly argument to say that, oh, well, you know, you can't have scalability on Bitcoin because the main on-chain Bitcoin network, first layer Bitcoin network, doesn't scale more than like 10 transactions per second. It's like saying that you can't scale the internet because there's like one big cable at the bottom of the ocean um, and you're not going to be able to fit all that information in there. Of course not. Like you develop second layer solutions and protocols for this specific reason so that they all specialize and serve different purposes and have um, different trade-offs. Um, now, Jack, do you have any more topics for me to rant about? Well, we have the panel with uh, Jonathan. Yeah, the does, does, does people in the audience have something that they want my, my rant on, like yeah. a topic that people yeah. want me to address. Okay, just give me a second. Toxicity. People want to hear about toxicity. Toxic oh, yeah, so, Right. So is that supposed to be a bad thing to be, uh, to, to be toxic? I mean, okay. So what happens if you're not toxic and you, uh, don't defend your principles when other people will suffer? That's as simple as that. Right. So every time, um, the shit corners convince someone else to buy into their shit coin, that person will inevitably lose money. Because as I said, it's a, it's a win-lose transaction, right? And they are on the obviously losing side of that transaction. So, I mean, the toxicity in Bitcoin is humanism. It's altruistic in a way, because what we're really trying to do is we're trying to expel these people from our industry. And just because it's a free market and they have the legal and moral right to sell their scam does not mean we should let them, right? Um, and I'm often reminded of a story in the Bible where there was the money changers that were at the temple in Jerusalem and uh, Jesus came into the temple and physically whipped them out and kicked their tables over and expelled them from the temple. Um, so Jesus was a very peaceful guy, but when it came to the money changes, he actually was extremely toxic and violent because, and you have to think about it this way, like Bitcoin does not have a central authority that's policing it. Bitcoin does not have a centralized defense mechanism. The defense mechanism of Bitcoin is the individual Bitcoiners that are the white blood, cell, blood cells. And it's a, like a decentralized force and that eliminates the cancers that are growing and try to be contagious and try, try to turn the other cells against the whole against the body. Um, so without the Bitcoin toxicity, like what mechanism do we have to defend ourselves against attacks? There's none. Um, so the toxicity aspect of Bitcoin can be off-putting for some individuals, but there's nothing more toxic than the destruction of wealth with foreign currency exchange transactions, which are win-lose transaction, that's very toxic, and the creation of money, like fiat, which finances wars, which creates debt slavery. I mean, these things are really, really bad. Like, so, you know, if you're worried about people on the internet being mean to shit corners, well, you know, block them and mute them, right? So the reason why people are upset about Bitcoin toxicity is really because the toxic maximalists are reducing the pool of potential victims that they can defraud with their scams. So the people that are obviously like calling out toxicity are the people.
Any other questions or things to rant about? Yeah, I will give the mic. Uh, about taproot, his, his opinion on taproot. Uh, your opinion about taproot, Francis? Very good. Um, so taproot is the latest soft fork that was added to uh, Bitcoin. So my opinion on it is that first of all, I mean, it's a good thing, right? It's a good thing. It's a, it's a nice piece of technology. Um, it has some some benefits that will make certain types of Bitcoin transactions uh, impossible to differentiate from others, um, which has some privacy benefits. But I think it's been massively overhyped by a lot of people, right? So a lot of people are like pushing Taproot as if it's going to kill Ethereum or it's going to make Ethereum useless and obsolete and it's such a better technology. It's like, guys, like, first of all, like, Taproot is not going to make Ethereum obsolete. It's, it's completely different. And who cares? <laughs> who cares about Ethereum anyway? So let's not, start, let's not start putting things into Bitcoin because it allows us to compete with shitcoins on a technical level because people don't use shitcoins for their technical um, features. They use shitcoins because they want to get rich quick. That's why people use shitcoins, right? Because it's a platform that they can use to fool people into giving them money. That's, they, they don't actually use the altcoins for their for their, their benefits. But on a tech about Taproot is the method, is the speed by which it was added to Bitcoin. So that's that's one of the things that makes me a little worried about Bitcoin long term is that the rules of one of the best things about Bitcoin is that the rules of Bitcoin never change. So to so the rules of Bitcoin when you know, people first bought into Bitcoin in 2010 or 2011. Uh, if you've been holding Bitcoin for 10 years, the Bitcoin that you have today has the same rules than Bitcoin that you had 10 years ago. And that creates a stability and a reliability for the money where you don't have to worry about what's going to happen with the money and how to use the money, how to spend the money and how to you know, increase your money and how to invest the money. You don't have to worry about um, what if they change the rules in the future. For example, this is something that the markets today worry about all the time. Like, what if the government changes the monetary policy? Um, these are risks that are being priced in by people and they have to be calculated and taken into account at all times of decisions. Uh, whereas in Bitcoin, you can have an extremely high degree of confidence that the rules will never change. Um, the rules do change sometimes when it is these for, for, for those changes that we had set up um, years ago called, for example, the user activated soft fork. And there are other processes like the one that was used for Taproot, which is a minor activated soft fork. So what pisses me off about Taproot is that the developers of Taproot really wanted Taproot to be adopted quickly because they spent a lot of time and energy developing this technology and they didn't want to have to deal with a lot of, I guess, drama in getting Taproot into Bitcoin. So the way that Taproot was introduced to Bitcoin was to go for a very quick minor activated soft fork, which has the benefit of reducing potential conflict of miners refusing to adopt Taproot. So if you have a miner activated soft fork with speedy trial, um, which is a way to put upgrades into Bitcoin that are very quick and very painless, um, then sure that prevents or that prevented miners from blocking Taproot, but it had the assumption that people wanted Taproot in the first place. And what pisses me off about that is that the Bitcoin developers assumed that because no one was opposed to Taproot, um, then everybody supported Taproot and it had consensus. With a consensus of everyone that Taproot is a good thing for Bitcoin. Uh, but generally, the idea that the absence of dissent for changes in Bitcoin equals the presence of consent is a very, very dangerous idea. So Taproot itself is, no, no one's gonna really notice the difference in Bitcoin with Taproot. It's not something that's gonna make Bitcoin price go up. It's not something that's gonna make your Bitcoin user experience that much better. It might lead to other things 
uh, other technologies that you'll be using one day. Um, one of the things that, for example, it does is it makes it so that when you open a Lightning Network channel, it looks like a regular Bitcoin transaction. Like people can't tell that you've opened the Lightning Network channel. Um, but we shouldn't like think that it's a big thing. Uh, and we certainly shouldn't like speculate financially on It's a just a nice little piece of code, um, but to you know summarize, uh, it was worrying how quick and easy it was to introduce Taproot. Um, I would have preferred it to be much more difficult to introduce into Bitcoin. To set an example, that it should be extremely hard to change Bitcoin. Extremely hard. Even if your change is really nice and there's no downside, um, still should be extremely extremely difficult. I, 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 there's a lot of things that you can do to change Bitcoin with a soft fork. People forget that SegWit is a soft fork. So, so people think like, oh, it's a soft fork. It's not a big deal, right? Um, I think many people in the audience that are Bitcoin probably have a, a little bit more idea of what I'm talking about here. But uh, if you change Bitcoin with a soft fork, it's not a good thing just because it's a soft fork and, it, and, it's come, and you, know, you don't have to opt into it. Um, because you can do things with, with, a, with a soft fork, such as increase the block size. Right? So SegWit was a block size increase for Bitcoin. And whether you like it or not, uh, you have to opt in to SegWit to be perfectly safe. Uh, and that means that you have to have a higher like, load of responsibility. And you, have, like, you literally have to spend more disk space. Right? You have to accept the block size increase when you, um, when you use Bitcoin with SegWit. Uh, so just because it's a soft fork doesn't mean that it can have negative externalities on, on other users. Thank you, Francis. Yeah. Wow. Hi. Um, I can't remember the source but uh, it's been a couple sources where I've, uh, I'm hearing that eventually there could be the possibility of government or the elite deciding to um, uh, control the content on the internet and control who gets to access the internet and who gets to see what content on the internet. So for example, they could uh, control, like a, they could make up an internet world federation uh, where they decide, okay, we will decide what goes on the internet and we will decide who gets access to what information. So let's say if that were to happen, what impacts would that have to Bitcoin, to the blockchain? So if they decide, hey, this goes on the internet, is it possible that they can decide um, you, you know, John Doe can have access to, to the blockchain, to cryptos, and, um, you know, Mrs. Smith cannot, because that's how the Internet Federation decided. Is that possible, and how would that impact the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain? Well, of course, it's possible to control the Internet. It's, they're already controlling the Internet, right? So there's a reason like you don't have child pornography on the internet, for example, because if you put child pornography on the internet, the government will shut you down, right? Uh, you don't have drug, well, on the clear internet, you don't have drug markets. Um, in Quebec, for example, uh, you cannot access certain Bitcoin exchanges like BitMEX, uh, that's illegal. In Quebec, uh, the government has forbidden the use of uh, the access to online gambling websites. But there's technologies that allow you to subvert that, right? If you want to use BitMEX, which is illegal to use in Quebec, all you have to do is fire up your VPN and then you have access to BitMEX. Uh, if you want to go on an online gambling website, same thing, you use a VPN and you can go on an online gambling website. Uh, and if the government's cracked down on the VPNs, then you can use the Tor relay network. Sure. Uh, and if they crack down on Tor relay network, people are going to be launching satellites in space to give you access to the internet. So uh, 
it's an arms race between government censorship and subversive technologies and subversive technologies are always winning. We're always one step ahead. Um, so, and think about how impossibly difficult it would be to enforce that. So for example, in order to stop Bitcoin, right, you would have to tell the internet service provider to block people from having access to certain, you know, Bitcoin ports or certain, so you have to monitor everyone's traffic, right? You need to literally like, watch what everyone is doing. And again, you can block that with tour. So um, the logistics required to stop people from accessing Bitcoin on the internet are just, you would have to kill the entire internet. And then even then people would come up with other ways. And just, just so you know, you don't even need necessarily to have the internet to use Bitcoin, technically speaking, right? So technically speaking, you can broadcast Bitcoin transactions over ham radio. You can uh, broadcast Bitcoin transactions over, uh, I don't know, smoke signals <laughs> even. Um, so the internet is one of the, is, it is the layer that Bitcoin users use to propagate, you know, the Bitcoin blocks and to propagate the transactions. Uh, um, but technically speaking, it's not like absolutely required uh, technically for Bitcoin to operate. Uh, although, of course, if the internet was completely gone, it would be so insanely difficult to use Bitcoin and so inconvenient that, you know, people would just revert back to precious metals um, because the cost of, you know, using Bitcoin would be just the difficulty of using Bitcoin would be too high. Um, but, and the thing is, you know, at this point, we have like 10% of people that have Bitcoin in Canada or something like this. I saw a recent poll, a, a recent survey. I, I think it was as high as like 15% or something like that of people in Canada um, that own Bitcoin. So if, if you're going to like crack down so hard on the internet so that a significant portion of the population loses their money, you're just going to have popular revolts and revolutions. Like you can't attack the internet these days without having a, a popular revolt. So it's certainly possible to attack the internet infrastructure the internet infrastructure is already centralized. It is controlled by governments. Um, but to summarize, we'll always have people that developed alternative technologies that allow to bypass this form of censorship. Um, it's actually, because think about it like this, like in open source networks and software, where Hello. Francis. Hello. Tu prends plus. Hmm. OK. Il était bien dans la dehors là. Ouais, quand il était en dessous de la petite tente, genre. Ah. Non. Parce qu'il y a des singes qui marchent sur les lignes électriques. C'est vrai. C'est même pas une joke. Ah, c'est vrai, c'est vraiment vrai. <rire> ok. Ok. Ouais. Voilà. Okay, après ça, on va prendre une dernière question. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm still supposed to talk in English. So, after that, after the last question for Francis, uh, we're going to have a small panel with uh, Jonathan Amel in French, so it's a little surprise uh, for today. And uh, we'll be just like uh, having a small chat, more like from the Quebec pers perspective, I would say, Canadian perspective. So 
I don't know what's happening with Francis. Maybe we should jump on that already, or maybe two minutes. Most of our speakers are in Europe or America, so don't worry for the next days. <laughs> Not in the jungle, in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Okay, well. Yes. Tout à Let's go. Ouais. Bon, ben, on va switcher au français. On est au Québec quand même. Faites attention, on dirait que ça a l'air un peu. Euh... Assoyez-vous tranquillement, genre. Ah oh, ouais, ça, on va réussir de la poignée. Ok, ben. Euh, bon, euh, je vais te laisser euh, te présenter, Jonathan. Alors, bonjour à tous. Euh, tout le monde parle français, oui? Y a-t-il des gens qui sont uniquement anglophones, non? Oh. Comment? Oh, yeah. Any English speaking people? Only English speaking, no? Everybody speak French? Only? OK. So, euh, bon, ben, Jonathan Amel, je suis content d'être ici. Euh, L'invitation, merci, ma check. Donc, euh, écoute, je suis, euh, je, suis, je suis un fier participant à la Bitcoin Pleb, donc je ne suis pas vraiment un titre. Donc, mais à la base, euh, je suis fondateur d'Académie Bitcoin, qui est une firme de consultation euh, en Bitcoin. Euh, vous m'avez peut-être vu dans certains médias, donc j'ai souvent fait intervention par rapport à Bitcoin et l'économie en général. Euh, dans la vie de tous les jours, je suis, euh, je suis gestionnaire de quelques compagnies euh, d'exploration minière, particulièrement dans le domaine de l'or. Donc, euh, à peu près trois compagnies pour une valeur, totale, euh, valeur boursière totale d'environ euh, 60 millions de dollars canadiens. Et euh, comme implication, je dirais, bénévole et euh, idéologique, je suis également euh, administrateur, membre du conseil d'administration de l'Institut économique de Montréal, que vous avez peut-être vu euh, dans les médias, etc., qui, qui agit comme, euh, comme, euh, au niveau peut-être plus économique et politique publique. Donc, je suis très heureux d'être ici. Je pense que c'est ma première euh, conférence en personne depuis euh, quoi, plus d'un an. Ah bon. Donc, euh, let's go for it. Juste donner un background comment on s'est connu, euh, moi puis Gustavo, Tristan, quand on a commencé euh, notre, euh, notre, notre aventure entrepreneuriale. Ben, on voyait justement euh, comme Jonathan, euh, Isabelle Préfontaine aussi, Francis, qui, euh, qui, qui était de, de l'avant dans les médias dans, au niveau de, de la politique pour justement faire avancer le Bitcoin euh, au Québec. Puis là, dans le temps, il y avait un moratoire au niveau euh, du mining qui était... Euh, Malheureusement, euh, un clou sur le cercueil pour tout ce qui va être le Bitcoin pour le Québec, pour le Québec je pense, pour euh, l'industrie pendant très longtemps. Puis nous, dans le temps, on avait une mine. Euh, on voulait, on était des jeunes entrepreneurs, il y avait des, euh, euh, des audiences de la Régie de l'énergie. Puis euh, moi, c'est là que j'ai vraiment commencé à haïr les bureaucrates puis Hydro-Québec. <rire> Francis? Ouais. C'est vrai que c'est le moment d'aller dehors peut-être qu'il y a tant, je pense pas qu'il était dehors. Ouais, ouais, c'est ça. Hum. Peut-être sur quoi, là? Le moratoire sur le minage, il est encore là ou... Euh, en fait, ils ont encadré. Le moratoire, c'était... Le moratoire, c'était dans le but de... Dans, de, de limiter, parce que le, le, le narratif à l'époque, c'était qu'il y avait trop de demandes, puis ils devaient absolument mettre un frein à ça ce qu'ils ont fait. Euh, et par la suite, ils ont statué, il y a eu des jugements. Mais là, c'est pas fini. Je pense qu'il y a une troisième phase qui s'en vient. Hein. Il y a, là, la phase 1 et 2, je pense, est passée à la régie d'énergie, qui est comme un tribunal administratif, si tu veux. Euh, les seuls qui entendent de, de, de la régie d'énergie, c'est soit Hydro-Québec ou Gaz Métro. Il n'y a pas d'autre. C'est un peu une création de l'État pour se Allô? protéger, pour, pour encadrer la distribution d'énergie qui, qui est monopolistique au Québec. Donc, euh, ce qui est spécial, puis c'est le fun que Francis réussisse à se reconnecter, parce qu'on pourrait là, décrire à quel point euh, c'est un virage à 180 degrés, là, ce qui s'est passé. Parce qu'initialement, 
Hydro-Québec était 100 pour le développement de, 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 du minage Bitcoin au Québec. C'était dans la même catégorie que euh, les data centers. Donc, euh, la réalité, c'est qu'il y, y avait trop d'énergie au Québec en date de 2018-2019. Je ne sais pas c'est quoi le statut aujourd'hui, mais Hydro-Québec, le Québec perdait 1 milliard par année avec l'énergie excédentaire non vendue. Donc, c'est pas vrai que. Euh, c'est vrai qu'en 2017, fin 2017, début 2018, il y a vraiment eu une vague de, de gens qui voulaient s'installer ici. Tu sais, puis il y avait vraiment beaucoup de spéculation. Il y a des, il y a des euh, promoteurs immobiliers qui vendaient des buildings pour l'énergie. Donc, il y a eu vraiment, un, je pense, une fièvre. Il y a vraiment eu une panique là, par rapport à ça. Mais la réalité, c'est qu'il y avait vraiment de l'énergie. Puis, tu sais, Hydro-Québec, ce n'est pas, euh, pas une petite shop. Là. Il y a des milliers d'employés. Il aurait pu très facilement faire le due diligence, la vérification des, des acheteurs, puis des gens. Il y a des gens, c'est écoute, on a, on a entendu des histoires d'horreur pendant le. le, 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 le voyons, la, à la régie d'énergie. Il y a des gens qui avaient euh, loué des locales, euh, des locaux, qui avaient commandé pour des millions de dollars de miners parce qu'il y avait eu l'autorisation d'Hydro-Québec. Par la suite, Hydro-Québec est revenu sur sa parole en disant non, bien finalement, il y a eu un décret politique, on ne peut pas honorer notre, notre parole. Fait tu sais, je pense que c'est des événements comme ça, Monique, qui, euh, d'un point de vue idéologique, te, te font porter un regard différent sur l'État. C'est pas l'État, c'est pas une espèce d'organisme béni qui, qui observe toutes les lois. Là. Quand ça fait son affaire, elle va changer les lois, elle va faire un décret, puis that's it. Puis peu importe les gens qui ont été floués, bien, vous n'êtes pas content de poursuivre le gouvernement qui a des ressources illimitées pour, euh, pour gagner. Fait que ça, ça, ça a été, je pense, un wake-up call assez, euh, assez intéressant pour, pour l'industrie. Euh, ce qui est intéressant, un des gros miners qui, qui était un des gros intervenants à l'époque euh, de, de, cette, de cet épisode-là, Bitfarms, est maintenant rendu à la bourse de, du Nasdaq avec une capitalisation qui dépasse 1 milliard de dollars US. Euh, une entreprise qui a été bâtie au Québec avec, à peu près, avec zéro euh, subvention. Euh, C'est drôle, puis euh, euh, le fondateur qui est devenu un peu un ami par la bande, Pierre-Luc Quimper, il nous racontait euh, un peu comment ça avait commencé cette histoire-là. de quand, quand le gouvernement s'est braqué, à un moment donné, ils ont, ils ont, ils ont annoncé 200 millions d'investissements à Sherbrooke pour le, le, le partenariat avec Hydro-Sherbrooke, qui, dans, dans, un, dans un monde normal, devrait satisfaire tout le monde parce que Hydro-Sherbrooke vend ses surplus à Bitfarms puis ça rajoute, ça, ça amène des, des dizaines de millions de dollars, je pense, par année à la ville de Sherbrooke. Donc, tout le monde est content, on vend notre support, notre support notre excellent d'énergie, la ville fait de l'argent, etc., etc. Mais quand ils ont, ils ont organisé l'événement, euh, ils ont juste invité, comme il y avait la ville, il y avait Hydro-Sherbrooke, puis il y avait justement Bitfarms. Puis, ben, ce qui s'est passé, c'est qu'éventuellement, il y a un coup de téléphone. Là, le gouvernement n'était pas content que le député n'avait pas été invité. Fait que ce qu'il y a vraiment, il a dit, ben, regarde, on n'a pas besoin de vous autres, euh, avec raison, on n'a pas besoin de prêts, on n'a pas besoin, on a notre argent, on va développer avec la ville de Sherbrooke, that's it. Puis, en fond, c'est vraiment que le, le, le gouvernement et les politiciens ont été blessés dans leurs égaux de ne pas avoir été invités à une annonce de plusieurs centaines de millions de dollars qui a déclenché, déclenché vraiment la crise euh, au Québec. Le lendemain, presque le lendemain, dans la semaine, c'est là qu'on a vu le ministre se braquer. Il a appelé au québec il a dit « Non, c'est pas vrai qu'on va développer cette énergie-là ici au Québec. » C'est là, après ça, que c'est allé à la Régie d'énergie, où le gouvernement a perdu, by the way. Là, ben, en fait, c'est Hydro-Québec qui a perdu, parce qu'Hydro-Québec, ben, à la demande du gouvernement, demandait un, une enchère sur le prix de l'énergie pour cette industrie-là, ce, ce qui a été refusé. Ils ont pensé ensuite à, à nouer, je pense, 500 mégawatts, c'est ça? 300. 300 mégawatts. Euh, par contre, ils doivent euh, euh, débrancher, il y a un certain nombre d'heures par année qu'ils doivent euh, pour le load balancing, là. Donc, euh, mais en, en grande partie, l'industrie avait gagné. Mais c'est quand, quand même ironique d'avoir été jusque-là. Puis après ça, le, je veux dire, le, le, la blessure est faite. Quand les investisseurs, la pire chose qu'ils ont, le, la pire chose pour un investisseur, c'est l'incertitude. C'est une industrie qui est déjà volatile, qui est déjà incertaine par rapport à l'actif. Fait que tu n'as pas besoin d'un gouvernement euh, qui change de… de puis, puis, puis ça, vraiment, c'est intéressant parce que c'est vraiment digne d'une gouvernement, de, de république de bananes. Tu sais, de changer là, les lois établies du jour au lendemain qu'il y a des gens… Puis ces gens-là, ils, ils payaient leur industrie, tu sais, ils payaient l'énergie au prix du marché. Ce pas des gens qui demandaient des subventions, c'est pas des… Puis tu avais, avais un surplus d'énergie. Donc, c'est vraiment incroyable ce qui s'est passé. On va regarder ça dans, dans 10-15 ans, puis on va se rendre compte à quel point… On a l'Eldorado perdu là, au Québec, c'est vraiment ça. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment c'est incroyable ce qui s'est passé. Puis la couverture des médias, c'était totalement, euh, totalement ridicule, euh, qui est encore à peu près la même, en fait. Là. Chaque fois qu'on parle de Bitcoin, euh, quand c'est pas un de nous autres qui en parle, c'est toujours un peu, un peu ridicule. Puis c'est toujours les mêmes, les mêmes narratifs. Le Bitcoin n'est pas bon pour l'environnement, etc., etc. Mais bref, euh, ah. c'est pas mal ça au niveau de... Bien, on l'a observé quand, quand justement la Chine a banni le mining. Normalement, on aurait dû avoir des retombées ici, mais les personnes que je côtoie encore qui travaillent dans le mining au Québec, bien, ils ont dit qu'il n'y a rien qui se passe ici. C'est tout allé au Texas. Ou... À l'inverse, euh, s'ils si, si voudraient vraiment. Euh, 
où est-ce que c'est vraiment bullish, c'est tout ce qui est euh, gaz naturel. Partout, il y a des, du gaz naturel qui est stranded, comme euh, Alberta, Argentine, etc. Puis du gaz naturel, il y en a vraiment partout. C'est la, la vraie révolution énergétique, c'est vraiment le gaz naturel, LNG, etc. Parce que tu en as partout. Euh, là, le prix a monté, mais il y a un bout où le prix était vraiment en bas, puis il n'était pas capable de l'exploiter euh, euh, de manière profitable. Donc, moi, je suis très, très bullish sur tout ce qui est énergie, spécialement tout ce qui est gaz naturel. Les miners vont suivre l'énergie, là, puis tu ne peux, peux pas arrêter ça. C'est déjà, puis même maintenant, il y a des, il y a des joueurs institutionnels et de, souverains, c'est-à-dire que des, des fonds souverains d'État qui vont vouloir euh, développer, dans, investir dans, dans le mining Bitcoin. J'ai déjà vu un ou deux États là, qui cherchent à mettre des centaines de millions de dollars dans le mining Bitcoin. fait que ce n'est plus, plus quelque chose qui est… Euh, c'est plus quelque chose qui est… Euh, c'est plus une niche, là, du tout. C'est des milliards de dollars par année. Là. Parfait. On va, ouais. euh, El Salvador, c'est intéressant. Ce que j'aime moins, c'est comme le, le, le c'est le fait que le, 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 le legal tender, le cours légal, soit imposé. Moi, j'aime mieux le cas c'est décriminalisé ou, tu sais, par exemple, euh, euh, qu'il y ait plus de liberté. Mais je pense qu'overall, euh, c'est le genre de choses qu'on disait à la blague il y a cinq ans. Ah, maintenant, un pays qui va avoir Bitcoin comme sa devise. Mais là, c'est en train d'arriver. Euh, ça m'a surpris. Je pense que c'est en, en gros bullish euh, pour Bitcoin, mais ce qui m'a surpris le plus avant, c'est vraiment euh, plus comme toute la notion de, 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 de compagnies qui adoptent Bitcoin sur leur trésorerie corporative, comme mettons euh, MicroStrategy, ça, ça m'a beaucoup plus surpris. Euh, puis c'est arrivé beaucoup plus tôt aussi que je pensais. Moi, je pensais que ça allait arriver plus tard dans, tu sais, je pensais peut-être 2023, 2024, mais c'est arrivé comme fin 2020, euh, euh, non, novembre, cette année, euh, novembre, ouais. Fait que fin de l'année 2020, tout ça, fait que ça, ça a vraiment… À partir du moment où tu sais, les, les bankers et la haute finance, ils, ont, ils regardent juste ce que les autres font. Hein. Ce n'est pas des gens, euh, malgré qu'il y a beaucoup de gens intelligents là-dedans, il y en a beaucoup qui sont pas capables de lire des chiffres pour vrai. Donc, euh, à partir du moment où il y a quelqu'un qui met Bitcoin sur son balance sheet, une compagnie liste en bourse, comme un peu, qu'est-ce que j'ai pas compris alors que MSNBC puis Warren Buffett disaient que c'était de la merde, mais là, il y a un gars qui vient d'acheter pour un milliard. Euh, là, là, je pense en train de plus en plus de devenir euh, plus mature. Ça, ça m'a vraiment surpris. Pour El Salvador, ce qui est intéressant, je reviens, je, je saute un peu du coq à l'âne, c'est toute la notion de développement d'une économie, plus de microtransactions. Ça, nous, euh, dans, dans le contexte américain, la plupart des gens, nord-américains, la plupart des gens qui détiennent des bitcoins, c'est plus d'un point de vue investissement. Donc, on n'a pas vraiment, le, à part pour le fun, tu sais, quand on fait des transactions euh, ou on fait un, un événement puis on peut acheter de la bière en Bitcoin, il n'y a pas vraiment de réelle consommation en Bitcoin, alors que dans un pays comme ça, il y a vraiment l'opportunité de développer quelque chose. Le mining, ah, mining là-bas, oui, le mining, euh, c'est l'histoire euh, avec le, la géothermie. Là. Bien, ça, pour, ce que, pour revenir à ce que Francis disait, euh, c'est vraiment un retour à la base. C'est quoi l'énergie? L'énergie, c'est des joules. Tu sais, l'énergie, euh, vous en dépensez, en fait, on est, on est, l'énergie est directement corrélée avec la, la croissance de la civilisation. Regardez la courbe du niveau de vie, par exemple, en Angleterre, qui fait un hockey stick à la fin du, au début du 18e siècle à cause de la découverte du charbon euh, puis du moteur à vapeur. Donc, l'énergie est directement corrélée avec, avec la civilisation, puis ce pas quelque chose que tu peux changer, même si tu dis que l'énergie est mauvaise puis qu'il faut euh, avoir une décroissance. Là. Fait que ça, ça ne va pas changer. Les lois de la physique ne changeront pas parce qu'il y en a qui... Qui, euh, qui vont crier sur les toits, le « cry harder », comme euh, dirait Francis. Euh, je ne je, je, je suis pas un expert en géothermie, mais c'est le genre de choses qu'on voit de plus en plus. Des pays qui ont de l'énergie et qui n'ont rien. Tu sais, je, je comprends que c'est difficile à exploiter, c'est difficile à exporter aussi. Un exemple qu'on a vu dans le passé, puis il y, y a un article de Dan L qui est vraiment bon là-dessus, là, c'est qu'il y a quelque chose de très similaire au mining Bitcoin qui est arrivé dans le passé puis qui a eu à peu près la même mauvaise presse au début, c'est l'industrie de l'aluminium. L'industrie de l'aluminium, dans les années 50-60, qui, qui, ça, en, en, ça montait en flèche. Il y a plein de gens qui disaient, encore une fois, des, des journalistes, des académiciens qui disaient, bah, ben, si la tendance continue, l'industrie de l'aluminium va consommer toute l'énergie de la Terre d'ici 1970. Donc, c'est à peu près les mêmes choses qu'on entend aujourd'hui. Puis, tous les pays qui ont développé l'industrie de l'aluminium, c'est des pays qui avaient de l'énergie qui était difficilement exportable. Le Québec, c'est un bon exemple de des grosses alumineries euh, euh, sur la côte nord, au Saguenay. L'Islande, euh, c'est un pays où il y a justement des, des, des alumineries parce qu'ils ne sont pas capables d'exporter. Les Émirats arabes unis qui, ont, qui utilisent des surplus de pétrole et de gaz pour euh, faire de, la, de, de l'aluminium et d'exporter. Dans le fond, c'est une façon de matérialiser l'énergie et de la monétiser. Bitcoin, c'est pareil, c'est juste, juste mieux encore. C'est encore plus simple, encore plus simple, encore plus efficace, puis ça monétise directement l'énergie. Euh, qui est excédentaire. Là. Fait que, overall, moi, je suis très, très bullish sur le, le mining Bitcoin. Je pense que ça va devenir de plus en plus, c'est de plus en plus, qui est, est, ça, ça va devenir une commodité qui est de plus en plus reconnue sur le marché. Euh, yes. Point intéressant, euh, mercredi, on va avoir euh, bit, euh, le projet de Bitcoin Beach, quelqu'un de Bitcoin Beach de El Salvador qui va venir parler, puis il va parler vraiment de l'expérience de Lightning, puis comment ça se passe là-bas. Ça va peut-être encore plus nous donner de 
de perspective par rapport à comment ça fonctionne là-bas. Euh, je ne sais pas si on va prendre des questions. J'avais des sujets ah, aussi. Mais allez-y, allez-y, allez-y. Vas-y, Jean-François. Ben, écoute, moi, je suis, pas un, euh, je suis à haut niveau, là, les, euh, je ne suis pas comme les gars de Verify ou Francis, où, euh, je ne suis pas vraiment en détail le développement technique. J'ai suivi un peu, euh, tu sais, Lightning, je trouve que ça va vraiment vite, ça avance bien. Ça semble être de plus en plus convivial. On voit des trucs comme euh, Zap, euh, Zap, c'est ça, Jack Muller, Zap? Euh, straight, strike, euh, qui permettent, là, tu sais, le plus que tu as enlevé de friction pour les transactions Bitcoin, le mieux que c'est. Mais ce qui est aussi intéressant, ce qui est le gros, gros killer euh, use case, c'est vraiment les micro, micro transactions. Puis ça, ben pour l'industrie, je te dirais peut-être plus le, la civilisation occidentale, pour des trucs on-demand, ça, ça serait vraiment intéressant. Je regardais le, le combat justement avec l'athlète MMA, là, Olivier, où tu peux faire des donations à un athlète que tu aimes. Euh, ça, c'est des use cases, je pense, qui vont se développer de plus en plus. Des, tout ce qui est une barrière à l'entrée pour, pour les payment processors, là, les gens ne réalisent pas là, que tu ne peux pas envoyer 20 cents sur Internet. Tu ne peux pas envoyer 15 cents. Tu peux pas, tu sais, tu peux... En, même les marchands, tu payes des fois genre 3-4 pièces avec ta carte de crédit, puis ils te regardent en voulant dire, tu sais, fuck you, j'aurais coûté 2 pièces de, de, de frais, là. Fait que ça, c'est un, c'est huge, l'opportunité de disrupter ça. Puis je pense qu'un des gros à surveiller là-dessus, qui est de plus en plus all-in, je sais qu'il y a un débat là, avec Twitter puis la censure, mais je pense que Jack Dorsey, il est all-in sur Bitcoin. Puis euh, 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 Square, ça va être un géant, là. Square sont all-in. Sur... Je pense qu'ils ont compris que l'avenir du protocole de paiement, c'est Bitcoin. Euh, puis ils sont, ils sont déjà, en fait, je, bon, je travaille déjà avec les, les processeurs de, de cartes de crédit. Tu peux, tu peux payer avec ton compte Square, mais je pense que l'évolution qu'ils voient, c'est l'avenir, c'est vraiment le, le protocole Bitcoin, peu importe la forme, pour, euh, pour les transactions là, de tous les jours. Ah ouais. Il est là? On va redevenir. En fait, ben, c'est parfait, c'est Francis. Parce euh, Francis, tu m'entends-tu? Ben, ok. Ben, dans tous les cas, euh, je voulais ramener euh, peut-être un sujet plus difficile, là, puis euh, peut-être tabou, euh, qu mais je pense qu'on peut le discuter ici. Évidemment, euh, comme vous savez, je pense qu'on peut s'entendre que quand même beaucoup de mesures liberticides euh, au Québec euh, durant la dernière année, puis il euh, faut, faut le reconnaître. Puis en tant que Bitcoiner, euh, des personnes qui justement vont, vont peut-être pousser ça euh, davantage comme, euh, comme pensée, euh, on est confronté à, à ce qui se passe au Québec ici. Puis, euh, tu sais, par exemple, moi, puis Gustavo, euh, euh, Tristan, puis, euh, tu sais, Guillaume, quand on jase, on jase beaucoup de ça. Euh, parce qu'au-delà de juste être technique, on, on, est, on regarde aussi l'histoire, c'est quoi qui se passe. Puis, on dirait que dans l'histoire, il y a toujours des cycles. Puis là, on, on arrive au bout du cycle. Puis, euh, Gus, je sais que tu as beaucoup de théories là-dessus. Fait que je voudrais juste te laisser parler un peu euh, par rapport à ça. Puis, euh, après, euh, j'en attends ton point de vue. Oui, certain. Il ben, ben, y a beaucoup de choses par rapport à ça. Puis je, vais, je pourrais parler de ça pendant des heures, là, mais en, en gros, c est, c est, c est la grosse, ça se trouve à part avec le système monétaire. Là, le, le système monétaire actuel, euh, ça fait 50 ans. Et hier, c'était officiellement 50 ans depuis le choc de Nixon, le moment où est -ce que les États-Unis ont décidé de changer leur monnaie euh, backée par l'or à juste être backée par rien. Euh, Puis c'est à partir de ce moment-là qu'on a commencé la nouvelle ère monétaire dans, la, dans laquelle on est. Euh, pourquoi les États-Unis ont fait ça à ce moment-là? Il, il y a beaucoup de théories, mais c'est surtout qu'ils euh, n'étaient plus capables de tenir cette, euh, cette promesse-là, que, que le dollar valait autant. Pourquoi? Parce qu'ils imprimaient de l'argent pour aller à Vietnam, euh, puis faire la guerre, puis ça ne marchait pas. La, le gros parallèle avec l'Afghanistan d'aujourd'hui. Euh, on a passé 50 ans sous, sous ce, ce, ce système, euh, puis même... 35 ans avant ça, sous, sous Bretton Woods, où les Américains, ils dominaient le monde en, aussi. Euh, puis, il y, y a plusieurs impacts que ça, ça a. Ça, ça a des impacts au niveau économique, ça, ça centralise l'économie, euh, ça a des impacts au niveau de toutes les institutions. Euh, puis, même au-delà du système fiduciaire, juste le fait qu'il y a un empire qui domine le monde euh, pendant autant longtemps, euh, qui crée autant de richesses, où est-ce que des nouvelles générations vivent que dans cette richesse-là, qui sont, qui développent pas les valeurs, qui, 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 qui oublient les raisons pourquoi on, a, pourquoi on a une constitution, pourquoi on a ces valeurs-là, pourquoi on, on, on pense de cette manière-là. Donc, tout ça combiné ensemble, c'est un peu, je pense, que ce qu'on est en train de voir. Euh, Puis, tu sais, on, on l'a déjà vu euh, dans le passé. Dans les années 80, il y avait beaucoup de monde, dont, dont des investisseurs comme Ray Dalio, qui disaient « l'hyperinflation, c'est maintenant ». Mais il y a un concept qui n'avait pas été totalement compris, c'est que 
les autres pays, si tu imprimes l'argent, mais que les autres pays sont pires que toi, ben, ils vont acheter ta monnaie et tu vas pouvoir imprimer de l'argent à l'infini. C'est ça que les États-Unis ont fait avec la, 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 la tombée de l'Union soviétique. Un, un extra boost, là, euh, pour... Mais là, il y a le Bitcoin, les autres pays peuvent utiliser le Bitcoin, euh, ils, ont, ils ont une alternative. Puis là, les, les, les États-Unis euh, sont de moins en moins respectés sur la planète. Donc, il y a un changement à ce niveau-là du, du leadership mondial et, et de la société qui, qui dirige la planète. Et puis, ça, en gros, cette théorie-là, ça s'appelle le, le « fourth turning euh, euh, theory ». Puis, c'est pas non plus quelque chose qui est… Euh, je sais livre, pas, c'est ça, c'est un livre. Il y a un gars qui s'appelle euh, Quitem, je pense Robert Quitem, sur euh, The Swan Bitcoin. Il parle beaucoup de ça souvent, là, puis il fait les liens entre, entre le fourth learning et le Bitcoin. C'est un cycle de quoi, centralisation, décentralisation tout le temps. C'est ça, exact. Mais c'est juste le, cla le classique euh, « um, strong man uh, create good times, good times create weak man, weak man create bad times, bad times create uh, strong man, uh, puis one man or woman ». Mais c'est juste pour dire, il faut à un moment donné recommencer le cycle. Euh, puis je pense que c'est ça qu'on est en train de voir. Puis ça, il y a des théories de tous les sens là-dessus. Disons, juste un dernier point. Euh, un, un, Quelqu'un qui s'appelle Fromm, qui est un philosophe vraiment de gauche, vraiment pas proche de qu ce que je pense, mais où est-ce que je pense qu'il a quand même raison, c'est que sa critique à lui du, du capitalisme des sociétés libérales des années 20, euh, 1920, avant la, la montée du fascisme, c'est qu'à un certain point, les sociétés euh, qui, ont, qui ont capitalistes, qui, 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 euh, qui opèrent souvent sous des régimes fiduciaires, de monnaie fiduciaire, deviennent tellement corrompues qu'elles ne savent plus les intérêts de la, de la majorité. Là. Puis ça, on le voit aujourd'hui. L'économie, euh, ça, c'est quelque chose que la gauche et la droite vont dire, puis ils ont probablement raison les deux. L'économie, elle sert, elle est centralisée, elle sert aux gens qui sont proches des, de l'argent qui se fait imprimer, euh, dû à l'effet quantillon. Euh, et tout le monde se demande... Euh, que pourquoi, pourquoi ce système? Pourquoi la liberté? Pourquoi le, le, la démocratie? Pourquoi le capitalisme, si, si je suis malheureux, si ça ne me sert pas? Euh, puis dans les années 20, il y avait énormément ce, ce sentiment-là. Et là, il arrive un tyran, il arrive une, une, une catastrophe, il arrive un besoin de, de, de contrôle euh, et d'autoritarianisme. Et beaucoup de monde aime ça, parce qu'enfin, ils ont un sens à la vie. Enfin, ils font partie de quelque chose. Euh, chose qui n'était pas du tout le, le, leur vie jusqu'à date, là, parce que le, le système ne fonctionnait plus pour eux. Et, à, et je pense que c'est ça qu'on voit beaucoup aujourd'hui. C'est beaucoup de monde voit, voit ça parce qu'ils étaient malheureux, les autos de dépression, les autos de, de juste solitude. Puis on, on a enfin un leader qui nous dit, euh, qui est là qui, pour watcher après nous, qu'on est enfin, on fait tous partie de quelque chose, qu'il y a un mouvement collectif. Donc, je vois beaucoup de parallèles en, en, mm. entre ces ce, ce changements-là. Non, écoute, c'est euh, moi je pense qu'on on vit ce qu'on vit présentement, tout la dérive. Puis peu importe c'est quoi votre opinion, euh, on ne rentre pas dans est-ce que le virus est dangereux, oui ou non. Là, et je pense que la, la réaction, elle est clairement disproportionnée à la menace réelle. Euh, et ça, c'est je pense en grande partie, tu sais, on pourrait on pourrait en discuter pendant des heures, mais je pense high level, c'est possible justement parce que tu as un régime de banque centrale. Si les gens avaient été laissés à eux-mêmes, la, la crise aurait duré deux semaines. Là, parce que les gens, les, on est vraiment encore dans ce cycle-là parce que euh, à gauche et à droite, il y a un paquet d'argent qui a été donné. Puis au début, je pense avec raison, parce que quand tu empêches, tu sais, ce, ce qui s'est passé au début de, par exemple, le premier lockdown, euh, qu'est-ce que tu fais en empêchant les entreprises? De, en fait, tu saisis la propriété des gens. Donc, il y a des gens qui, euh, par exemple, qui vivent d'une un, paye à l'autre, bien là, ils n'ont plus de revenus. Fait que tu ne pouvais pas les laisser comme ça. Fait d'une certaine manière, au début, je pense que c'était correct parce que tu n'as pas le choix de dédommager les gens. Mais à un certain point, c'est devenu un mode de vie. Et moi, je théorisais déjà dès le début que, en voyant qui est au pouvoir, pour ne pas dire M. Trudeau et le Parti libéral, que ça allait devenir, de fil en aiguille, une sorte de revenu minimum garanti. Puis c'est ça que c'est en train de devenir. Tu n'es plus capable d'enlever de, ces, ces, ces programmes-là. Pire encore, les entreprises, il y a plusieurs entreprises qui sont plus rentables, fermées, couvertes. Donc, euh, moi, je disais, les états financiers, par exemple, de restaurants qui, avec les dédommagements, plus le, le quelques take-out qu'ils font, sont plus profitables qu'avant la crise. Fait que un paquet de, de mauvais incitatifs qui sont présents particulièrement par le fait, en fait, par l'unique raison du fait que le gouvernement est capable d'imprimer, de monétiser sa dette et de payer, justement, des groupes comme ça. Donc, ça, ça me semble assez évident, mais c'est... 
ce que disait Gustavo, c'est très vrai. On a vu, euh, tu la notion de la liberté, pour, euh, pour paraphraser euh, Falado, Falardo, la, la liberté, ce n'est pas une marque de yogourt. C'est quelque chose qui est, qui est vraiment important dans l'histoire humaine. Puis vous pouvez vraiment voir, je pense que ce qu'on vit, c'est très similaire aux années 20. Euh, puis là, quand on fait la comparaison avec des régimes fascistes, les gens disent « Ouais, mais là, ils sont où les chambres à gaz? » Mais les chambres à gaz ne sont pas arrivées tout de suite. Là. Les chambres à gaz, ça a pris 25 ans avant qu'ils arrivent. Mais si vous regardez, moi, j'ai passé des centaines d'heures à lire, par exemple, sur la montée du régime nazi. Puis ce que je me demandais toujours, c'est comment un peuple comme l'Allemagne avait pu tomber là-dedans. Seulement, ce n'est pas des idiots. C'est un des peuples depuis, tu sais, c'est un des peuples fondateurs. Je veux dire, ça remonte à l'Empire romain, c'est des ingénieurs, c'est… Puis l'armée allemande, là, c'est des soldats de père en fils, de grand-père en père en fils, des gens qui étaient en, au travail, qui avaient, je veux dire, une certaine honneur. Alors, comment ces gens-là ont pu tomber dans un régime où tu assassines des femmes et des enfants? Fait que là, je pense que dans les derniers mois, dans la dernière année, on a vu comment euh, des, 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 des gouvernements, ou même, parce que c'est même plus le gouvernement, c'est rendu une espèce de coalition média-gouvernement, grande corporation, donc c'est très, très, euh, c'est très, très centralisé autour à peu près de la même idée. Donc, quand une idée comme ça devient populaire, c'est non seulement euh, le fait de trouver un leader, comme disait Gustavo, mais c'est aussi, je pense, la, la particularité qui est vraiment frappante, frappante c'est de pointer un groupe qui est responsable du malheur. Dans le cas de l'Union soviétique, c'était les gens qui ne suivaient pas le plan. Ah, ces gens-là, c'est les, ah, les Kulaks ou les... Euh, euh, ils n'ont pas pris part au plan de 5 ans, puis euh, ils, 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 euh, ils euh, sabotent les usines. Donc, c'est pour ça que le plan de 5 ans ne fonctionne pas. En Allemagne, c'était évident, c'était les Juifs. Les Juifs ont infiltré le système, euh, la finance internationale, etc. Donc, il y a toujours un coupable. Dans le cas d'ici, dans la crise, c'est les gens qui ne suivent pas les règles. Donc, alors que c'est complètement débile, on voit des pays qui ont aboli ou à peu près tout aboli les règles, puis ont à peu près la même courbe qu'on a ici, ou même mieux dans certains cas. Fait que cette dynamique-là, elle est extrêmement dangereuse, puis ça, elle n'est pas une personne. Là. Euh, moi, j'ai entendu des, des discours là, assez dangereux de gens qui sont avocats, médecins, euh, euh, puis regardez l'espèce de, de vision, c'est très, très paternaliste. Ah, ben, les, ceux qui ne respectent pas les mesures, c'est des, 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 euh, des édentés, puis c'est des camionneurs, puis c'est des idiots qui écoutent la radio de Québec. Mais ce n'est pas vrai, ça. Il y a des gens qui ont... C'est peut-être, je pense, un côté positif de cette crise-là, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup de gens qui commencent à se poser des questions, puis tout ça s'accélère. Euh, je pense que c'est la première crise dans l'histoire où les gens se posent réellement la question « Pourquoi on paye des taxes s'ils peuvent imprimer de l'argent? » Parce que là, c'est vraiment, vraiment systémique. Là. Aux États-Unis, on a imprimé quelque chose comme 8 trillions. La dette canadienne, je pense, doublé depuis, euh, ouais, a augmenté de 50 depuis, euh, depuis 18 mois. Euh, on est maintenant en haut de 50 du, euh, du PIB. Euh, c'est incroyable. Il n'y a, a, a rien qui est prévisible. Si tu, tu retournes dans le passé, tu retournes un an et demi dans le passé, tu montes le graphique, par exemple, tu, les, puis tu demandes à un économiste ou à un analyste de, de politique publique qu'est-ce qu qui est arrivé, puis ils vont dire, bien, il y a eu une guerre mondiale, il y a eu, il y a eu euh, la Troisième Guerre mondiale, ça ne fait aucun sens. Là. En, en proportion avec le PIB, le Canada a plus, que dé, a plus dépensé que la, la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, alors qu'on envoyait des chars d'assaut à l'autre côté de, 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 de l'Atlantique. C'est vraiment dangereux ce qui se passe. Je pense qu'il y a un, un réveil qui est, qui est quand même collectif. Il y avait 100, plus de 100 000 personnes dans la rue samedi. Euh, ça, c'est intéressant à voir. Puis souvent, ils parlent de diversité. Ah, ça prend plus de diversité. Ben moi, samedi, dans la rue, j'ai vu des jeunes, des vieux, des, des tatoués, des sportifs, des, des gens de gauche, des gens de droite. C'est vraiment la liberté, ce n'est pas unique à la droite. C'est quelque chose qui est une idée qui est fondamentale à la civilisation occidentale. Puis ce qu'on vit, ben l'éthos, Bitcoin, donc la... Je pense que la pensée derrière Bitcoin, ça a toujours été la liberté, la liberté de transaction, la liberté de ne pas être censuré. Euh, fait que je pense qu'on a un marché incroyable devant nous pour propager ces valeurs-là. Euh, je pense que c'est le bon côté, malgré le fait que c'est un, euh, un peu plat. Super. Moi, je trouve ça, je trouve ça intéressant. Puis moi, par exemple, j'aime beaucoup la façon que tu interagis en ligne parce que euh, tu fais en sorte qu'on ne puisse jamais te piéger. Hein, parce que toi, de la façon que tu fais, c'est comme tu exposes le fait, puis tu ne dis quasiment aucun commentaire. <rire> c'est ça. Puis c'est ça le problème, c'est que dès que tu as une opinion légèrement différente, on ne parle pas de QAnon ou whatever, mais dès que tu as une opinion genre, similaire, un peu différente, ben, tu te fais déjà catégorifier. Donc là, c'est comment on fait pour justement, quand on a des questions comme nous, on, a, on se questionne sur le Bitcoin, comment on fait pour avoir un discours qui ne se fait pas qui n'est euh, pas euh, attaquable, dans le fond. Mm -hmm. Comment on fait pour avoir un discours qui euh, y, y est sans faire, tu sais? Bien, tu sais, à la base, ce que tu dis, c'est que ça fait partie de la stratégie de démoniser une partie en disant « Ah, oh, ben vous êtes des anti-vax. » Moi, j'ai reçu tous les vaccins. J'ai été vacciné dans un aéroport miteux de l'Afrique de l'Ouest 
à côté d'un gars qui avait un AK-47. J'avais oublié de me faire vacciner pour la, la fièvre jaune là, pour rentrer. Je suis pas un anti-vax. Euh, par contre, je pense que le, le contexte actuel... Non, mais c'est juste le fait qu'on doit se justifier. Oui, non, c'est ça. Mais on n'a pas besoin de te justifier. Je veux dire, ça me semble assez évident que le cadre qui essaie de déployer... C'est comme en, en, en Australie, j'ai regardé une nouvelle hier, ils sont en train de bâtir des camps. « Oh, they're building camps now! <rire> » On mettait ça en garde comme avant. Ils sont en train de bâtir des camps pour isoler les gens. C'est « rings a bell » a little bit. Mais euh, bref, ça fait partie de la stratégie de, de démoniser et de t'associer à une minorité. Euh, parce qu'en faisant ça, ils n'ont pas besoin de débattre du fond. Ils n'ont pas besoin de débattre de l'argument. À la base, pour Bitcoin, je pense qu'il faut revenir à la base. Parce que les gens ne comprennent pas l'importance. Écoute, si tu lis un article sur Bitcoin aujourd'hui, c'est à peu près la même chose qu'en 2014-2015. C'est toujours la même bullshit. Bitcoin est volatile, dangereux pour l'environnement. Ah, ils vont prendre un doute qu'il a tout perdu son argent dans un shitcoin, genre il a perdu 10 000 puis il a perdu ses économies. C'est mmh. toujours la même chose. Mmh. Mais je pense que justement, ce qui se passe actuellement, c'est bon, le bon moyen de revenir à la base puis d'expliquer. Tu sais, là, les gens, je pense, commencent à comprendre l'histoire de l'inflation. Puis là, tous les prix montent. Là. Les, mmh. Ils disent que ah, l'inflation, ça va être genre 2-3 ça va être peut-être 4 5 l'année prochaine, mais c'est plus que ça. Là. Regardez à l'épicerie comment les prix ont monté. Le, le prix des maisons, les prix des. Il y, des, il y a des maisons, là, tu ne peux pas avoir une maison ni familiale sur l'île de Montréal pour moins d'un million de dollars. Alors que euh, quand mes parents sont arrivés sur, pour acheter une maison, ils pouvaient s'acheter une maison pour un, un, peut-être un tiers du, de, leur salaire, de, leur, de leur salaire annuel familial de l'époque. Donc, l'inflation, elle est là, elle est présente. Donc, je pense que les, les gens sont en train de réaliser... Le, parce que besoin, pour comprendre rien à Bitcoin, tu as besoin de background, je pense, euh, non seulement économique, monétaire, technologique, mais tu as besoin d'un certain background idéologique. Si tu ne crois pas à ça... Il y en a qui ne croient pas à Bitcoin parce que pour eux, comme par exemple les adeptes du MMT ou euh, les socialistes, eux, ils, ils, en fait, ils, ils comp... il y en a, je pense, qui comprennent réellement comment Bitcoin fonctionne, mais ils disent ouais. non, non, le fiat, c'est mieux. Puis ouais. non seulement c'est mieux, mais on devrait en être plus. Fait que, ouais. mais, souvent, c'est parce qu'ils sont dans une position d'insider, comme disait Gustavo, euh, l'effet cantillon. Regardez qui, qui s'est enrichi dans la dernière année. Euh, ben, moi, je fais partie de ceux qui sont enrichis. Ben, j'ai beaucoup d'actions en bourse, j'ai des placements d'hiver, j'ai du Bitcoin, j'ai de l'or. Donc, euh, je suis plus riche que mars 2020. Puis, tu regardes le, le, le graphique de la bourse, là, on est beaucoup plus haut qu'on était en mars 2020. Mais euh, au travail, tu sais, vraiment... Que, alors, que, si on parle les, les articles de journaux, les titres avec la bourse, ça fait aucun sens. Là. Donc, euh, euh, je pense que les gens commencent à réaliser qu'il y a une espèce de déconnexion là, totale entre le, euh, la production réelle, l'économie, puis euh, ce, que les gens, ce que les gens payent, ce que les gens voient comme prix. Là. Fait que, je pense que le background macroéconomique qu'on est en train de voir va aider peut-être plus à comprendre. Là. Tu vois, il y en a beaucoup qui m'ont dit dans la dernière année, tu vois, avant, avant, je trouvais ça un petit peu câble, l'histoire de liberté, tout ça, mais là, ils ont comme fait, oh, les shit, là, c'est ouais. euh, ouais. important. Ben, c'est ça, puis, ben, en fait, moi, j'ai jamais été autant convaincu du Bitcoin que depuis que le COVID est arrivé. Là. Genre, depuis que le COVID est arrivé, c'est juste totalement prouvé tous les doutes que j'avais, toutes les questions que j'avais. C'est comme, puis, à un certain point, c'est comme, ça fait du sens que quand leur système fiat collapse, ils vont mettre les gens sous leur contrôle, ils vont enlever les libertés, ils vont imprimer de l'argent, ils vont confisquer la richesse, ils vont bloquer les frontières. Hein. Euh, C'est vraiment intéressant, je ne sais pas si vous avez vu dans « Sovereign Individual ouais, », ouais. en 1996, il écrit exactement ça. Il dit « Avec l'ère le, le, de l'information, les gens ils vont pouvoir travailler sur leur ordinateur à partir de n'importe où. Il y en a qui vont partir dans d'autres pays. Et pour prévenir ça, hein, les gouvernements vont bloquer les frontières. Et une super bonne façon de bloquer les frontières, c'est utiliser une pandémie euh, pour mettre ce genre de règles-là. 1996, écrit exactement ce qui arrive aujourd'hui. Mot pour mot. Là. Mot pour mot. C'est incroyable. Bon, D'autres prédictions. Là. Dans ce livre-là aussi, il prédit le Bitcoin, puis il prédit euh, un, un paquet d'affaires. The Sovereign Individual. Vraiment, vraiment recommandé à lire. Mais pour, pour répondre à ta question, il ne faut pas jouer au, à leurs règles. C'est le moment que tu joues dans leur jeu, que tu tombes dans leurs règles, qui peuvent te coincer. Ils changent la définition, euh, puis quand je dis « eux ben, », je parle de, du mainstream, euh, je parle des médias. Ils changent les définitions aussi euh, à la moitié de la conversation. Hein. On voit sur le site, euh, disons, le, de l'OMS, que « anti-vax », c'est plus juste « t'es contre les vaccins », c'est comme « t'es contre les, les, les passeports vaccinales euh, ou euh, « l'immunité collective ». L'immunité collective, c'est plus l'immunité naturelle, c'est juste à travers les vaccins. Euh, donc, si tu joues euh, au, au jeu du mainstream, tu ne vas, tu vas jamais gagner. Tu, tu dois, on doit jouer à notre propre jeu. On doit, on doit mime le Bitcoin et, et, nos, et, nos, et, nos, et nos croyances into reality ouais. Euh, ouais. avec notre propre narrative. Euh, ouais. Là-dessus, il y a Alex Epstein, qui est vraiment un super bon auteur et conférencier. Il a écrit uh, « The Moral Case for Fossil Fuel ». Sur Twitter, il est vraiment bon. Il, il interagit beaucoup sur les questions de, 
d'environnement puis d'énergie, euh, pour notamment les oil, oil and gas. Puis lui, il dit, puis c'est un super bon debater, puis personne ne veut débattre avec lui, il dit que celui qui gagne le débat, parce que tu as 0 et 10, 10 étant bon et 0 étant le mal absolu, la personne qui va gagner le débat, c'est elle qui est capable de définir quel est le 0 et quel, quel est le 10. Puis les médias, c'est ce qu'ils font sur une base quotidienne. Là. Ils vont définir, par exemple... Euh, D'ailleurs, Francis a été défini comme une des personnes les plus dangereuses au Québec là, récemment. Je ne sais pas si tu as vu, là, il y a une espèce de journaliste qui a tweeté en disant euh, « euh, Mâle, blanc, euh, euh, meat, euh, meat diet, bitcoin, weapon ». Donc, il y a eu toutes les caractéristiques d'une personne différente. Mais à la base, si tu regardes, c'est ça qui est dangereux, c'est que... Puis récemment, ben, je regarde un peu ce que Max Bernier fait, puis j'aime beaucoup ce qu'il dit, puis... Puis je trouve ça complètement débile qu'il soit dépeint comme une espèce d'extrémiste parce qu'à la base, ce qu'il dit, c'est ce qui était avant le consensus de la société occidentale. Libre expression, protection de la propriété privée, égalité entre tous les êtres humains, peu importe leur sexe, religion, orientation sexuelle. C'est ça la base. Il y a d'autres sujets qu'on peut être peut-être ou pas d'accord. Par exemple, l'environnement, euh, le, le, l'immigration, c'est d'autres sujets. Mais à la base, son discours, c'est vraiment un discours d'égalité devant la loi. Puis de voir les gens dépeindre ça comme des extrémistes, c'est là que tu perds. Puis quand même que tu te mettrais à te débattre contre ces gens, non, non, c'est pas extrémiste. Je pense qu'il faut revirer la table de base. Quand ça marche pas, là, tu flippes la table, c'est vous les extrémistes. Il reste deux, je pense à mon avis, il reste deux, trois politiciens modérés au Canada, sur la scène fédérale, Pierre Poliev puis euh, Maxime Bernier. Euh, au Québec, j'aime bien Éric Duhem aussi. Mais là, tout est vraiment en train de shifter à des extrêmes. Puis tu vois, c'est des discours qui sont dangereux. là. C'est des gens que qui parle, c'est carrément, puis il ne faut pas oublier que, par exemple, la gauche, qui, qui se réclame comme étant comme les, les, euh, le, presque le bon Dieu aujourd'hui, c'était elle qui était derrière l'eugénisme au début des, du 20e siècle. Donc, euh, il y a quand même un passé autoritaire et quasi fasciste là, de, de la gauche qui n'est pas, euh, pas étranger. Fait que, euh, je pense que Gustavo a raison, ne laissons pas, ne laissons pas les gens, ces, ces gens-là, définir le cadre du débat. Euh, je pense que Bitcoin s'insère dans des droits qui sont naturels, qui ont, qui ont servi l'humanité dans l'histoire humaine. C'est un outil qui est essentiel. Moi, je continue de voir ça comme un, un qui est très bon là-dessus, c'est Alex Gladstein de la mm. Human Rights Foundation. Il explique souvent dans, dans plusieurs pays, par exemple Cuba, il a fait un, un essai sur Cuba, comment Cuba, Bitcoin aide les gens. Il a fait, on a fait un aussi pour l'Afrique. Mm. Euh, ces gens-là sont totales de des régimes euh, qui, qui saisissent leur richesse. Là. Si, par exemple, euh, l'Argentine, c'est un bon exemple, la, la, la devise a crashé de 75 il y a trois ans. Fait que si vous êtes un professeur, parce que c'est drôle, les gens comme, mettons, la, les gens qui se disent modérés, ils disent « Ah, oh, play by the rules, joue par, paye tes impôts, euh, épargne, investis un petit peu, puis tu vas être correct à la fin de tes jours. Ben, » Par exemple, en Argentine, si tu par exemple un médecin ou un, un chauffeur d'autobus qui a travaillé toute sa vie et qui a eu de l'épargne, ben, du jour au lendemain, 75 de ce que tu avais est évaporé. Puis après ça, c'est une course de comment tu vas réussir ton 25 restant qui va se gruger à tous les jours à peu près. Comment tu vas réussir? À, parce qu'après ça, il n'y a plus de demande là, pour ces, 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 ces devises-là. Fait que c'est une espèce de jeu de patate chaude perpétuel où les gens tentent de sortir de leur, de leur devise. Puis ça, c'est profondément inhumain comme, euh, comme contexte. Mm -hmm. Puis c'est la même chose ici, mais à un, à un niveau plus bas encore. Là. À partir du moment que vous allez, euh, si vous travaillez un petit peu sur la scène internationale, euh, personne ne veut des c'est vraiment des coupons pour l'essence et l'épicerie. C'est plate que je vous le dise aujourd'hui, mais fortune en dollars canadiens, il y a quand même de la demande un peu, mais ce n'est pas, euh, pas, pas, pas une demande, ce n'est pas, pas quelque chose qui, 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 qui a une énorme valeur. C'est bien, euh, bien qu'on a parlé de, des frontières parce que c'est dommage que Francis ne soit pas là. Peut-être on va finir là-dessus. Euh, justement, le fait que euh, les frontières soient fermées graduellement, justement par des pays comme ça qui veulent. Tu sais, laisse-moi laisse sortir, là, tu sais. Pourquoi tu ne me laisses pas sortir? Je ne vais même pas. T'sais, mais non, reste, reste ici. T'sais. Mais là, ils vont dire, ne euh, sors pas d'ici. Mais bon, il y a quand même moyen de, de sortir. Puis le Bitcoin, ça peut faciliter grandement ce genre de mouvement-là migratoire de peut-être une petite partie de la population, mais qui pourrait faire une différence. Parce que c'est sûr que ce n'est pas, pas tout le monde que, que c'est facile à, à cause des, des, des liens familiaux, évidemment. Euh, c'est très déchirant de, de, de partir de son pays, de s'exiler, euh, alors qu'il qu qu se passe des trucs comme ça. Mais, Comment vous pensez que ça va se dynamiser tout ça? Là? Moi, personnellement, j'ai l'intention de partir. Ouais. Je ne sais pas toi, parce que toi, tu dis que tu vas aller dans les goulags déjà. Euh, ouais, moi, je euh, suis à ma place, c'est le tableau. Comment vous voyez ça? Ben, moi, moi, personnellement, je vais, je vais probablement partir aussi, là, juste par voyant les nouvelles et les, les nouvelles règles qui se rajoutent. Là. Au moins pour l'hiver, l'été, c'est quand même bien, je trouve. Ouais. Euh, parce qu'il faut laisser un <rire> peu respirer le peuple afin de le, de le, mm -hmm. euh, le faire souffrir encore. Là. Euh, donc, peut-être l'été prochain, je vais revenir, mais l'hiver, je m'en vais. Je pense pas que tout le monde va partir. Je pense que le Bitcoin, ça offre 
euh, possibilité aux gens juste, ou d'autres outils pour le web pour être, euh, avoir de la richesse à travers tous tout ces problèmes d'inflation ou de manque de liberté. Mais dès que tu es quelqu'un qui, qui a un haut profil, qui parle, qui s'exprime, euh, qui, qui est en affaire dans le Bitcoin ou qui est public, pub, très public sur son implication dans le Bitcoin, ben, à moins que tu dois, tu dois être prêt à te défendre dans l'éventualité que, que les choses changent. Euh, c'est correct, il y en a qui peuvent faire le, le fight ici. Mais en fait, la meilleure stratégie, c'est juste être, pas, pas en parler trop, euh, pas être trop public. Si, à moins que vous décidez de, 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 de faire carrière là-dessus, là, mais moi, je disais aux gens, je comprends, vos, vos situations familiales sont pas, sont, c'est une grosse question, c'est plus important, probablement dans, dans la majorité des cas que, que d'autres euh, questions. Donc, stacker des sats, euh, utiliser Wasabi, euh, utiliser votre cold card, c'est tous des outils qu'on qu dit pas pour rien, là, pour justement, pour être prêt aux, aux éventualités, là, tu sais, puis euh, bonne chance à tout le monde. <rire> ben, ce, qui est, euh, ce qui est grave, euh, surtout dans la dernière année, moi j'avais quand même, euh, j'avais encore quand même certaines euh, illusions là, par rapport euh, au système, j'en ai plus bien, mais j'avais quand même un, une certaine croyance comme quoi qu'il y avait, un, il y avait, un, il y avait un, un cadre juridique qui défendait, tu sais, basé, mettons, sur la Constitution, sur, tu sais, tout l'aspect du... Un peu comme le euh, minimal state, là, dans le sens qu'à la limite, le système de justice, si tu arrives avec un cas qui est documenté, tu vas, tu vas, tu vas être capturé. Tu as, as toujours un dernier recours avec, euh, avec le système de justice. Mm. Ce qu'on a vu dans la dernière année, à peu près partout dans le monde, incluant dans certains États américains, c'est que les juges ne sont pas immunisés de, de l'ambiance politique euh, actuelle, courante, disons. Puis ça, c'est vraiment dangereux. Là, je pensais ça, c'est vraiment un « eye opening ». Euh, c'est aussi un autre, je pense, un autre volet de ça, c'est la disparition total des « due process des, », euh, des processus établis. Donc, après tout ce qui a été implémenté dans la dernière année, ça ne s'est pas fait au Parlement, ça s'est fait par décret. Ce n'est pas des lois là, qui sont votées, c'est des décrets qui sont imposés arbitrairement. Et il n'y a pas de débat parlementaire, il n'y a pas de… non seulement ça, mais il n'y a pas aussi d'opposition, par exemple. Que tout ce qui a été imposé dans la dernière année, il y a eu des commissions parlementaires sur des trucs pas mal plus triviales que ça, là, genre pour modifier la loi sur le taxi, alors que là, genre, enfermé chez nous pendant comme deux mois, euh, ben, euh, le couvre-feu, etc. Donc, c'est quand même grave d'un point de vue démocratique et de processus établi ce qui s'est passé. Fait que moi, en tant que citoyen, puis même à part Bitcoin, là, ça, je pense, c'est un eye-opening de voir que... Puis l'État est toujours, comme je disais tantôt dans le cas d'Hydro-Québec, est toujours capable de briser ses propres règles, c'est capable de justifier que, ah, c'est pour le bien commun. Donc, euh, ça, c'est vraiment... Euh, puis on pensait qu'un pays comme le Canada, qu'on on pense qu'un pays occidental, un peu comme, euh, mettons, les États-Unis, où le cadre, justement, juridique et euh, ou puis même ce qu'on appelle, par exemple, la société civile, exemple, le barreau du Québec, le, les chambres de commerce. Hey, les, les, les chambres de commerce au Québec, là, ils ont milité pour qu'on garde les, les commerces fermés. Mais c'est le monde à l'envers, là. C'est complètement débile euh, parce qu'il y a beaucoup d'entrepreneurs qui avaient encore là plus d'argent que quand ils étaient euh, en termes de, de subventions, etc. Donc, euh, c'est le monde à l'envers, ce qu'on est en train de vivre. Il y a tout ça, à cause des, beaucoup, de, beaucoup de ces, de ces principes-là sont à cause des incitatifs pervers qui sont en jeu, politiques, économiques. Euh, mais on peut se questionner, tu sais, moi j'ai un hashtag là, souvent pour niaiser, je dis « fuyer », dans le sens qu'il n'y a plus rien à faire. Mais euh, moi j'ai décidé de ne pas partir tout de suite, au moins, je, au moins 2022. Je me donne au moins jusqu'à l'élection d'octobre 2022 pour voir euh, si on est capable de sortir ce gouvernement clownesque-là. Mais euh, puis Tom Woods, qui est un, un commentateur républicain, euh, pas républicain, euh, libertarien quand même assez connu, il adresse souvent ça, là, parce que souvent, là, si vous n'êtes pas content, les dons vivent en Somalie où il y a, genre, il y a des warlords qui, euh, qui, qui <rire> dominent. Puis, mais tu sais, à la base, ce n'est pas un argument. Là. Tu ne peux pas dire aux gens de quitter où ils sont nés, puis où ils ont leurs leur racines, puis leur famille, si tu n'es pas content. Puis encore une fois, je ramène à ce que je disais tantôt, ce n'est pas nous, là, les extrémistes, sur les bases qu'on défend aujourd'hui. Ce n'est pas nous, les extrémistes. C'est eux qui ont défini qu'est-ce qu'il y a le zéro, puis le dix. Euh, fait que moi, je pense que l'important, c'est de, de fighter. Il euh, va falloir que tu reviennes, Gustavo, pour, euh, pour nous aider. Mais tu sais, fighter sur des bases qui sont, euh, je ne dis pas d'aller péter des vitrines dans la rue, mais défendre les processus établis. Bitcoin euh, a été déjà défendu plusieurs fois devant les tribunaux, devant les, 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 les euh, que ce soit la régie d'énergie, que ce soit les consultations sur la commission des valeurs mobilières. Je vois Elisabeth en arrière qui, qui avait démontré que ce n'est pas une valeur mobilière. Donc, euh, il y a déjà un cadre qui permet de défendre Bitcoin, de, de défendre Bitcoin dans un cadre juridique, économique, social. Puis, euh, tu sais, ne doutez jamais du fait qu'on est… Moi, je pense qu'on est du bon côté de l'histoire, Ce qui se passe dans la prochaine année, ça va définir le reste de votre vie. Je suis certain. C est, c est, ce qui se passe actuellement, la, je pense c'est l'événement socio-politique, économique le, le plus important de notre vie. Je, je suis pas mal certain. Il y a une manif euh, dans une semaine, 
ça. Euh, il va en avoir d'autres, quoi. Ouais, ouais, je pense qu'il va en avoir d'autres, là. Moi, je vais être là. Fait que... Ouais, faut que ça continue. Wow. Comme vous voyez, on n'a pas peur de dire les vraies affaires. Euh, fait que j'espère que, que ça va... Ben, je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de personnes qui pensent euh, similairement ou qui, du moins, se posent des, des questions ici si vous êtes naturellement dans le Bitcoin. Donc, en espérant que cette, euh, cette semaine au complet soit... Euh, une semaine d'enrichissement, mais non, non seulement d'un point de vue technique, mais d'un point de vue aussi réseautage, euh, connaître du monde qui pense similairement, qui, qui peuvent euh, discuter pour de vrai. T'sais. Donc, euh, je pense qu'on peut finir avec le panel. Euh, là, c'était en français, c'est sûr. Fait que je ne sais pas s'il y a encore du monde sur le live stream. Euh, là, il y, a le, il y a la terrasse. Il est quelle heure, là? Euh, OK. Ben, la terrasse va commencer. On va faire un 5 à 7. Fait que c'est inclus dans le billet. Il y a de la bière, il va y avoir de la bouffe. Fait que partez pas tout de suite, euh, il reste encore une belle journée à profiter. Puis euh, on se voit demain. Ah, ah non, ben oui, il y a des questions peut-être. Des... Oui, ouais, c'est ça, des questions. Ouais, c'est bon. Tantôt, tu mentionnais. Attends, je vais checker. Ah oui, je vais prendre le micro. Merci, Jonathan. Tu mentionnais tantôt euh, que les gens, bon, avec Bitcoin en particulier, vont euh, tranquillement te remarquer, ou en tout cas, te remarquer qu'ils comprennent euh, l'inflation puis qu'ils voient que ça arrive en ce moment. Puis, euh, selon toi, c'est quoi, disons, le next step, là, que pour, pour, euh, parce que c'est une affaire de comprendre l'inflation, tu le vois, tu la vis, mais après, comment ça se passe, c'est quoi, euh, on a des alternatives comme Bitcoin, mais pour la population en général, c'est quoi le next step à ça, si on veut? Tu meurs de faim. Il y a beaucoup de gens qui ont déjà compris ça. Si tu regardes, tu sais, les, euh, les gens qui investissent dans l'immobilier, c'est à peu près le même principe de base. Là. Pourquoi ils investissent dans l'immobilier? C'est parce que c'est une, une ressource qui est limitée dans un territoire défini, puis avec le temps, ben, il ne va pas se créer plus de parcelles de terre. Là. Fait que je pense que les gens, ce qui est difficile à comprendre dans Bitcoin, c'est que ce concept-là peut être appliqué au niveau numérique et pas virtuel. Moi, je n'aime pas le terme « monnaie virtuelle » parce que « virtuel », ça implique que ça n'existe pas. C'est vraiment numérique. Ça existe. Là. Je veux dire, le Bitcoin, il y a, il y a même une ramification physique qu'on peut définir, qui est mathématique, qui est, euh, qui est thermodynamique. Euh, mais je pense que les gens, il faut qu'ils réfléchissent en termes de, de rareté en termes de, aussi, euh, les forces qu'il y a en, en jeu actuellement. À un, à un certain point, moi, je, je pense que, tu sais, l'hyper-bitcoinisation, ça ne peut pas arriver du jour au lendemain, mais ça peut aussi, là. À partir du moment que, tu sais, regardez Michael Saylor, c'est un bon exemple, à partir du moment que, tu sais, regardez un gars comme Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, au début des années 2000, disait « Amazon, ça ne marchera pas, Google, c'est surévalué, Apple, euh, je ne sais pas trop. » Ben, à un donné, euh, fin des années 2000, 2010, Excuse, 2015, euh, Warren Buffett prend position dans Apple. Euh, il y a quelques années aussi, il prend position dans Amazon, quand le, le titre d'Amazon était pas loin de 1000 pièces US, capitalisation de 500 milliards. Donc, tu sais, je pense que le marché va évoluer, puis, puis il y a vraiment comme, tu sais, la, la croissance de Bitcoin est illimitée, là. Euh, puis à quel point c'est encore petit comme actif, c'est ridicule, ridicule à quel point c'est petit, puis les gens ne réalisent pas par rapport au reste de la planète financière. C'est encore, je pense que c'est même pas 2 trillions au Bitcoin. L'or, puis euh, les, les dérivés, puis les compagnies minières, c'est 10 trillions de dollars. Alors, c'est 10 fois plus, puis j'ai jamais vu personne avec un, un lingot d'or, à part des montants en or. Tu sais, vous connaissez personne qui a des lingots d'or chez eux, puis personne paye en or, puis c'est pas grave, c'est quand même 10 trillions. Donc, euh, je pense que les gens doivent réaliser ce mindset-là. Puis il y en a beaucoup qui le comprennent sans nécessairement l'appliquer à Bitcoin. Mais ce qui, ce, le, 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 le chaînon non manquant, souvent, c'est la compréhension de leur rareté numérique. Puis tout l'aspect cryptographie aussi. Comment qu'un qu actif peut être unique et sécuritaire à la fois et numérique. Ça, je pense c'est là que l'éducation doit se faire beaucoup. Là. Question dans le fond de la salle. Ben, ce n'est pas vraiment une question, c'est plus un, une façon de voir les choses. Euh, dans le fond, j'aimerais ça qu'on on, on, on pousse la pensée un peu par rapport à... Oh. Éteins là, éteins là, éteins là. What the fuck? Allô? 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 Ok. Euh, J'aimerais ça qu'on parle un peu, de, un peu des chocs de génération. Des chocs de génération par rapport à comment est-ce que chaque génération voit qu ce qui se passe. Je ne sais pas si vous avez pris le temps d'y penser. Est-ce que c'est. On, mais qu'on pousse les boomers quand ils vont commencer à décéder et tout, est-ce que notre génération à nous va prendre une, une idéologie un peu plus différente? Ouais, J'aime ça, ça frapper sur les boomers euh, parce que je continue de penser que c'est la génération la 
plus choyé de l'histoire. Euh, les boomers, probablement, ils n'ont jamais eu à verser une goutte de sang là, pour gagner la liberté qu'ils qu ont eue. Ils ont ça de leurs parents, de Great Generation, qui a débarqué, quoi, ils ont fait la Deuxième Guerre mondiale surtout. Euh, ils sont arrivés dans un contexte aussi, euh, fin des années 70, début 80, ben, milieu des années 70, début 80, où il y avait euh, un, euh, un paquet d'emplois qui était disponible, souvent à vie. Donc, c'est souvent des gens qui ont eu une sécurité d'emploi quasi, euh, quasi assurée. Euh, comme je disais tantôt, tu pouvais, avec des, des emplois euh, ordinaires, avec un salaire moyen, euh, un salaire familial, tu peux acheter une maison pour le tiers du salaire familial annuel. Là. Euh, donc ça, c'est quand, quand même spécial. Euh, évidemment, tu n'avais pas la technologie et tout. C'est les gens aussi, là, ils vont souvent vous dire, les boomers, je vais faire, prendre l'autre côté, côté du débat, ils vont vous dire, « Ouais, mais on payait 18 d'intérêt euh, sur notre prêt. »« Ouais, mais tu peux aussi placer de l'argent à 18 garanti par année aussi. » Donc, tu sais, c'est les deux côtés de la médaille. Donc, euh, non seulement ça, mais ils ont pu travailler toute leur vie à peu près sans… Euh, sans euh, il y a eu quelques récessions, oui, mais il n'y avait pas la compétition, je pense, que tout aujourd'hui pour les, les emplois de pointe. Euh, puis, ils ont profité quoi, de, du plus long cycle haussier, boursier de, de l'histoire. Fait qu'aujourd'hui, si tu es un boomer et tu n'es pas millionnaire ou quasi-millionnaire, il y a de quoi qui ne marche pas. Là. Parce qu'à peu près n'importe qui qui a travaillé depuis les années 80, qui a soit un fonds de pension ou qui avait de l'argent en bourse, euh, le, le, ça a été très, très, très favorable à cette génération-là. Donc, euh, cette génération-là est déjà... Ce qui est important de voir, c'est comment ils vont transmettre. Euh, premièrement, il y en a beaucoup, par exemple, qui ont des entreprises, par exemple, familiales, puis les jeunes ne veulent pas reprendre. Donc, est-ce que… Puis tantôt, ça va être intéressant de voir, tu sais, l'immobilier qui… Mettons, les maisons qui a acheté, ça, c'est un autre… La maison, il l'a acheté, puis là, elle vaut 15, des fois, 20 fois plus. Mais, euh, tu sais, est-ce que tantôt, est-ce qu'il va y avoir des acheteurs nécessaires pour ça, là? Tu sais, euh, des maisons à 1,2 million, des bungalows à 1,2 million à… À Longueuil, euh, je il n'y a, a pas une demande infinie là, pour ça. Donc, ça, ça va être intéressant de voir comment la, comment, la, comment la transition va se faire. Mais moi, je suis assez bullish, pas sur la, ma génération, les milléniaux, mais la génération après. Moi, je pense qu'on va vivre là, dans les prochaines années un retour. Je pense qu'il va y avoir un gros backlash à ce qui est en train de se passer. Puis on va vivre un petit peu comme la deuxième moitié des années 80, un, un, un peu un âge d'or pour tout ce, qui est, tout ce qui est conservateur. Un peu comme on a eu l'époque Reagan, euh, Thatcher. Je pense qu'il y a plein de régimes plus conservateurs qui vont être élus là, en, contre, en backlash à ce qui s'est passé. Peut-être plus avec une notion, peut-être plus de peut-être ça va être des pays qui vont adopter euh, Bitcoin comme devise ou Gold Standard, whatever. Mais je pense qu'il y aura un backlash euh, à ce qui est en train de se passer. Puis toute la notion aussi de, de woke, euh, cancel culture, je pense que c'est en, en train de piquer cette affaire-là. Parce que là, les gens, même les gens de gauche, en fait, c'est souvent la gauche qui s'oppose le mieux à ça. La gauche modérée dit à cette gauche complètement folle, regarde là, ça marche plus, là, on est en train de se manger entre nous autres. Puis, euh, c'est ça. Fait. Bref, moi, je suis assez optimiste pour, euh, pour les. Euh, Peut-être pas ma génération, mais la génération d'après et l'autre après, je pense que ça va être, ils, vont, euh, ils vont avoir passé la crise, puis euh, ça, devrait être, euh, ça devrait être plus prospère. Bien, on le voit déjà, il y a déjà des, de l'information sur ça, là, sur ce que, disons, les générations, qu'est-ce qu'elles pensent sur des sujets, disons, comme cancel culture. Puis, on voit que c'est. Les, les, ceux qui aiment moins ça, c'est les, les, les plus vieux, mais maintenant les Jazzy, les plus jeunes aussi. Là. Donc, oui, euh, je, moi je suis d'accord avec ça. Là. Je pense que la génération Gen Z, euh, elle a du potentiel, même s'ils sont encore jeunes, puis ils sont encore sur TikTok <rire> à faire des trucs stupides, là, ils, ils ont du potentiel là, avec le temps. Là. <rire> ouais. Ben moi, je, je sais pas. Euh, je trouve qu'on est quand même, euh, dans notre groupe d'âge euh, spécifique, on est quand même, je trouve, une minorité là, par rapport à ouais. notre vision. Euh... T'es quel âge? 25. OK, ouais. Mais ouais. moi, je dis ça aussi que euh, ce qui est intéressant avec cette génération-là, c'est qu'elle moins, je pense qu'elle veut moins s'endetter que ma génération. Tu sais, nous autres, on voulait tout de suite un char, on voulait tout de suite, euh, on s'endettait pour acheter des voitures. Euh, ta génération est beaucoup plus, d'ailleurs, ils n'ont pas de carte de crédit pour la plupart, c'est beaucoup de cartes de débit. Donc, la notion d'épargne est plus importante. Ça, je trouve c'est intéressant, c'est une, mm. une prémisse, parce que nous autres, on voyait nos, nos parents boomers, mm. puis nos, nos frères plus vieux qui c'est une société beaucoup, beaucoup de consommation. Euh, je vois aussi les plus jeunes qui, euh, particulièrement les filles, tu vois, moi, je, je m'entraîne beaucoup euh, sur le canal de la chaîne, puis là, je te dirais actuellement, les, les, les jeunes, disons, de 18 à 30 ans qui s'entraînent, qui courent, je pense que c'est 4 des filles. Là. Fait que, euh, il y a quelque chose qui se passe avec les gars. Les gars n'ont pas l'air euh, aussi, euh, aussi « groundés que les filles sur les notions de base. Euh, euh, saines habitudes de vie, etc. Mais le risque, tu sais, maintenant, tu n'as plus besoin, tu sais, avec les jeux vidéo, tout est maintenant vraiment disponible. Tu sais, Netflix, pourquoi 10$ par mois? Avant, euh, tu ne pouvais pas avoir autant de divertissement sans être actif d'une certaine manière, tu sais. Mm -hmm. Fait que c'est un peu, euh, peut-être, quelque chose qui est, qui est pernicieux, là. Ouais. 
Mais, mais c'est, c'est là que moi, je me demande, tu, tu penses pas, Jonathan, qu'il faudrait quasiment un, un gros coup, là, que tout le monde... <rire> Parce que c'est, c'est rendu trop facile, là. C'est, <rire> genre, <rire> PCU, euh, euh, SQDC, euh, plus, euh, plus Netflix. Euh, euh, <rire> j'ai un job qui passe comme toi. Lui, c'est ce qu'on appelle... Il ah, ah, y, y, y a un mot pour ça, ça s'appelle les ex- accélérationnistes. C'est des gens, par exemple, de droite qui votent Québec solidaire pour qu'il y ait un effondrement de la société, pour que ça reprenne mieux. C'est, euh, c'est profondément inhumain. Puis à partir du moment que les gens se sentent concernés, parce que là, il y en a beaucoup qui ne sont pas concernés. Tu disais PCU, tout ça, euh, vivent mieux que jamais. Mais à un moment donné, ça va, ça va frapper d'une manière ou d'une autre. Là. J'espère que tu as raison. Question là-bas. Puis en plus, Netflix s'est rendu tellement pas bon, là, en plus. Non, c'est ça, c'est, c'est vraiment. Non, non, je vais aller avec ça. C'est J'ai peut-être une question un peu théorique, là, mais vous avez quand même parlé pas mal de leçons historiques, de choses qu'on a vues. Euh, puis avec l'hypothèse que les gouvernements et les États vont vouloir euh, protéger, disons, les monnaies fiduciaires, est-ce que vous n'avez pas peur qu'en cours de route vers une potentielle hyper-bitcoinisation, il y ait une tentative de l'État d'utiliser son pouvoir coercitif pour saisir les bitcoins? Ou, bien, tu, je comprends la mécanique des clés privées, mais... Pour la plupart des gens, si on te menace d'aller en prison euh, à du temps éternel, ils, ils vont donner le contrôle, comme on a eu avec l'ordre dans les années 30. Est-ce que c'est une, quelque chose que vous entrevoyez comme personnes qui sont convaincues de, de Bitcoin? Bien, c'est une bonne question. Puis, pour être honnête, j'ai fait les deux côtés du, dé, du débat dans ça là, plusieurs fois. Là. Euh, je pense que ça va varier, ça va dépendre du pays. Genre, je ne pense pas qu'il peut y avoir une recette absolue pour tous les pays. Tous les pays vont faire la même chose. Je pense, pas. Je pense qu'il y a des pays qui, qui vont faire ça. Je pense qu'il y a des pays qui ne vont pas le faire. Euh, la, est-ce qu'ils vont vouloir que le Bitcoin, euh, se dé, juste détruire le Bitcoin? J'en doute, parce qu'ils vont probablement avoir du Bitcoin pour eux. Là. C'est, c'est sûr que si tu es intelligent, tu es au pouvoir, tu te remplis les poches de Bitcoin euh, autant que de dollars. Euh, donc, je pense que ça pourrait être surtout une approche où est-ce qu'ils veulent le voler pour le prendre dans leurs mains à eux, surtout dans les pays qui sont vraiment corrompus. Là. Euh, ici, j- je ne sais pas, je ne pense pas, euh, mais c'est, c'est sûr qu'il c'est, c'est, y a des outils pour ça. Nous, nous, nous c'est de ça qu'on parle tout le temps. C'est, c'est qu'au cas où que ça arrive, euh, ben, tu peux faire des choses où est-ce que tu peux juste, t'as pas le choix, tu ne peux juste pas les donner, par exemple. Il euh, y a du monde qui vont prendre des euh, contrats multisignatures puis mettre des clés dans différents pays. Comme ça, au cas où que le, le gouvernement du Canada veut saisir tes bitcoins, tu ne peux même pas leur envoyer ça. Il faut que tu ailles euh, dans un autre pays aller chercher une autre clé. Il euh, y a toutes sortes de trucs comme ça, là, où disons l'utilisation de Wasabi euh, pour mixer des coins, pour créer euh, ce qu'on appelle du plausible deniability, du, euh, juste le fait de, de nier puis, puis pas qu'ils soient capables de prouver que tu mens. Euh, ou aussi, sinon, l'utilisation d'outils comme Cold Card, euh, où est-ce que tu peux marquer un, un fake pin, un, un faux pin, puis ça va t'envoyer dans un autre portefeuille. Et euh, tu peux te dire, c'est juste ça mon portefeuille. Donc, il y a plusieurs façons de se défendre par rapport à ça, et ça va varier de pays en pays. Euh, je ne pense pas que, à, comme Francis avait dit tantôt, il y a 10-15 des Canadiens qui ont du Bitcoin. Aux États-Unis, c'est à peu près la même chose, peut-être un peu moins. Il y a des pays, euh, comme disons le Nigeria, c'est 40 des gens ont du Bitcoin. Plus qu'il y a du monde qui ont du Bitcoin, ça devient de plus en plus difficile de le faire. Euh, je pense, puis genre Francis, il avait parlé de ça euh, quand on était à Miami dans la conférence Bitcoin euh, 2021. Puis je pense que la langue qu'il avait pris qui était vraiment bon, c'est de dire, si le, si le gouvernement veut détruire le Bitcoin, c'est mieux de ne pas le bannir, c'est mieux de le, le réglementer, Exactement. c'est mieux que tout le monde laisse que coin, tout le monde laisse leur coin chez Coinbase et chez Pay, euh, puis que tout le monde utilise des, des services vraiment centralisés, puis qu'on les mette, on les liste en bourse. Puis une fois que c'est là, là, on va mettre des régulations, puis on va les rendre des, euh, obligés de suivre les, les... En fait, c'est ça qui est en train d'arriver. On va les faire suivre les, euh, les, les règles de IROC, donc les banques vont, vont mettre en place les, les règles qu'ils doivent suivre. Il euh, y a des alternatives à ça, mais c'est ça. Ça, c'est une meilleure façon d'attaquer le Bitcoin. Mais, mais juste un, un point. Euh, je pense que quand il y avait justement la saisie de l'or, il me semble, j'ai jamais trouvé la bonne source pour ça, mais c'était pas tant efficace le, le nombre d'or saisi au bout du compte par le gouvernement. Parce que, ultimement, c'est un peu volontaire. C'est comme le gouvernement, il voit pas que tu as enterré non, de l'or ça, dans, c'est, c'est... dans ton ben, en jardin. En fait, c'était, euh, c'était un décret où tu étais obligé de rendre. Ils, ils sont pas déplacés d'une maison à l'autre pour, 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 pour suivre. Question. 
pour, euh, ils ne sont pas déplacés d'une maison à l'autre pour, euh, pour fouiller si vous aviez de l'or. C'est que vous deviez échanger votre or pour une promesse sur l'or. Puis éventuellement, je pense que ce prix-là a été dévalué. Fait que, techniquement, les États-Unis ont déjà fait défaut sur leur dette là, parce qu'ils ont dévalué la promesse euh, d'or dans le temps. Euh, mais effectivement, ils n'ont pas cherché. Puis il y avait plein d'exceptions. Le genre, euh, je pense que lui qui s'était le prix de l'or, c'était genre le ministre des Finances à l'époque. Puis lui, il y avait euh, une exception parce qu'il y avait des intérêts dans une bijouterie. C'est complètement débile là, comme histoire, mais il y a vraiment un précédent sur euh, la saisie. Euh, je, pas mal d'accord avec ce que Gustavo a dit. Euh, c'est déjà en cours. Hein. On voit qu'il y a déjà des, des initiatives, particulièrement en Europe, où ils, veulent, ils vont vouloir tenter de plus en plus d'interdire de, de, les, port les, euh, les portefeuilles euh, que tu contrôles toi-même. Donc, contrôler ses propres clés. Les non-KYC wallets, ça va être de plus en plus… Euh, ça va être, en fait, ça va être un peu comme… Je pense que c'est Obama qui avait dit que Bitcoin, c'est comme un compte suisse dans votre poche. Là. Que, euh, puis d'ailleurs, toutes ces, la plupart de ces, capi, de, ces, de ces centres bancaires anonymes-là, ils ont tombé dans les dernières années. L Après 2008, la Suisse n'a plus de secret bancaire. Il y a d'autres qui vont tomber dans les, dans les prochaines années. Donc, je pense que la marche est en cours. Par contre, moi, je vois différemment par rapport à, aux produits qui sont en bourse. Puis je pense que ça va avoir l'effet inverse. À partir du moment que, tu sais, là, tu peux avoir un fonds Bitcoin qui est dans ton, euh, dans ton TFSC ou dans ton RSSP. Fait que, ça commence à être quand même imbriqué directement dans le système financier traditionnel. Moi, je pense qu'il manque beaucoup puis qui donnerait vraiment un bon coup de moins à Bitcoin, puis même aux Bitcoiners, c'est d'avoir la possibilité de… On, il y a déjà des produits où tu peux, par exemple, emprunter en contrepartie de tes Bitcoins, comme je pense c'est euh, Ledin, euh, l'autre c'est euh, Unchain Capital, etc. Bien, tantôt, là, c'est parce que les gens ne réalisent pas, au Québec, il y a des milliards de dollars, je pense, en Bitcoin, là, pas loin, là, du moins, il y a certainement des centaines de millions. Tu sais, il y a des camionneurs qui ont genre 10, 15 bitcoins, là. Puis, tu sais, tantôt, euh, ils vont pas, je pense pas que c'est... Puis c'est des gens aussi, c'est des vrais bitcoiners, dans le sens qu'ils vont pas vendre leurs bitcoins pour euh, se faire construire une piscine. Euh, par contre, s'il y avait vraiment, je pense, des services, des services intégrés bancaires où tu pourrais même pledger, un peu comme tu fais avec l'immobilier pour, euh, pour, pour faire des rénovations, ben je pense que, tu sais, puis, puis c'est drôle parce que le système bancaire devrait sauter là-dessus plutôt que genre se questionner « Oh, c'est un bank digital currency », tu sais, tu as l'opportunité de faire des frais sur des centaines de millions de dollars en capital, puis qui ne voient pas, mais je pense que ça, ça va venir, c'est une question de temps avec une banque aux États-Unis, je pense que va être la première à, à dire ben, « Regarde, c'est déjà le cas en passant, là, dans le private wealth, là, si vous êtes euh, assez riche, vous arrivez chez UBS avec des bitcoins, puis ils vont vous, ils vont vous ouvrir une marge de, une marge de crédit. » Donc, euh, ça existe déjà pour un certain pourcentage de la, client, de, de la population, mais c'est juste, euh, c'est pas, pas, pas accessible à tout le monde. Là. Ouais, Nidex, c'est ça, ça en est un, euh, mais ça, est lui, il est vraiment base, là, le gars. De, de, exact. Fait que c est, c est, mais c'est encore, c'est une clientèle, c'est très, très, euh, beaucoup plus riche. Là. Mais il y a, il y a un, un, un Nidex, il y a un IROT, hein? je pense que tu peux. Euh, c'est ça, tu peux. Euh, c'est vraiment incroyable ce qu'ils sont en train de faire. Nidig, c'est une compagnie Wall Street. Ben, ça vient d'un fonds Wall Street. Euh, c'est juste focusé sur le Bitcoin. Mais là, ils ont des deals avec euh, Q2, NCR, euh, dans le fond, des, gens, des compagnies qui offrent des services aux banques puis aux services financiers. Là. Donc, euh, oui, ouais, ils vont intégrer Bitcoin directement avec toutes les institutions financières ou presque aux États-Unis, puis énormément dans le monde. Il y a donc, aussi qu'on a oublié, mais qui est, qui est low key, là, mais qui sont quand même bien positionnés. Là, fait. Moi, je pense que ça va être difficile, à, ça va être difficile de, 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 de complètement éliminer. Au contraire, je pense que ça va prendre sa place. Comme... Puis ce qui va être dangereux, c'est de voir, ça a été discuté plusieurs fois, c'est qu'ils vont, vont tenter de créer plus, plus de Bitcoin. C'est évident qu'ils vont tenter de créer plus de Bitcoin. Fait que, mais par contre, par contre, par contre, le Bitcoin est fait d'une certaine manière que ça peut être vérifié. Fait que, ils vont tenter de réhypothéquer. Puis ça, c'est une discussion. Il y a plusieurs discussions là-dessus. Euh, euh, Save Dean a parlé, euh, Caitlin, Caitlin euh, Long. Euh, il y a plein de gens qui parlent de ça. C'est la double, je pense que c'est l'envers de la médaille du, de l'intégrer dans le système financier. C'est qu'ils vont tenter de réhypothéquer, mais tu as tous les, les, les outils nécessaires dans Bitcoin pour vérifier que quelqu'un est vraiment solvable. Bien, pour continuer sur la, la, la même veine, la réglementation et tout ça, euh, pensez-vous que les gouvernements pourraient être tentés, déjà que la, la planche à billets roule euh, à fond, pensez-vous que les gouvernements pourraient être tentés de profiter de l'hyperinflation pour avoir une mainmise sur le marché de la crypto, donc acheter le plus de crypto possible, contrôler le plus possible, puis laisser le petit peuple rentrer là-dedans après, t'sais? Moi, je pense que tu surestimes grandement leur capacité, euh, leur compétence aussi. Ça, c'est une partie de. C'est ça, en fait, qui disprouve à peu près tous les complots. C'est que pour faire un complot, il faut que tu sois assez, assez compétent. Mais, euh, ben, tu sais, 
C'est difficile à faire, premièrement, parce que le gouvernement, il y a quand même encore certaines, il y a quand même une certaine transparence là, sur l'utilisation des fonds. Peut-être des pays peut-être plus sketchy où la Banque centrale pourrait se positionner d'une certaine manière, mais euh, je ne pense pas que ça pourrait être fait directement comme ça. Par contre, euh, à travers ces différentes institutions, un pays pourrait se positionner dans Bitcoin et dire « Regarde, ça nous prend une certaine part. » C'est pour ça que c'est drôle, les, les banquiers ils rient de l'or, mais toutes les banques centrales ont une certaine… Ben, sauf le Canada, on a tout vendu, là, mais euh, ils ont une certaine quantité d'or, puis la plupart dans les dernières années. Donc, la Chine et la Russie, je pense que la Russie n'est pas loin d'avoir… Euh, ils ont tellement acheté d'or dans les dernières années que c'est pas loin de… Ils pourraient avoir un certain peg avec l'or tellement qu'ils ont, qu ont acheté d'or. Donc, euh, ça, c'est pas impossible de voir qu'ils vont vouloir peut-être ajouter du Bitcoin. D'ailleurs, c'est un, un débat qui est intéressant. En 1995, euh, quand il y a eu le référendum sur la souveraineté du Québec, il y avait tout un, un, un plan pour euh, éventuellement, on va-tu utiliser l'or canadien? Il avait pensé peut-être utiliser le marque allemand. Donc, euh, si c'est quelque chose, c'est un débat qui serait fait aujourd'hui, Bitcoin serait sur, euh, dans les options potentielles. Là. Ce qui n'était pas possible avant d'avoir une, une monnaie. Parce que quand tu n'as pas accès à… Si on utilise par exemple le dollar canadien et on n'a plus, membre, on est plus, on a plus un, un siège à la Banque du Canada, tu utilises une monnaie dont tu n'as pas, pas un mot à dire sur la politique monétaire. Là. Fait que tu veux… c'est pour ça, en fait, c'est quelque chose qu'ils ne veulent pas perdre. C'est un pouvoir qu'ils ne qu veulent pas perdre, de, 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 de perdre le pouvoir d'imprimer leur, leur propre monnaie. Là. Tu sais, il euh, y a quelque chose qu'on appelle euh, le « speculative attack on, on fiat de, de nos jours, là, une attaque spéculative sur les monnaies fiduciaires. Euh, c'est quelque chose que, disons, MicroStrategy a commencé à faire, puis j'entends en parler un peu à, à, avant. C'est, dans le fond, euh, les taux d'intérêt sont vraiment bas en ce moment. Tout, tout, tout le monde le sait, là, pour euh, pouvoir imprimer de l'argent, puis ça ne coûte rien. Euh, puis, c'est possible pour des compagnies, euh, des financiers, d'aller de, chercher des prêts à presque un 0 de taux d'intérêt. Donc, disons, MicroStrategy, c'est une compagnie cotée en bourse, euh, je pense, Nasdaq, euh, qui peut face, demander aux investisseurs sur Wall Street, euh, « Je veux un milliard de dollars à 0 de frais, euh, à 0 d'intérêt, puis c'est ça que le, le, c'est le, la règle dans le marché. » Puis, il y, y a énormément d'investisseurs qui ont tellement peur de perdre leur argent qu'ils sont corrects à emprunter euh, euh, à 0%. Là, pour, tu sais, des convertible notes. Là, donc, souvent, tu peux, les, tu peux gagner plus si le, le stock, l'action monte en valeur. Là, donc, il y a quand même une façon de faire de l'argent. Mais ça ne coûte rien à la compagnie ou presque. Euh, donc, MicroStrategy fait toujours ça pour acheter du Bitcoin. Je pense qu'on va voir plus en plus d'autres compagnies le faire. Euh, avec le temps, Square a commencé à le faire aussi, je pense. Euh, donc, ouais, c'est une, une sorte de façon de, pour les gens qui sont proches des imprimantes, de l'effet Cantillon, d'imprimer de, de l'argent ou de profiter des banques qui impriment de l'argent pour acheter du Bitcoin, euh, donc de faire une attaque sur le, la monnaie. Que les gouvernements le fassent, c'est plus difficile à le voir, mais qui sait? Mm. Mathieu? Pardon, je te dis ça. <rire> D'autres questions? Une dernière question, peut-être? Mais en fait, je te dis très parce que Tristan dit qu'il arrive avec le stuff, la bouffe, puis il a besoin de, de bras, fait qu'on va bientôt commencer le, le, le 5 à 7. Oui, oui, allons-y, ben, euh, allons-y. Si ça vous a choqué la conversation, mais c'est ça le Bitcoin. Le Bitcoin, c'est tous les sujets en même temps, c'est tout est relié, fait que, en, en espérant que ça ne vous a pas trop euh, choqué, mais je pense que c'était très intéressant, puis j'entends, merci. 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 Euh, je, je veux dire quelque chose ouais, parce que, euh, fait que là, on a plusieurs événements après euh, chacune des journées. Aujourd'hui, il y a le 5 à 7. Demain, il y a une sortie au bar. Euh, jeudi, on a organisé un super souper euh, à un resto indien au Vieux-Montréal. Euh, puis ça, par exemple, ça c'est un extra. Il faut acheter le billet. Puis c est, c est, ça va être vraiment bon. Il va y avoir comme 5, euh, 5, euh, comment on dit? Ouais, bon. 5, 5, 5, 5 services. Euh, moi, j'habite euh, dans le quartier, puis des fois, je vois des Indiens souper, donc c'est une, une bonne étiquette. <rire> fait que, allez acheter votre étiquette pour ça, pour, pour jaser, pour avoir peut-être un, un souper jeudi. Puis évidemment, il y a le barbecue, ça, je vais en parler beaucoup, parce que je veux vraiment que ce soit le plus gros barbecue Bitcoin qui a jamais existé sur la Terre. Fait qu'on va arriver à ça. Puis, euh, ben, bonne, bonne soirée, puis on finit ça là aujourd'hui. Ouais, la terrasse, c'est juste l'autre bord, là, pas loin, là. For